Section 1 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 1. Skirmish between Cossacks and the Imperial Bodyguard by Jean-Baptiste Édouard de Taille, France, 1848. Painting, Frontispiece. The Cossacks are a wild, free people between one and two million in number, living in southern Russia, and famous for centuries for their courage and superb horsemanship. In the 17th century, they revolted against the Polish government and asked to become subjects of Russia. They are a race of warriors and are recognized by the Russians as a military division. During Napoleon's campaign in Russia, there were often desperate skirmishes between his troops and these half-savage fighters. Such a skirmish is here depicted. The Cossacks are rushing down a muddy roadway to escape from Napoleon's soldiers, but have been overtaken. The curved swords of the French flash to the right and to the left. The Cossack leader, mounted on a light-coloured horse loaded with plunder, turns in his saddle to shoot at his opponents. It is a furious, desperate scene, so full of action that even as depicted on canvas, one half expects to see the combatants sweep by in a moment. End of section 1. This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Russia, Part 1. Folk Tales and Early History. Historical Note. Our first knowledge of Russia comes from vague stories of a time when Finns lived in the north, Slavonians in the interior, and Scythians in the south. The Northmen were more civilized than these people, and according to tradition, they were asked to come and rule the turbulent folk of Russia. In the year 862, a Northman named Rurik and his two brothers accepted the invitation. At the death of the brothers, Rurik became Grand Prince. He chose Novgorod for his capital, and before the ninth century, it had become a large and flourishing town. In the tenth century, Queen Olga reigned. She was the first Russian sovereign to embrace Christianity. Her grandson, Vladimir the Great, 980 to 1015, followed her example and destroyed the idols. In the 13th century, Genghis Khan and his Tartars swept down from the country lying north of the Chinese Empire upon the Polovtsi, who dwelt near the Sea of Azov. The Polovtsi appealed to the Russians, and the Russians came to their aid. Genghis Khan sent a messenger to say that he had no quarrel with Russia, but only with the Polovtsi. In the simple and direct fashion of the day, the Russians put the messenger to death. Then followed such warfare as Russia had never known. A vast horde of Tartars under Batui Khan swept over the land, deluging it with blood. The story of the invasions is told in a single sentence by an ancient chronicler. The Mongols came, destroyed, burned, slaughtered, plundered, and departed. Neither armies nor walled cities could withstand the torrent. It was the custom of the Tartars to estimate the number of their victims by collecting their right ears, and the sack of Moscow alone is said to have yielded 270,000 ears. As a result of the Tartar invasion, commerce and government were swept away and Russian civilization was set back more than two centuries behind that of the rest of Europe. End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia
the world's story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section three the imp and the crust by count leo tolstoy a poor peasant set out one morning to plough taking with him for his breakfast a crust of bread he got his plough ready wrapped the bread in his coat put it under a bush and set to work after a while when his horse was tired and he was hungry the peasant fixed the plough let the horse loose to graze and went to get his coat and his breakfast he lifted the coat but the bread was gone he looked and looked turned the coat over shook it out but the bread was gone the peasant could not make this out at all that's strange thought he i saw no one but all the same some one has been here and has taken the bread it was an imp who had stolen the bread while the peasant was ploughing and at that moment he was sitting behind the bush waiting to hear the peasant swear and call upon the devil the peasant was sorry to lose his breakfast but it can't be helped said he after all i shan't die of hunger no doubt whoever took the bread needed it may it do him good and he went to the well had a drink of water and rested a bit then he caught his horse harnessed it and began ploughing again the imp was crestfallen at not having made the peasant sin and he went to report what had happened to the devil his master he came to the devil and told how he had taken the peasant's bread and how the peasant instead of cursing had said may it do him good the devil was angry and replied if the man got the better of you it was your own fault you don't understand your business if the peasants and their wives after them take to that sort of thing it will be all up with us the matter can't be left like that go back at once said he and put things right if in three years you don't get the better of that peasant i'll have you ducked in holy water the imp was frightened he scampered back to earth thinking how he could redeem his fault he thought and thought and at last he hit upon a good plan he turned himself into a laboring man and went and took service with the poor peasant the first year he advised the peasant to sow corn in a marshy place the peasant took his advice and sowed in the marsh the year turned out a very dry one and the crops of the other peasants were all scorched by the sun but the poor peasant's corn grew thick and tall and full-eared not only had he grain enough to last him for the whole year but he had much left over besides the next year the imp advised the peasant to sow on the hill and it turned out a wet summer other people's corn was beaten down and rotted and the ears did not fill but the peasant's crop up on the hill was a fine one he had more grain left over than before so that he did not know what to do with it all then the imp showed the peasant how he could mash the grain and distill spirit from it and the peasant made strong drink and began to drink it himself and give it to his friends so the imp went to the devil his master and boasted that he had made up for his failure the devil said that he would come and see for himself how the case stood he came to the peasant's house and saw that the peasant had invited his well-to-do neighbors and was treating them to drink his wife was offering the drink to the guests and as she handed it round she tumbled against the table and spilled the glass full the peasant was angry and scolded his wife what do you mean do you think it's ditch water that you must go pouring good stuff like that over the floor the imp nudged the devil his master with his elbow see said he that's the man who did not grudge his last crust the peasant still railing at his wife began to carry the drink round himself just then a poor peasant returning from work came in uninvited he greeted the company sat down and saw that they were drinking tired with his day's work he felt that he too would like a drop he sat and sat and his mouth kept watering but the host instead of offering him any only muttered i can't find drink for every one who comes along this pleased the devil but the imp chuckled and said wait a bit there's more to come yet the rich peasants drank and their host drank too and they began to make false oily speeches to one another 
the devil listened and listened and praised the imp if said he the drink makes them so foxy that they begin to cheat each other they will soon all be in our hands wait for what's coming said the imp let them have another glass all round now they are like foxes wagging their tails and trying to get round one another but presently you will see them like savage wolves the peasants had another glass each and their talk became wilder and rougher instead of oily speeches they began to abuse and snarl at one another soon they took to fighting and punched one another's noses and the host joined in the fight and he too got well beaten the devil looked on and was much pleased at all this this is first rate said he but the imp replied wait a bit the best is yet to come wait till they have had a third glass now they are raging like wolves but let them have one more glass and they will be like swine the peasants had their third glass and became quite like brutes they muttered and shouted not knowing why and not listening to one another then the party began to break up some went alone some in twos and some in threes all staggering down the street the host went out to speed his guests but he fell on his nose into a puddle smeared himself from top to toe and lay there grunting like a hog this pleased the devil still more well said he you have hit on a first-rate drink and have quite made up for your blunder about the bread but now tell me how this drink is made you must first have put in fox's blood that was what made the peasants sly as foxes then i suppose you added wolf's blood that is what made them fierce like wolves and you must have finished off with swine's blood to make them behave like swine no said the imp that was not the way i did it all i did was to see that the peasant had more corn than he needed the blood of the beasts is always in man but as long as he had only enough corn for his needs it is kept in bounds while that was the case the peasant did not grudge his last crust but when he had corn left over he looked for ways of getting pleasure out of it and i showed him a pleasure drinking and when he began to turn god's good gifts into spirits for his own pleasure the foxes wolves and swine's blood in him all came out if only he goes on drinking he will always be a beast the devil praised the imp forgave him his former blunder and advanced him to a post of high honor end of section three this recording is in the public domain section four of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 4. The Story of Iron and the Poison Water. From the Kalevala. The Kalevala, Land of Heroes, is the national epic poem of Finland. The Editor then the blacksmith ilmarinen thus addressed the sleeping iron thou most useful of the metals thou art sleeping in the marshes thou art hid in low conditions where the wolf treads in the swamplands where the bear sleeps in the thickets hast thou thought and well considered what would be thy future station should i place thee in the furnace thus to make thee free and useful then was iron sorely frightened much distressed and full of horror when of fire he heard the mention mention of his fell destroyer then again speaks ilmarinen thus the smith addresses iron be not frightened useful metal surely fire will not consume thee will not burn his younger brother will not harm his nearest kindred come thou to my room and furnace where the fire is freely burning thou wilt live and grow and prosper wilt become the swords of heroes buckles for the belts of women 
ere arose the star of evening iron ore had left the marshes from the water beds had risen had been carried to the furnace in the fire the smith had laid it laid it in his smelting furnace ilmarinen starts the bellows gives three motions of the handle and the iron flows in streamlets from the forge of the magician soon becomes like baker's leaven soft as dough for bread of barley then out screamed the metal iron wondrous blacksmith ilmarinen take o oh, take me from thy furnace from this fire and cruel torture ilmarinen thus made answer i will take thee from my furnace thou art but a little frightened thou shalt be a mighty power thou shalt slay the best of heroes thou shalt wound thy dearest brother straightway iron made this promise vowed and swore in strongest accents by the furnace by the anvil by the tongs and by the hammer these the words he vowed and uttered many trees that i can injure can devour the hearts of mountains shall not slay my nearest kindred shall not kill the best of heroes shall not wound my dearest brother better live in civil freedom happier would be my lifetime should i serve my fellow beings serve as tools for their convenience than as implements of warfare slay my friends and nearest kindred wound the children of my mother now the master ilmarinen the renowned and skilful blacksmith from the fire removes the iron places it upon the anvil hammers well until it softens hammers many fine utensils hammers spears and swords and axes hammers knives and forks and hatches hammers tools of all descriptions many things the blacksmith needed many things he could not fashion could not make the tongue of iron could not hammer steel from iron could not make the iron harden well considered ilmarinen deeply thought and long reflected then he gathered birchen ashes steeped the ashes in the water made a lie to harden iron thus to form the steel most needful with his tongue he tests the mixture weighs it long and well considers and the blacksmith speaks as follows all this labor is for nothing will not fashion steel from iron will not make the soft ore harden now a bee flies from the meadow blue wing coming from the flowers flies about then safely settles near the furnace of the smithy thus the smith the bee addresses these the words of ilmarinen little bee thou tiny birdling bring me honey on thy winglets on thy tongue i pray thee bring me sweetness from the fragrant meadows from the little cups of flowers from the tips of seven petals that we thus may aid the water to produce the steel from iron evil hisi's bird the hornet heard these words of ilmarinen looking from the cottage gable flying to the bark of birch trees while the iron bars were heating while the steel was being tempered swiftly flew the stinging hornet scattered all of hisi horrors brought the hissing of the serpent brought the venom of the adder brought the poison of the spider brought the stings of all the insects mixed them with the ore and water while the steel was being tempered ilmarinen skilful blacksmith first of all the iron workers thought the bee had surely brought him honey from the fragrant meadows from the little cups of flowers from the tips of seven petals and he spake the words that follow welcome welcome is thy coming honeyed sweetness from the flowers thou hast brought to aid the water thus to form the steel from iron ilmarinen ancient blacksmith dipped the iron into water water mixed with many poisons thought it but the wild bee's honey thus he formed the steel from iron when he plunged it into water water mixed with many poisons when he placed it in the furnace angry grew the hardened iron broke the vow that he had taken 
ate his words like dogs and devils mercilessly cut his brother madly raged against his kindred caused the blood to flow in streamlets from the wounds of man and hero this the origin of iron and of steel of light blue colour end of section four this recording is in the public domain Section 5 of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 6 Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan section five the country and customs of the scythians fifth century b c by herodotus concerning the scythians and other nations that dwell in these parts there are some things worthy to be told all this country is in winter cold beyond measure for eight months indeed the frost is such that a man can scarce bear it and during this time if you pour water on the ground you cannot make mud but if you light a fire you can make it the sea is frozen and the scythians march across the ice and drive their wagons on it to that part of asia which lieth over against them the sea which they cross is the cimmerian bosphorus being at the extremity of the black sea eastward so is it for eight months of the year and in the four that remain there is oft times frost nor is the winter such as is wont to be in other countries for it raineth scarcely ever but in summer it raineth continually also there is never heard thunder at this time but in summer it is very grievous the horses endure the cold but the asses and the mules perish but elsewhere asses and mules endure it but horses if they stand still are mortified by frost perchance the cold is the cause why the oxen have not horns to this agreeeth what homer saith in the wanderings of ulysses libya where quickly grow the lambkin's horns for in lands where there is much heat horns ever grow quickly as to the mules in elis also though it is not over cold mules are never born but the people of elis say that this is by reason of a curse as to the feathers whereof the scythians affirm the air in the regions beyond them to be full so that no man may pass through them or even see them the truth seems to be this in the upper country snow falleth continually but in summer less than in winter now whosoever has seen snow close at hand when it is falling quickly knoweth it to be like to feathers and it is easily to be believed that by reason of the cold the northern part of this land cannot be inhabited of the customs of the scythians the greater part are not to be praised but one thing they order in a fashion more admirable than do any other man and this thing is of all human affairs the most important if an enemy invade their country he shall never escape from it nor shall he ever be able to come up with them unless they will for they have neither cities nor forts but they carry about their houses with them and they are all archers shooting from horseback and they live not by tillage but by cattle and their dwellings are on wagons hence it has come to pass that no man can conquer them or even so much as come near to them for this manner of life the land wherein they dwell is suitable and their rivers also are a help for the land is plain and grassy and well watered and the rivers that flow through it are well nigh equal in number to the canals that are in egypt they worship five gods first vesta honouring her beyond all others and next zeus and earth and earth they call the wife of zeus and in the third place apollo and the heavenly aphrodite and heracles and ares these all the scythians worship and the royal scythians worship poseidon images and altars and temples they make for ares only they have but one manner of sacrificing the beast is made to stand with its forefeet bound together then he that sacrifices standing behind the beast pulleth the end of the rope wherewith it is bound causing it to fall 
and as it falleth, he calleth aloud the name of the God to whom he offereth the beast. Afterward, he putteth a noose round its neck, and in the noose a small stick, the which he twisteth, and so strangleth the beast. But he lighteth no fire, nor useth consecration, nor poureth out libation, but so soon as it is strangled, busies himself with the boiling of it. Now there is no wood in the land of Scythia, for which cause they use this method for the boiling of the flesh. First they flay the beast, and after strip off the flesh from the bones. This flesh they put into cauldrons of the country, if they chance to have such, and these cauldrons are like to the mixing bowls of the Arabs, but are larger by much, and under they burn the bones of the beast. But if they have no cauldron, they put all the flesh of the best into the paunch, and mixing it with water, burn the bones as before. The bones burn excellently well, and the paunch easily holds all the flesh when it has been stripped off, and when the flesh is boiled, the sacrificer takes off the entrails and of the flesh, and casts them on the earth before him, and this is their manner of offering. But to Ares they offer sacrifice after another manner. In each district of the land, at the chief place of it, there is a temple of Ares, and the temple is of this fashion. Faggots of brushwood are piled together in a heap, whereof the breadth is three furlongs, and the length three furlongs, but the height not so much. On this there is made a platform that is four square, and steep on every side save only one, but by this one a man may climb on the top, and on this they pile year by year one hundred and fifty wagon loads of brushwood, for the rains cause it to sink. In the midst of this platform is a sword of iron, made after an ancient fashion, and this sword is the image of Ares. And year by year they offer to this sword sheep and horses, and of the men whom they take captive in battle, they choose one out of every hundred and sacrifice them, but after a different manner to the sacrificing of the beasts. They pour wine on the heads of the men, and slay them over a great vessel, and then taking the blood on to the platform, pour it over the sword that serveth for an image. This they do with the blood, but as to the dead bodies, they cut from them the right shoulders down to the hand, and throw them into the air. Afterward they slay the other victims, and so depart. Swine they use never in sacrifice. Nay, they will not so much as keep this beast in their country. Concerning war, they have these customs. The first man that a Scythian slays in battle, he drinks of his blood, and he takes the heads of all he slays and carries them to the king. If he carry the head, then hath he a share of all the booty whatsoever may be taken, but if he carry it not, he hath no share. He flays the head in this manner. He makes a cut round about it, above the ears, and shakes the skull out of the scalp. The scalp he cleans it with the bone of an ox, and when he has softened it with his hand, useth it for a napkin. The Scythians hang these scalps upon their bridles, and make much account of them. For he that hath most napkins of this sort is reckoned to be the bravest of his company. Some sew the scalps together for cloaks, and others make covers of them for their quivers. Now the skin of a man is very white, and of a beautiful lustre beyond all other skins. With the skulls they deal in this fashion, but not with all, but with the skulls of these only, whom being alive they have most abhorred. The upper part, having been cut off above the eyebrows, they cover with a covering of leather, and use it for a drinking cup. And if a man be poor, this sufficeth him, but if he be rich, he addeth within a lining of gold. If a man have a quarrel with a kinsman, and overcome in a trial before the king, he dealeth with his skull in this fashion. And if he entertain strangers that are men of note, he will hand to them these cups, and tell how they were skulls of kinsmen that had a feud with him, and were vanquished before the king. Once in every year the chief man in each district mixeth a great bowl of wine, and all the Scythians that have slain an enemy in battle drink of it. But they who have not done this taste not of the wine, but sit apart as men that are disgraced. Such as have slain very many enemies have two cups instead of one, and drink from both. Among the Scythians are many soothsayers, who use divination by bundles of rods which they lose, putting each wand by itself, and so prophesying. If the king of the Scythians falls sick, he sendeth for three soothsayers, that are of the best repute. 
these use divination after the manner aforesaid and for the most part they say that such and such a man has sworn falsely by the king's hearth naming this or that citizen it is the custom of the scythians to swear by the king's hearth when they would take a very great oath then certain men lay hold on the man who is accused of having sworn falsely and the soothsayers affirm that he has sworn falsely by the king's hearth but the man is very vehement in denying that he hath done any such thing whereupon the king sendeth for other soothsayers twice as many in number as the former if these when they have used divination find the man guilty of having sworn falsely then they cut off his head forthwith and the former soothsayers divide his possessions among themselves but if the second company of soothsayers acquit him then the king sendeth for others and for others again and if the greater part acquit him then the former soothsayers must die they fill a wagon with brushwood and yoke oxen to it and they bind the soothsayers hand and foot and put gags in their mouths and so cast them into the midst of the brushwood then they set fire under the wood and cause the oxen to run frightening them oft times the oxen are consumed with the soothsayers but sometimes if the pole chance to be burned through they are singed only and so escape if the king cause a man to be put to death he slayeth all his male children also but the female he suffers to live the scythians make oaths in this manner they pour wine into a great bowl of earthenware and after mingle with the wine the blood of them that swear the oath making a scratch on their bodies with an awl or cutting them with a knife then they dip into the bowl a scimitar and arrows and a battle-axe and a javelin and they say many prayers over it and after this they that make the covenant drink of the bowls and their chief followers also the tombs of the kings are in the land of the geri so soon as the king dies they dig a grave which is very great and in shape foursquare then they embalm the dead body after their fashion and covering it with wax lay it in a wagon and send it to the nation that is next to them and this again sendeth it on to the next and every man both of the royal tribe from whom it cometh at the first and of the other tribes to whom it is sent doeth after this fashion he cuts off a part of an ear and crops his hair close and cuts round about his arm and wounds his forehead and his nose and runs an arrow through his left hand so they carry the dead body through the country coming at last to the gary where are the tombs of the kings here they lay it on a mattress in the grave fixing spears round about it and putting beams over it for a roof which they thatch with twigs of osier in the space round about the tomb and this is very great they bury one of the king's favourites having first strangled her also they bury his cup-bearer and his cook and his groom and his body-servant and his messenger and certain of his horses and first fruits of all his other possessions and also cups of gold for cups of silver and bronze they use not at all after this they make over the grave a very great mound striving with all their might to build it as high as may be when a year is past they do after this fashion they take the best of the king's servants all of them being scythians and chosen for this office by the king for they have no servants bought with money and strangle fifty of them and fifty also of the best of his horses and fill their bodies with chaff then they fix stakes in the ground setting pairs of them and on each pair half a wheel put archwise on these arches they fasten the horses and on the backs of the horses they set the young men and for each horse and its rider there are bit and bridle then they range the fifty riders in a circle round about the tomb and so leave them when a man of the people dies his kinsfolk lay him in a wagon and take him about to the houses of all his friends these all entertain the company at a banquet wherein they serve the dead man with meat even as they serve the others for forty days they carry about the dead body and afterward bury it and when the burial is finished then they that have carried about the dead man purify themselves after this fashion they set three sticks in the earth inclined together and on these they put cloth of wool as close together as may be so making a tent and in the tent they set a dish and in the dish stones made red hot and they cast hemp seed upon the stones hemp groweth abundantly in this land of scythia and the people make garments of it that are very like to garments made of flax so that a man must be skilful in such matters to distinguish them then the scythians creep under the tent 
and the hemp seed smoketh up the stones, so that no bath could smoke more. The Scythians are delighted beyond measure, and shout for joy. This smoking serves them for a bath, for they never wash their bodies with water. It is an abomination to the Scythians to use strange customs. This may be seen from what befell Anacarsis, for this man, having travelled over many lands, and shown great wisdom whithersoever he went, came to Sisychus, that is by the Hellespont, as he sailed homeward. Here he saw the people keeping a feast to the great mother very splendidly, and he vowed to the goddess that he also would keep a feast to her if he came safely to his home. And having come, he performed his vow, but a certain Scythian saw him and told the matter to King Saulius, who, when he saw how Anacarsis was behaving himself, shot him with an arrow and slew him. End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 6. The Vengeance of Queen Olga about nine forty five from the chronicle of nestor according to tradition the tribe of the drevlianes rebelled against prince igor and were punished they seized the first opportunity to murder him his widow queen olga resolved upon revenge the editor when igor had been killed by the drevlianes and his wife olga was at kiev with her son the young svatoslav the drevlianes said we have killed the russian prince let us marry his widow to our own prince mal then we can take svatoslav and do what we like with him and the drevlianes sent twenty of their bravest men by boat to olga they landed near the Boritschev for at that time the water ran close to the foot of kiev and no one lived down in the valley but everybody lived on the hill now outside the town itself and behind the temple of the mother of god was the palace of the dungeon so called because it was built with a stone dungeon and it was told olga that the drevlianes were come and olga called them to her and said my good friends what has brought you hither and they replied the drevlianes have sent us to you saying we have killed your husband because he was like a wolf in the way he pillaged and ravaged our country but our princes are good and bring prosperity to the land of the drevlianes we pray you therefore to become the wife of mal our prince and olga replied your proposal pleases me i cannot bring my husband to life again but i wish to do you honour in the presence of my people return now to your vessel and do the grand make a show of being proud and haughty and when i send to fetch you to-morrow say we will not go to her on foot neither will we go on horseback but will be carried into her presence in our own boat then they will carry you seated in your own boat and olga caused a wide and deep pit to be dug in the court of the dungeon outside the town the next day she sent messengers to fetch the ambassadors but they replied as she had commanded them and said we will not go on horseback we will not go on foot carry us in our own boat and olga's servants replied we must do as you bid us for our prince is dead and our princess wishes to marry your prince so they were carried in the boat sitting up full of pride in their long robes the people carried the boat to olga's palace and then threw them boat and all into the deep pit olga leaned over the edge and said how do you like the honour i have done you and they replied this is a worse death than we gave to igor and then she ordered that they should be buried alive and it was done then olga sent messengers to the drevlianes saying send me some of your great men so that i may be brought to your prince in a fitting manner or else the people of kiev will never let me come then the drevlianes picked out their greatest men the governors of their country and sent them to fetch olga when they arrived olga ordered a bath to be prepared for them 
and she said when you have bathed you shall come into my presence so the bath was heated and the drevlianes went in and began to bathe themselves then the door was shut and olga gave orders that the bath should be made very hot and they were all steamed to death then olga sent to the drevlianes and said see i am now coming to you prepare plenty of hydromel in the town where you killed my husband i wish to weep at his tomb and perform funeral rites in his honour so they gathered together a great quantity of hydromel and olga came followed by a small escort and taking off her fine robes she advanced towards her husband's tomb she wept over it and ordered her servants to raise a great tumulus when the rites were concluded the drevlianes sat down to drink and olga ordered her attendants to serve them then the drevlianes said to olga where are the great men we sent to fetch you and she said they are coming presently and when the drevlianes were quite intoxicated she ordered her attendants to fall upon them and massacre them and having given the order she departed and olga returned to kiev and prepared an army to go out against what was left of the drevlianes then olga and her son svatoslav gathered together a large and valiant army and they marched against the drevlianes after that there was a great battle and the drevlianes fled and shut themselves up in their stronghold olga then attacked the town of isk for it was there that her husband had been killed she advanced toward the town and the drevlianes having shut themselves up in it defended themselves with great energy for they knew what would be their fate if they surrendered and olga was before the town a whole year without being able to take it then she thought of a plan she sent messengers to the town saying on what are you relying all your fortresses have surrendered and are paying tribute the peasants are cultivating their fields and you alone refuse to pay tribute do you wish to die of hunger and the drevlianes replied we will willingly pay you tribute but what you want is to avenge your husband and olga said i have already avenged my husband twice when you came to kiev and once when i performed the funeral rites in his honour i have avenged him enough but i wish to receive a small tribute from you and when peace has been established i shall return home the drevlianes replied what do you want we will gladly give you honey and skins and olga said i ask but one little thing of you give me according to the number of your houses three pigeons and three sparrows for each house i shall be satisfied with that for i know that you have been impoverished by the siege the delighted drevlianes complied with olga's request and olga said now that you have been humble before me and my son go back to your town and i shall go away to-morrow and return to kiev then the drevlianes returned joyfully to their town and the news they brought filled the townspeople with pleasure and there was great rejoicing then olga gave to each of her soldiers one of the pigeons and one of the sparrows and she commanded each man to tie a little piece of bread dipped in sulphur to the wing of each bird and the bread was to be wrapped in a little bit of cloth and when it was getting dark olga ordered the soldiers to let loose the pigeons and sparrows the birds all flew back to their nests in the besieged town the pigeons to the pigeon holes and the sparrows to the eaves of the houses thus the dovecotes and the huts and the towers and the stables were all set on fire and not one escaped it was impossible to extinguish the flames because all the buildings were on fire at the same time then the people rushed out of the town in their despair and olga ordered her soldiers to take them captive some were put to death others were reduced to slavery and the remainder had to pay a heavy tribute two parts of the tribute were sent to kiev and one part to olga's own town vich gorod and olga established laws and taxes in the land of the drevlianes you can to this day see some of her palaces and her hunting grounds and olga returned to kiev and stayed there a whole year in the year nine forty eight olga visited constantinople the emperor at that time was constantine the son of leo the emperor saw that she was very beautiful and very clever he admired her intelligence and liked to talk with her you are worthy to reign with me in this town he said hearing these words olga said i am a pagan if you wish me to be baptized baptize me yourself otherwise i refuse to be baptized and the emperor baptized her with the help of the patriarch as soon as she had been baptized olga's mind became enlightened and the patriarch instructed her in the faith and gave her his blessing she knelt with her head bent before him and absorbed his instruction as a sponge absorbs water they gave her in baptism the name of helena 
after the mother of constantine the great after olga had been baptized the emperor said to her i wish to marry you what you wish to marry me after baptizing me and calling me your daughter she replied you know very well that such a thing would be contrary to the christian law but the emperor replied olga you have deceived me he then loaded her with presents and she returned to kiev End of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section seven vladimir in search of a religion about nine eighty eight by john s c abbott vladimir the great ruled russia from nine eighty to ten fifteen the editor vladimir's armies were ever on the move and the cry of battle was never intermitted on the southeast he extended his conquests to the carpathian mountains where they skirt the plains of hungary in the northwest he extended his sway by all the energies of fire and blood even to the shores of the baltic and to the gulf of finland elated beyond measure by his victories he attributed his success to the favour of his idol gods and resolved to express his homage by offerings of human blood he collected a number of handsome boys and beautiful girls and drew lots to see which of them should be offered in sacrifice the lot fell upon a fine boy from one of the christian families the frantic father interposed to save his child but the agents of vladimir fell fiercely upon them and they both were slain and offered in sacrifice their names ivan and theodore are still preserved in the russian church as the first christian martyrs of kiev a few more years of violence and crime passed away when vladimir became the subject of that marvellous change which nine hundred years before had converted the persecuting saul into the devoted apostle the circumstances of his conversion are very peculiar and are very minutely related by nestor other recitals seem to give authenticity to the narrative for some time vladimir had evidently been in much anxiety respecting the doom which awaited him beyond the grave he sent for the teachers of the different systems of religion to explain to him the peculiarities of their faith first came the mohammedans from bulgaria then the jews from jerusalem then the christians from the papal church at rome and then christians from the greek church at constantinople the mohammedans and the jews he rejected promptly but was undecided respecting the claims of rome and constantinople he then selected ten of the wisest men in his kingdom and sent them to visit rome and constantinople and report in which country divine worship was conducted in the manner most worthy of the supreme being the ambassadors returning to kiev reported warmly in favour of the greek church still the mind of vladimir was oppressed with doubts he assembled a number of the most virtuous nobles and asked their advice the question was settled by the remark of one who said had not the religion of the greek church been the best the sainted olga would not have accepted it this wonderful event is well authenticated nestor gives a recital of it in its minute details and an old greek manuscript preserved in the royal library at paris records the visit of these ambassadors to rome and constantinople vladimir's conversion however seems at this time to have been intellectual rather than spiritual a change in his policy of administration rather than a change of heart though this external change was a boundless blessing to russia there is but little evidence that vladimir then comprehended that moral renovation which the gospel of christ effects as its crowning glory he saw the absurdity of paganism he felt tortured by remorse perhaps he felt in some degree the influence of the gospel which was even then faithfully preached in a few churches in idolatrous kiev and he wished to elevate russia above the degradation of brutal idolatry he deemed it necessary that his renunciation of idolatry and adoption of christianity should be accompanied with pomp which should produce a widespread impression upon russia he 
he accordingly collected an immense army descended the dnieper in boats sailed across the black sea and entering the gulf of cherson near sevastopol after several bloody battles took military possession of the crimea thus victorious he sent an embassage to the emperors basil and constantine at constantinople that he wished the young christian princess anne for his bride and that if they did not promptly grant his request he would march his army to attack the city the emperors trembling before the approach of such a power replied that they would not withhold from him the hand of the princess if he would first embrace christianity vladimir of course consented to this which was the great object he had in view but demanded that the princess who was a sister of the emperor's should first be sent to him the unhappy maiden was overwhelmed with anguish at the reception of these tidings she regarded the pagan russians as ferocious savages and to be compelled to marry their chief was to her a doom more dreadful than death but policy which is the religion of cabinets demanded the sacrifice the princess weeping in despair was conducted accompanied by the most distinguished ecclesiastics and nobles of the empire to the camp of vladimir where she was received with the most gorgeous demonstrations of rejoicing the whole army expressed their gratification by all the utterances of triumph the ceremony of baptism was immediately performed in the church of st basil in the city of cherson and then at the same hour the marriage rites with the princess were solemnized vladimir ordered a large church to be built at kiev taking with him some preachers of distinction a communion service wrought in the most graceful proportions of grecian art and several exquisite specimens of statuary and sculpture to inspire his subjects with a love for the beautiful he accepted the christian teachers as his guides and devoted himself with extraordinary zeal to the work of persuading all his subjects to renounce their idol worship and accept christianity every measure was adopted to throw contempt upon paganism the idols were collected and burned in huge bonfires the sacred statue of perun the most illustrious of the pagan gods was dragged ignominiously through the streets pelted with mud and scourged with whips until at last battered and defaced it was dragged to the top of a precipice and tumbled headlong into the river amidst the derision and hootings of the multitude our zealous and new convert now issued a decree to all the people of russia rich and poor lords and slaves to repair to the river in the vicinity of kiev to be baptized at an appointed day the people assembled by thousands on the banks of the dnieper vladimir at length appeared accompanied by a great number of greek priests the signal being given the whole multitude men women and children waded slowly into the stream some boldly advanced out up to their necks in the water others more timid ventured only waist deep fathers and mothers led their children by the hand the priests standing upon the shore read the baptismal prayers and chanted the praises of god and then conferred the name of christians upon these barbarians the multitude then came up from the water vladimir was in a transport of joy his strange soul was not insensible to the sublimity of the hour and of the scene raising his eyes to heaven he uttered the following prayer creator of heaven and earth extend thy blessing to these thy new children may they know thee as the true god and be strengthened by thee in the true religion come to my help against the temptations of the evil spirit and i will praise thy name thus in the year nine eighty eight paganism was by a blow demolished in russia and nominal christianity introduced throughout the whole realm a christian church was erected upon the spot where the statue of perun had stood architects were brought from constantinople to build churches of stone in the highest artistic style missionaries were sent throughout the whole kingdom to instruct the people in the doctrines of christianity and to administer the rite of baptism nearly all the people readily received the new faith some however attached to the ancient idolatry refused to abandon it vladimir nobly recognizing the rights of conscience resorted to no measures of violence the idolaters were left undisturbed save by the teachings of the missionaries thus for several generations idolatry held a lingering life in the remote sections of the empire schools were established for the instruction of the young learned teachers from greece secured and books of christian biography translated into the russian tongue vladimir had then ten sons three others were afterwards born to him he divided his kingdom into ten provinces or states over each of which he placed one of these sons as governor on the frontiers of the empire he caused cities strongly fortified to be erected as safeguards against the invasion of remote barbarians 
for several years russia enjoyed peace with but trivial interruptions the character of vladimir every year wonderfully improved under his christian teachers he acquired more and more of the christian spirit and that spirit was infused into all his public acts he became the father of his people and especially the friend and helper of the poor the king was deeply impressed with the words of our saviour blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy and with the declaration of solomon he who giveth to the poor lendeth to the lord in the excess of his zeal of benevolence he was disposed to forgive all criminals thus crime was greatly multiplied and the very existence of the state became endangered the clergy in a body remonstrated with him assuring him that god had placed him upon the throne expressly that he might punish the wicked and thus protect the good he felt the force of this reasoning and instituted though with much reluctance a more rigorous government war had been his passion in this respect also his whole nature seemed to be changed and nothing but the most dire necessity could lead him to an appeal to arms the princess anne appears to have been a sincere christian and to have exerted the most salutary influence upon the mind of her husband in the midst of these great measures of reform sudden sickness seized vladimir in his palace and he died in the year ten fifteen so unexpectedly that he appointed no successor End of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone russia part two in the days of ivan the terrible historical note the tartars demanded the most complete submission to their sway and they had the power to enforce their demands the proud russian princes must kneel before the tartar khan they must humbly beg him for either life or death as he might elect whenever he chose to require it they must make the dangerous and wearisome journey across asia to prostrate themselves before him and assure him of their obedience and servility under this terrible discipline the quarrels between the little states of russia ended and by the fifteenth century the country was ready to present a united front to the oppressors taking advantage of dissensions among the tartar leaders vladimir the third in fourteen eighty delivered russia from the servitude that she had endured for more than two hundred years toward the middle of the sixteenth century ivan the terrible came to the throne as long as his wife lived she and the priests restrained him from carrying out his cruel impulses but after her death had given him freedom he manifested a delight in the infliction of torture and murder that is probably without parallel in history among his many atrocities he destroyed the city of novgorod and put to death it is said sixty thousand of the inhabitants it was during his reign that as the story goes an outlaw named yermak made conquests in siberia and gave the country to the czar in exchange for his own pardon ivan's son feodor was the last monarch of the house of rurik which had governed russia for nearly eight centuries his death was followed by a period of confusion ended in sixteen thirteen by the elevation of the house of romanov which has ever since held the throne End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section nine how russia was freed from the tartars fourteen eighty by john s c abbott 
in fourteen sixty two ivan the third or ivan the great was permitted by the tartars to call himself ruler but this independent young man of twenty-two refused to pay the tribute moreover he and his troops appeared suddenly before kazan the tartar capital burned the city and slew its tartar inhabitants without mercy now came an event that interested all europe and this was the marriage of ivan the great to the niece of constantine palaeologus the last emperor of the eastern empire she had fled to rome and the pope offered her hand to ivan the russians were delighted her journey to moscow was a continued triumph magnificent entertainments were prepared for her at every stopping-place the pope had given her a rich dowry and had sent with her a large suite of the noblest of the romans this was in fourteen seventy two for nineteen years the turks had ruled constantinople now was the opportunity for the greeks to escape from their control and become subjects of the husband of their own princess cultivated men not only from constantinople but from the other countries to which they had fled statesmen artists men of science and of literary acquirements gladly followed the princess sophia to russia to the great advantage of that country this proud young bride of the prince was indignant at being in any way subservient to the tartars it is said that she often demanded how long am i to be their slave their power over the land was coming to an end sooner than she supposed and in a somewhat remarkable fashion the editor while affairs were moving thus prosperously in russia the horde upon the volga was also recovering its energies and a new khan Ahmed, war loving and inflated by the success which his sword had already achieved resolved to bring russia again into subjection he accordingly in the year fourteen eighty sent an embassy bearing an image of the khan as their credentials to moscow to demand the tribute which of old had been paid to the tartars ivan the third was in no mood to receive the insult patiently he admitted the embassage into the audience chamber of his palace his nobles in imposing array were gathered around prepared for a scene such as was not unusual in those barbaric times as soon as the ambassadors entered and were presented the image of the khan was dashed to the floor by the order of ivan and trampled under feet and all the mongol ambassadors with the exception of one were slain go said ivan sternly to him go to your master and tell him what you have seen tell him that if he has the insolence again to trouble my repose i will treat him as i have served his image and his ambassadors this emphatic declaration of war was followed on both sides by the mustering of armies the horde was soon in motion passing from the volga to the don in numbers which were represented to be as the sands of the sea they rapidly and resistlessly ascended the valley of this river marking their path by a swath of ruin many miles in width the grand prince took the command of the russian army in person and rendezvoused his troops at kaluga thence stationing them along the northern banks of the oka to dispute the passage of that stream all russia was in a state of feverish excitement one decisive battle would settle the question whether the invaders were to be driven in bloody rout out of the empire or whether the whole kingdom was to be surrendered to devastation by savages as fierce and merciless as wolves about the middle of october the two armies met upon the opposite banks of the oka with only the waters of that narrow stream to separate them cannon and muskets were then just coming into use but they were rude and feeble instruments compared with the power of such weapons at the present day swords arrows javelins clubs axes battering rams and catapults and the tramplings of horses were the engines of destruction which man then wielded most potently against his fellow-man the quarrel was a very simple one some hundreds of thousands of mongols had marched to the heart of russia leaving behind them a path of flame and blood nearly a thousand miles in length that they might compel the russians to pay them tribute some hundred thousand russians had met them there to resist even to death their insolent and oppressive demand the tartars were far superior in numbers to the russians but ivan had made such a skilful disposition of his troops that Akhmet could not cross the stream for nearly a week the two armies fought from the opposite banks throwing at each other bullets balls stones arrows and javelins a few were wounded and some slain in this impotent warfare the russians were however very faint-hearted it was evident that should the tartars effect the passage of the river the russians already demoralized by fear would be speedily overpowered the grand prince himself was so apprehensive as to the result that he sent one of his nobles with rich presents to the khan and proposed terms of peace Achmet, 
rejected the presents and sent back the haughty reply i have come thus far to take vengeance upon ivan to punish him for neglecting for nine years to appear before me with tribute and in homage let him come penitently into my presence and kiss my stirrup and then perhaps if my lords intercede for him i may forgive him as soon as it was heard in moscow that the grand prince was manifesting such timidity the clergy sent to him a letter urging the vigorous defence of their country and of their religion the letter was written by vassian the archbishop of moscow and was signed on behalf of the clergy by several of the higher ecclesiastics the closing paragraph of this letter was as follows i pray you grand prince do not censure me for my feeble words for it is written give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser so may it be receive our benediction you and your children all the nobles and chieftains and all your brave warriors children of jesus christ amen this letter instead of giving the king offence inspired him with new zeal and courage he immediately abandoned all idea of peace a fortnight had now passed in comparative inaction the russians and tartars menacing each other from opposite sides of the stream the cold month of november had now come and a thin coating of ice began to spread over the surface of the stream it was evident that achmet was only waiting for the river to be frozen over and that in a few days he would be able to cross at any point the grand prince seeing that the decisive battle could not much longer be deferred ordered his troops in the night to make a change of position that he might occupy the plains of borosk as a field more favourable for his troops but the russian soldiers still agitated by the fears which their sovereign had not been able to conceal regarded this order as the signal for retreat the panic spread from rank to rank and favoured by the obscurity of the night soon the whole host in the wildest confusion were in rapid flight no efforts of the officers could arrest the dismay before the morning the russian camp was entirely deserted and the fugitives were rushing like an inundation up the valley of the moskva toward the imperial city but god did not desert russia in this decisive hour he appears to have heard and answered the prayers which had so incessantly ascended in the russian annals their preservation is wholly attributed to the interposition of that god whose aid the bishops the clergy and christian men and women in hundreds of churches had so earnestly implored the tartars seeing in the earliest dawn of the morning the banks of the river entirely abandoned by the russians imagined that the flight was but a ruse of war that ambuscades were prepared for them and remembering previous scenes of exterminating slaughter they also were seized with a panic and commenced a retreat this movement itself increased the alarm terror spread rapidly in an hour the whole tartar host abandoning their tents and their baggage were in tumultuous flight as the sun rose an unprecedented spectacle was presented two immense armies were flying from each other in indescribable confusion and dismay each actually frightened out of its wits and no one pursuing either the russians did not stop for a long breath until they attained the walls of moscow achmet having reached the head waters of the don retreated rapidly down that stream wreaking such vengeance as he could by the way but not venturing to stop until he had reached his stronghold upon the banks of the volga thus singularly providentially terminated this last serious invasion of russia by the tartars a russian analyst in attributing the glory of this well authenticated event all to god writes shall men vain and feeble celebrate the terror of their arms no it is not to the might of earth's warriors it is not to human wisdom that russia owes her safety but only to the goodness of god ivan the third in the cathedrals of moscow offered long continued praises to god for this victory obtained without the effusion of blood an annual festival was established in honour of this great event achmet with his troops disorganized and scattered had hardly reached the volga ere he was attacked by a rival khan who drove him some five hundred miles south to the shore of the sea of azov here his rival overtook him killed him with his own hand took his wives and his daughters captives seized all his riches and then seeking friendly relations with russia sent word to moscow that the great enemy of the grand prince was in his grave thus terminated for ever the sway of the tartars over the russians for two hundred years russia had been held by the khans in slavery though the horde long continued to exist as a band of lawless and uncivilized men often engaged in predatory excursions no further attempts were made to exact either tribute or homage End of section nine this recording is in the public domain
section ten of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section ten ivan the terrible fifteen thirty three to fifteen eighty four by francis a shaw the government was now fifteen thirty three in the hands of a council of regency with prince andrew shuiski at its head shuiski and his associates were unprincipled designing men who in every way sought to corrupt and brutalize the young czarevitch and thus render him incapable of reigning terrible deeds of cruelty were enacted before his very eyes and if the lad chanced to show favour to any one around him the life of that favoured one was instantly in danger his guardians mocked at his better impulses and applauded his crime when he tortured young animals or in his furious drives around moscow trampled old people and little children under his horse's hoofs they commended him as if he had done some brave and chivalrous deed they treated his friends with the greatest indignity and even he the descendant of so long a line of sovereigns was often the object of abuse and contumely these men seemed to delight in visiting on this helpless heir to the throne the insults they had received from his mother the regent helena under such pupilage all that was good in ivan's nature was repressed all that was bad was stimulated and fostered he reached his fourteenth year old in wickedness and ripe for revolt against his tormentors and oppressors he declared that he would rule without the aid of a council and in a momentary fit of rage against andrew shuiski ordered him to be thrown to his dogs they have well deserved the repast he said the order was obeyed and by this horrible death the head of the powerful house of shuiski expiated a life of violence and crime but the gluiski another powerful family now rose to ascendancy in the state and exerted a no less baleful influence upon the czarevitch in his eighteenth year after a minority of blood and horror ivan was crowned czar his atrocities were so great that the long-suffering people at length driven to desperation fired moscow in several places at dead of night ivan awoke amid flame and smoke and the imprecations of the populace at this very moment one sylvester a monk who pretended to divine inspiration appeared before the young czar with an open gospel in one hand and the other raised in the attitude of prophecy he warned ivan of the wrath of heaven which was even now visiting his evil deeds adducing certain signs which had recently appeared in the sky as tokens of the anger of an offended god alexis adeshef the one good man among all ivan's evil counsellors seconded the monk in his efforts at reforming the czar but their most powerful ally was anastasia ivan's beautiful young bride a princess of the romanoff family a woman of the most sweet and gentle disposition and possessed of a mind superior to the age in which she lived religious fervour and love combined wrought an entire change in ivan's character he became almost a fanatic in his new-born zeal when he took the city of kazan from the tartars he changed the mosques into christian temples and compelled the khan to be baptized he showed himself also a progressive sovereign and sincerely desirous of the good of his people but the tiger in his nature was only slumbering to awake ere long into tenfold fury 
the beneficent influence of anastasia and adashef lasted thirteen years and all the greatness and glory of ivan's long reign of half a century are comprised within this brief period anastasia died ivan who was just recovering from an illness which is supposed to have partially crazed his brain was haunted by an unjust suspicion that she had been poisoned and sought to revenge her death on all his subjects from this time suspicion and terror constantly brooded over his darkened soul he distrusted all who approached him and lived in momentary fear of assassination the mad atrocities of his career after anastasia's death can be explained only on the ground of insanity these atrocities surpass belief and form the most sickening page of russian history there those who have a taste for horrors can find them in full detail in comparison with ivan the fourth justly called in russian annals ivan the terrible caligula and nero become almost respectable one of his most stupendous crimes and yet it was but one among many was the destruction of novgorod the mother of russian cities a commonwealth older than florence and much larger than the london of that day it was a city rich in historic memories and linked with the whole past of russia whose capital it had been six centuries before st petersburg rose on the banks of the neva there may even now be found in the kremlin a bronze group typifying its reign of a thousand years a proud a wealthy a luxurious city its walls embraced a circuit of fifty miles and it contained four hundred thousand souls this city novgorod the great had offended ivan by its love of liberty its wealth and independence but above all by its hatred of his rule and its efforts to be taken under the protection of sweden he swore that he would raise novgorod and sow its site with salt and invading it with an army of thirty thousand tartars he raged there for six weeks like an infuriated tiger his orders to his soldiers were burn slay give no quarter to old or young with his own hand he aided in the wholesale butchery the streets ran blood the river was choked with the bodies of the slain his victims numbered sixty thousand the greater part of the city was pillaged and burned novgorod never recovered from the catastrophe it is now an obscure village other smaller cities shared the same fate and in moscow his own capital he enacted scenes of horror too terrible for description often at the closing act of one of his greatest atrocities he would say piously lifting his eyes to heaven my dear people i ask an interest in your prayers one of ivan's martyrs was philip pryor a priest of great purity of heart and life who had dared rebuke the crimes of the czar to his very face the greek church has canonized philip his remains have been removed to moscow and on the day of his coronation every czar of russia must kneel before his shrine and kiss his feet ivan the terrible violated all law human and divine in defiance of the strictest canons of his church he had a plurality of wives when already the husband of seven living wives he aspired to the hand of queen elizabeth of england as that obdurate maiden would not listen to his suit he made a formal offer of his heart and hand to one of her ladies of honour mary hastings daughter of the earl of huntington but the lady mary though at first dazzled with the prospect of a throne concluded to decline the dangerous and doubtful honour and nothing remained to the discomfited wooer but to soothe his lacerated affections by putting to death the ambassador through whom his matrimonial overtures to the english court had been made no sovereign has ever been so great an enigma to historians as ivan the fourth if he was mad there was certainly method in his madness to him russia owes its complete deliverance from tartar rule 
his conquests were many and valuable and in them all he supplanted the crescent by the cross although personally a coward his arms proved more than a match for the swedes and the poles he opened russia to foreign trade introduced printing reformed the clergy assembled a parliament to consult upon the common weal and drew up a code of laws in many respects admirable always terrible to the rich and great he was often a benefactor of the poor it has been said that there were in ivan two distinct beings the great man and the wild beast i am your god as god is mine was his common declaration to his subjects he would walk about the streets of moscow ordering this one to be beaten that one to be put to death no age sex or condition was exempt from his fury in a fit of frenzy he killed with a single blow of his iron staff the only one of his three sons who was fit to rule and he was ever after consumed by an undying regret of remorse he was incapable he died soon after in fifteen eighty four having reigned fifty years twenty-six of which were one unintermittent fever of fury and revenge how could the people suffer such a monster to live and reign we ask as we read the record of ivan's appalling crimes and we find our answer in the character of the russian people nowhere is the sentiment of loyalty so deeply rooted as in russia nowhere is that divinity which doth hedge a king so sacred the uneducated masses of russia even in our day can imagine no limitation to the power of the czar i believe in god in heaven and the czar on earth is an article of the creed which even so late as the reign of the emperor nicholas they taught their children amid all the horrors enacted by ivan the people looked upon him as their anointed sovereign god's vicegerent who had power over life and death who alone could preserve the purity of the national religion and save millions of souls from endless perdition when sometimes in his frenzies of passion he would threaten to leave his throne they would most abjectly entreat him to remain offering their lives as a sacrifice to his righteous anger if such should be his sovereign will and pleasure the russians of this period though sunken in the deepest ignorance imagined themselves the best informed people on earth but among them astronomy anatomy and kindred sciences were regarded as diabolical arts the learning of their priests was confined mostly to a little latin and less greek their only mode of reckoning was by means of balls strung upon strings and the skins of wild beasts had just ceased to be their current money reading and writing were occult mysteries confined to the learned few the father in his thatched hut was as despotic as the czar on his throne he had power over the lives of his children he could sell them into slavery russian wives had less freedom than their asiatic sisters and were treated with great barbarity prisoners of war were slaves insolvent debtors were given to their creditors the poor man could sell himself to the rich man slaves must imbibe the vices of their enslavers and the russian character of this day exhibits traces of its vile tartar servitude national pride and personal honour were crushed out of the russian heart and cunning and greed had usurped their place with the tartars came the knout and all sorts of corporal punishments the manners and customs of the people were barred from the greeks as well as the tartars and showed generally the worst traits of both every individual of a family was involved in the ruin of one of its members to leave the country was rebellion and treason there was no asylum from the all-prevailing despotism of the czar always in danger from civil war and outside invasion the natural ferocity of both prince and people was aggravated by fear End of section ten this recording is in the public domain section eleven of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the world story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section eleven life at the setch fifteenth century by nikolai v gogol the cossack officials in spite of their wild reckless life regarded it as eminently proper to send their sons away to school for some years but to admit that they had any remembrance of the education which they had received was looked upon as highly improper the setch was the great camp on the edge of the tartar territory the descendants of the cossacks are highly valued in the russian army especially in skirmishing operations the editor ah turn round son how ridiculous you are what sort of priest's cassock have you got on do all in the academy dress like this with such words did old bulba greet his two sons who had been away for their education to the royal seminary in kiev and had just returned home to their father his sons had but just dismounted from their horses they were a couple of stout lads who still looked askance like youths recently released from the seminary their strong healthy faces were covered with the first down which had as yet never known a razor they were very much disturbed by such a reception from their father and stood motionless with their eyes fixed upon the earth stand still stand still let me have a good look at you he continued turning them round how long your svitkas are what svitkas there never were such svitkas in the world before just run one of you i will see whether he will not get entangled in the skirts and fall to the ground don't laugh don't laugh father said the eldest of them at length see how touchy they are why shouldn't i laugh because although you are my father if you laugh by heavens i will beat you ah what kind of a son are you what your father said terrace bulba retreating several paces in amazement yes even my father i don't stop to consider persons when an insult is in question so you want to fight me with your fists any way well let it be with fists said terrace bulba stripping up his sleeves i'll see what sort of a man you are with your fists and the father and son in place of a pleasant meeting after long separation began to administer to each other heavy blows in the ribs on the back and chest now retreating and looking at each other now attacking afresh look good people the old man has gone mad he has lost his senses completely screamed their pale ugly good mother who was standing on the threshold and had not yet succeeded in embracing her darling children the children have come home we have not seen them for over a year and now he has taken some strange freak he's pummeling them yes he fights well said bulba pausing well by heavens he continued rather as if excusing himself yes although he has never tried before he will be a good cossack now welcome son embrace me and the father and son began to kiss each other good little son see that you beat every one as you pummeled me don't let any one escape nevertheless your garment is ridiculous what rope is this hanging here and you lout why are you standing there with your hands hanging said he turning to the youngest why don't you fight me you son of a dog what an idea said the mother who had managed in the meantime to embrace the youngest who ever heard of a man's own children beating their father that's enough for the present the child is young he has had a long journey he is tired the child was over twenty and about six feet high he ought to rest and eat something and he sets him to fighting eh i see you are a scribbler said bulba don't listen to your mother little son she is a woman she knows nothing what sort of petting do you need your petting is a clear field and a good horse that's your petting and do you see this sword that's your mother all the rest they stuff your heads with is rubbish 
the academy books a b c books philosophy and all that i spit upon it all here bulba added a word which is not used in print but i'll tell you what is best i'll take you to zaporozh the cossack country beyond the falls of the dnieper this very week there's science for you there's your school there alone will you acquire sense and are they only to remain at home a week said the thin old mother sadly with tears in her eyes the poor boys will have no chance to go about no chance to get acquainted with the home where they were born there will be no chance for me to get a look at them enough you've howled enough old woman a cossack is not born to run around after women you would like to hide them both under your petticoat and sit upon them as a hen sits on eggs go go and let us have everything there is on the table in a trice we don't want any pampushka honey cakes poppy cakes or any other messes bring us a whole sheep give us a goat mead forty years old and as much gorilka corn brandy as possible not with raisins and all sorts of stuff but plain flaming gorilka which foams and hisses like mad bulba led his sons into the principal room of the cabin and two handsome female servants in coin necklaces who were arranging the apartment ran out quickly they were evidently frightened at the arrival of the young men who did not care to be familiar with any one or else they merely wanted to maintain their female custom of screaming and rushing headlong at the sight of a man and then screening their lively shame for a long time with their sleeves the cabin was furnished according to the fashion of that period concerning which vivid hints remain only in the songs and lyrics which are no longer sung in the ukraine by aged blind men with gentle tinkle of the bandura to the people thronging round them according to the taste of that warlike and troublous time when the leagues and battles began to occur in the ukraine after the union all was clean smeared with coloured clay on the walls hung sabres nagaiki hunting whips nets for birds fish nets and guns cleverly carved powder horns gilded bits for horses and tether ropes with silver plates the window was small with round dull panes through which it was impossible to see except by raising the one movable pane around the windows and doors were red bands on shelves in the corner stood jugs bottles and flasks of green and blue glass carved silver cups and gilded glasses of various makes venetian turkish circassian which had arrived in bulba's cabin by various roads at third and fourth hand a thing which was quite common in those bold days there were birch benches all around the room a huge table under the images in the front corner and a wide oven all covered with party-coloured patterns and projections and depressions with spaces between it and the wall all this was very familiar to our two young men who came home every year during the dog days because they had no horses and because it was not customary to permit the students to ride on horseback all they had was tchubui long locks of hair on the temples which every cossack who bore weapons could pull it was only at the end of their course that bulba sent them from his stud a couple of young stallions bulba on the occasion of his son's arrival ordered all the sotniks captains of hundreds and all the officers of the band who were of any consequence to be summoned and when two of them arrived with the o saul under hetman or chief dimitro tovkatch his old comrade he immediately presented his son saying see what fine young fellows they are i shall send them to the setch shortly the guests congratulated bulba and both the young men and told them they would do well and that there was no better knowledge for a young man than a knowledge of that soporatian setch now brothers seat yourselves each where he likes best at the table now my sons first of all let's drink gorilka so spoke bulba god bless you welcome sons you ah stop and you andri god grant that you may always be successful in war that you may conquer the mussulmans and the turks and the tartars and when the poles undertake any expedition against our faith then may you beat the poles now clink your glasses how now is the gorilka good what's gorilka in latin come my son 
the latins were stupid they did not know there was such a thing in the world as gorilka what was the name of the man who wrote latin rhymes i don't know much about reading and writing so i don't know quite was it horace what a dad thought the eldest son oh stop the old dog knows everything but he always pretends the contrary i don't believe the archimancrite allowed you so much as a smell of gorilka continued terrace confess my little sons they beat you well with fresh birch twigs on your backs and all over your cossack bodies and perhaps when you became too sensible they beat you with whips and not on saturday only i fancy but on wednesday and thursday what is past father must not be recalled it is done with let them try it now said andre let anybody just touch me let any tartar expose himself now and he'll learn what a cossack sword is like good my son by heavens good and when it comes to that i'll go with you by heavens i'll go what should i wait here for to become a buckwheat reaper and housekeeper to look after the sheep and swine and go around with my wife away with them i am a cossack i'll have none of them what's left but war i'll go with you to zaporozh to carouse i'll go by heavens and old bulba grew warm by degrees and finally quite angry rose from the table and assuming a dignified attitude stamped his foot we will go to-morrow why delay what enemy can we besiege here what is this hut to us what do we want of all this what are pots to us so saying he began to knock the pots and flasks and to throw them about the poor woman well used to such capers from her husband looked sadly on from her seat on the wall bench she did not dare to say anything but when she heard the decision which was so terrible for her she could not refrain from tears she looked at her children from whom so speedy a separation was threatened and it is impossible to describe the full force of her speechless grief which seemed to quiver in her eyes and on her lips convulsively pressed together bulba was terribly headstrong he was one of the characters which could only exist in that fierce fifteenth century in that half nomadic corner of europe when the whole of southern original russia deserted by its princes was laid waste burned to the quick by pitiless troops of mongolian robbers when men deprived of house and home were brave here when amid conflagrations in sight of threatening neighbors and eternal fear they settled down and grew accustomed to looking them straight in the face and trained themselves not to know that there was such a thing as fear in the world when the ancient peaceable slav spirit was seized with warlike flame and the cossack state was instituted a free wild feast of russian nature and when all the river banks fords and suitable places were populated by cossacks whose number no man knew and whose bold comrades had a right to reply to the sultan inquiring how many they were who knows we are scattered all over the steppes wherever there is a hillock there is a cossack it was in fact a most remarkable exhibition of russian strength dire necessity forced it from the bosom of the people in place of the original provinces petty towns filled with huntsmen and whippers in in place of the warring and bartering petty princes and cities there arose great colonies currens cossack villages and districts bound together by a common danger and hatred towards the heathen robbers the whole story is well known how their incessant fighting and restless life saved europe from the merciless hordes which threatened to overwhelm her the polish kings finding themselves sovereigns in place of the provincial princes over these extensive lands though they were distant and feeble yet understood the significance of the cossacks and the advantages of this warlike untrammelled life they encouraged them and flattered this disposition of mind under their distant rule the hetmans chosen from among the cossacks themselves redistributed the districts and villages into regiments and uniform districts it was not a regularly recruited army no one saw it but in case of war and general uprising it required a week and no more for every man to appear on horseback fully armed receiving only one ducat from the king and in two weeks such an army had assembled as no recruiting officers would ever have been able to collect when the expedition was ended the army dispersed among fields and meadows and the fords of the dnieper each man fished traded brewed his beer and was a free cossack their foreign contemporaries rightly marvelled at their wonderful qualities there was no trade which the cossack did not know he could distill brandy make a telega peasant's wagon make powder do blacksmiths and locksmiths work 
in addition to committing wild excesses drinking and carousing as only a russian can all this he was equal to besides the registered cossacks who considered themselves bound to appear in time of war it was possible to collect at any time in case of dire need a whole army of volunteers all that was required was for the assault uh, to traverse all the market-places and squares of the villages and hamlets and shout at the top of his voice standing in his telega hey ye distillers and beer-brewers ye have brewed enough beer and lolled on your ovens and fed your fat bodies with flour long enough rise win glory and knightly honour ye ploughmen reapers of buckwheat tenders of sheep danglers after women enough of following the plough and dirtying your yellow shoes in the earth and courting women and wasting your knightly strength the hour has come to win glory for the cossacks and these words were like sparks falling on dry wood the husbandman broke his plough the brewers and distillers threw away their casks and destroyed their barrels the mechanic and merchant sent their trade and their shop to the devil broke the pots and everything else in their houses and mounted their horses in short the russian character here received a broad deep development and a powerful expression Terrace bulba and his sons had been in the setch about a week astop and andri occupied themselves but little with the school of war the setch was not fond of troubling itself with warlike exercises and wasting time the young generation grew up and learned these by experience alone in the very heat of battles which were therefore incessant the cossacks thought it a nuisance to fill up the intervals of this instruction with any sort of drill except perhaps shooting at a mark and on rare occasions with horse racing and wild beast hunts on the steppes and in the forests all the rest of the time was devoted to revelry a sign of the wide diffusion of moral liberty all the setch presented an unusual scene it was one unbroken revel a ball noisily begun which had lost its end some busied themselves with trades others kept little shops and traded but the majority caroused from morning till night if the wherewithal jingled in their pockets and if the booty they had captured had not passed into the hands of the shopkeepers and pot-house keepers this universal revelry had something fascinating about it it was not an assembly of topers who drank to drown sorrow but it was simply a wild revelry of joy every one who came thither forgot everything abandoned everything which had hitherto interested him he so to speak spit on all his past and gave himself recklessly up to freedom and the good fellowship of men of the same stamp as himself idlers having neither relatives nor home nor family nothing except the free sky and the eternal revel of their souls this gave rise to that wild gaiety which could not have come from any other source the tales and talk among the assembled crowd which reposed lazily on the ground were often so droll and breathed such power of vivid narration that it required all the nonchalance of a soporaches to retain his immovable expression without even a twitch of the moustache a sharp trait which to this day distinguishes a southern russian from his brethren it was drunken noisy mirth but there was no black alehouse where a man forgets himself in darkly seducing merriment it was a dense throng of schoolboys the only difference was that instead of sitting under the pointer and worn-out doctrines of a teacher they practised racing upon five thousand horses instead of the field where they played ball they had the boundless untrammelled borderlands and at the sight of them the tartar showed his alert head and the turk gazed grimly in his green turban the difference was that instead of their forced companionship of school they themselves deserted their fathers and mothers and fled from their homes that here were those about whose neck a rope had already been wound and who instead of pale death had seen life and life in all its intensity that here were those who from generous habits could never keep a kopeck in their pockets that here were those who had hitherto regarded a ducat as wealth whose pockets thanks to the jew revenue farmers could have been turned wrong side out without any danger of anything falling from them here all were students who would not endure the academic rod and had not carried away a single letter from the schools but with them were also some who knew about horace cicero and the roman republic there were many of them officers who afterwards distinguished themselves in the king's armies 
and there were numerous and clever partisans who cherished a magnanimous conviction that it was of no consequence where they fought so long as they fought because it was a disgrace to an honourable man to live without fighting there were many who had come to the setch for the sake of being able to say afterwards that they had been in the setch and were therefore steeled warriors but who was not there this strange republic was a necessary outgrowth of that epoch lovers of a warlike life of golden beakers and rich brocades of ducats and gold pieces could always find employment there the lovers of women alone could find nothing there for no woman dared show herself even in the suburbs of the setch it seemed exceedingly strange to ostap and andri that though a crowd of people had come to the setch with them yet not a soul inquired whence come these men who are they and what are their names they had come thither as though returning to their own homes whence they had departed only an hour before the newcomer merely presented himself to the cotchevois who generally said welcome do you believe in christ i do replied the new arrival and do you believe in the holy trinity i do and you go to church i do now cross yourself the newcomer crossed himself very good replied the cachevois enter the curran where you are acquainted this concluded the ceremony and all the such prayed in one church and were willing to defend it to their last drop of blood although they would not hear to fasting or abstinence jews armenians and tartars alone inspired by strong avarice took the liberty of living and trading in the suburbs for the saparatsitsi never cared for trade and paid whatever money their hand chanced to grasp in their pockets moreover the lot of these gain-loving traders was pitiable in the extreme they resembled people who had settled at the foot of vesuvius for when the saparatsitsi lacked money then the bold adventurers broke down their booths and took everything gratis the setch consisted of over sixty currents which greatly resemble separate independent republics but still more a school or seminary of children always ready for anything no one had any occupation no one retained anything for himself everything was in the hands of the ataman of the curran who on that account generally went by the name of father in his hands were deposited the money clothes all the provisions oatmeal groats even the firewood they gave him money to take care of quarrels in the curran among its inhabitants were not infrequent in that case they proceeded at once to blows the inhabitants of the curran swarmed upon the square and beat each other's ribs in with their fists until one side had finally gained the upper hand when the revelry began such was the setch end of section eleven this recording is in the public domain section twelve of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section twelve the false czar sixteen hundred and five by francis a shaw from the coming of rurik in the ninth century his descendants had been the rulers of russia the last of them in the male line was a little boy of ten years named dmitri in fifteen ninety one he was found murdered and it was believed that boris the next heir to the throne was the guilty man boris became czar but he was savage and cruel and was hated by his people the editor a report spread among the people that it was a peasant child and not the czarevich who had been murdered that dmitri was still living in poland the rise and fall of this false dmitri forms one of the most romantic episodes of russian history his real name was gregory atrapiev and he was a young monk who could both read and write these accomplishments rare at that day had won him a place in the service of a polish prince who passed much time at the court of the czar it is related we know not how truly that this prince one day gave his secretary a box on the ear and that the youth immediately burst into tears saying if you knew who i am you would not treat me so 
he then told a very plausible story declaring that he was dmitri the true heir to the russian throne the story seems not to have made much impression upon the polish prince at the time but he afterwards espoused the impostor's cause from some old servants of the czarina mary Atropiev learned many particulars in the life of the murdered czarevich he also ascertained the names and titles of the officers who had been attached to the boy's person and by some means obtained possession of a seal bearing dmitri's initials and a cross set with diamonds said to have been his baptismal gift having well studied and prepared his part he begged permission to retire to his cloister when asked how he could leave the court where with his talent and learning a brilliant future might be in store for him he replied laughing by remaining here i should become a bishop at the highest but i mean to be czar of russia this frequent declaration having reached the ears of boris he gave orders to have the crazy monk sent to a remote cloister and thought no more about him Atropiev set out under the escort of two monks whom on the journey he won over to his side persuading them to accompany him to lithuania where the czar had many open enemies whenever they tarried for the night at a wayside monastery Atropiev would write on the wall i am dmitri son of ivan the fourth although believed to be dead i escaped from my assassins when i am upon my father's throne i will recompense the generous men who now show me hospitality far and near the people caught up the tidings that the true heir was yet alive the young monk was now twenty-two the age dmitri would have been if living those who had known the czar ivan in his youth fancied that Atropiev resembled him in form and feature while his dark complexion and reddish hair were those of the czarina mary like dmitri he had one arm longer than the other and two warts on the face one on the forehead the other under the right eye these marks of identity together with the royal seal and the diamond cross were regarded as ample proof that the young man was not an impostor many believed in the genuineness of his claims and very many at heart incredulous espoused his cause from motives of policy or hatred to boris godinov the jesuits became his most zealous supporters and the pope's nuncio promised the aid of the sovereign pontiff if Atropiev would promise when he became czar to further the interest of the latin church hatred to russia alone would have made sigismund king of poland a willing ally of the impostor had there not been other and stronger reasons for espousing his cause the cossacks of the don flocked to the pretender's standard the ukraine declared for him and he soon raised an army of fifteen thousand men with which he appeared on the russian frontier boris had already sent a force of fifty thousand against him after some fruitless skirmishing the decisive battle was fought on the twentieth of january sixteen hundred and five just before entering the fight dmitri stood in front of his army and prayed fervently committing his righteous cause to the god of battles he then addressed his soldiers so exciting their enthusiasm by his glowing eloquence that all resolved to conquer or die with their leader the issue of the contest was for a long time doubtful but the impostor remained master of the field so profound a policy seemed to dictate all his actions that many supposed him to have been a close student of machiavelli for reasons best known to himself he was in no haste to enter moscow and seize the crown that glittering prize which for three years had been the sole object of his dreams and which was now just within his grasp in a manifesto issued soon after his victory he said let boris gudinov descend from the throne he has usurped and in the solitude of the cloister seek to make his peace with heaven in that case i will forgive his crimes and assure him of my protection boris well knew that the czarevich dmitri had been murdered by his express command 
but tortured by remorse for his many crimes he fancied that the avenger of blood was upon his track the phantom of his youthful victim was ever before his diseased imagination he believed that the son of ivan the fourth had really risen from his grave and headed the victorious army that was about to enter moscow and drive him from his throne the autocrat trembled with fear but he gave no outward sign his court one of the most splendid in europe remained gorgeous as ever he still sat at the council board and directed the affairs of the empire all this time he was plotting suicide but he resolved to die as he had lived a sovereign just after rising from a splendid banquet given to some distinguished foreigners in the gilded hall of his palace he was taken alarmingly ill and in two hours expired none doubted that his death was caused by poison administered by his own hand his son Theodore, a youth of sixteen whom he had named as his successor reigned just six weeks and then with his mother and sister xenia was cast into prison dmitri for so we must call him treated the royal captives with respect and kindness but six years after in the next reign Theodore was strangled on the twentieth of june sixteen hundred and five the impostor made his triumphal entry into moscow and was crowned in the palace of the czars the people were wild with joy this dmitri whoever he might be had found a way to all their hearts possessed of a commanding and agreeable person and a persuasive eloquence he was gracious and affable in manner and yet dignified as became a sovereign the brilliancy of his intellect seemed equalled only by the goodness of his heart just after his coronation the false dmitri in sight of an admiring multitude knelt in tears before the tomb of ivan the fourth and kissing the stone with well-feigned transport cried o father thy orphan reigns and this he owes to thy holy prayers his emotion was contagious all wept with him the opening of his reign was auspicious he surprised his ministers by his thorough acquaintance with the empire its wants and resources by his prodigious memory and his rare executive ability he set about reforming abuses and showed himself a man who would have neither favourite nor master on both public and private occasions he laid aside the usual solemn etiquette of the czars and was always easy of approach every sunday and wednesday he appeared at the threshold of his palace to listen to the grievances of the people and receive their petitions with his own hand the good of his subjects appeared to be the one great wish of his heart he was so humane and moderate in the use of victory that those who believed him an impostor began to wish he had really been born to the purple i have sworn not to shed christian blood he said and i will keep my oath there are two ways of governing an empire by tyranny and by generosity i choose the latter i will not be a tyrant dmitri had been a month in moscow and to the great surprise of all he had not yet seen his mother at last it became noised abroad that the royal nun was about to quit the convent where boris godinoff had compelled her to retire that she was advancing to moscow dmitri went out to meet her and in a sumptuous tent which had been erected at toyninsk he welcomed the widow of ivan the fourth they were for a little time alone probably arranging the part they were to act then they came out of the tent and embraced with every token of the liveliest affection dmitri had said to the czarina you can have in me a good son or a severe master and here in the presence of all the people she acknowledged the impostor as her son the young czar led his alleged mother to the carriage which was to convey her to moscow and walked beside it bareheaded the greater portion of the way he assigned her apartments in the kremlin until he could have a magnificent palace built for her and allowed her a household and a revenue befitting the mother of the czar 
he visited her every day and treated her with the most undoubted respect and affection even consulting her upon affairs of state and joining her name with his in the ukases he issued the most incredulous began to believe that this was really the czarina's son the new czar still devoted himself with patient assiduity to the affairs of his empire forming many schemes for reform at home and aggrandizement abroad but his popularity was on the wane his attachment to the poles the hereditary enemies of russia his preference for the latin church his open contempt for russian ignorance and for russian manners proved most disastrous to him and at length wrought his ruin during his stay in poland Otrepiev had fallen in love with marina the young and beautiful daughter of the palatine of sandomir and the father had given his consent to the marriage after the youthful wooer should become czar the czar summoned his betrothed to moscow she came attended by her parents and relatives and a numerous polish retinue on the eighteenth of may sixteen hundred and six the marriage was celebrated with great pomp the poles of the bride's retinue however bore themselves in the most arrogant and insulting manner towards the russians and the old undying animosity was kindled anew a sullen discontent reigned among the people the czar had already surrounded himself with polish counsellors and favourites he had derided the old russian traditions and customs and though nominally an adherent of the greek church was more than suspected of being a papist at heart but the greatest sin of all was this marriage with an unbaptized woman the greek church baptizes only by immersion a polish heretic discontent rose to fury when some evil-minded individuals circulated a report that the czar's bodyguard all polish soldiers in order to terrify the russians with the power of the new sovereign were about to begin an indiscriminate massacre among the populace the clergy went from house to house calling on all true sons of the church to rise and avenge the insults their faith had received from the heretic dmitri and his polish allies prince vasily shuiski was the leader of the rebellion he had before headed a conspiracy against the new czar and had been sentenced to siberia but dmitri with his usual good nature had pardoned his bitterest and most powerful enemy and even given him a place in the councils of the empire at daybreak on the twenty fourth of may the whole city was in open rebellion dmitri was warned of his danger but he would not listen i hold moscow and the empire in the hollow of my hand he said and laughed at the fears of the officers of the guard orthodox christians shouted shuiski death to the heretic the great bell was rung and the three thousand bells of moscow answered it the houses where the poles lodged had been marked with chalk and the russians bursting open the doors began to massacre the slumbering inmates the palace of the czar was stormed by an armed mob shouting death to the impostor dmitri seized a sword and defended himself with great bravery he is said to have slain several of the conspirators with his own hand the guards also defended their master to the last many losing their lives in a vain effort to save him finding resistance useless dmitri at length leaped from a back window of the palace and in the fall broke his leg fainting with pain he was seized by the infuriated mob his groans being answered only by jeers and insults he was not put to death at once as his assassins wished to prolong his sufferings his imperial robes were torn from him and he was invested with the caftan of a pastry cook look at the czar of all the russias shouted the mob he has now put on the dress which best befits him dog cried one of the nobles tell us who you are and whence you come dmitri replied firmly and distinctly every one of you knows that i am your czar the legitimate son of ivan the fourth monk otrepiev said prince shuiski confess yourself an impostor that god before whom you are shortly to appear may have mercy on your soul 
i am the czar dmitri replied Atropiev, still unwavering this is not the first time that rebellious subjects led astray by traitors have dared lay hands on the sacred person of their sovereign but such crimes never go unpunished and with this falsehood on his lips he died shot through the heart by a russian merchant named valuev who forcing his way through the mob cried why talk so long with this accursed heretic this is the way i'll shrive the polish piper Atropiev's death was the signal for a general massacre of the poles down with the pope death to the heretics was the cry for six hours the streets of moscow ran blood and more than a thousand poles were slain marina and her father concealed by some friendly russians escaped amid the general confusion but they were afterwards imprisoned and kept in close confinement for years after a life of many vicissitudes marina ended her days in prison the body of the impostor was burned and his ashes were scattered to the four winds but new dmitris were to rise from those ashes rumours that dmitri was not dead that he had escaped the tumult that the mutilated body exhibited as his to the populace was not that of the czar became rife in the land four swift horses were missing from the imperial stables and it was currently reported that three horsemen in russian costume but speaking polish had been ferried across the okra one of them had given the ferryman six ducats saying you have ferried the czar when he returns to moscow with a polish army he will not fail to requite the service encouraged by the success of the first impostor several other pretenders to the throne appeared each claiming to be the true dmitri all were in time silenced though not without much bloodshed end of section twelve this recording is in the public domain section thirteen of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section thirteen the kremlin of moscow by bayard taylor in the centre of moscow on the bank of the moskva river is a hill about one hundred feet in height on this hill an area of nearly one hundred acres is enclosed by a high wall of stone this is the kremlin or fort the ancient citadel of the town it has been built and rebuilt but the present walls are said to have been raised in fourteen ninety two within these walls are towers cathedrals monasteries convents palaces an immensely valuable library a treasury and one of the largest arsenals in the world the editor proceeding down the square to its southern extremity we halt at last before the most astonishing structure our eyes have ever beheld what is it a church a pavilion or an immense toy all the colours of the rainbow all the forms and combinations which straight and curved lines can produce are here compounded it seems to be the product of some architectural kaleidoscope in which the most incongruous things assume a certain order and system for surely such another bewildering pile does not exist it is not beautiful for beauty requires at least a suggestion of symmetry and here the idea of proportion or adaptation is wholly lost neither is the effect offensive because the maze of colours in which red green and gold predominate attracts and cajoles the eye the purposed incongruity of the building is seen in its minutest details and where there is an accidental resemblance in form it is balanced by a difference in colour this is the cathedral of st basil built during the reign of ivan the terrible who is said to have been so charmed with the work 
that he caused the eyes of the architect to be blinded to prevent him from ever building another such the same story however is told of various buildings clocks and pieces of mechanism in europe and is doubtless false examining the cathedral more closely we find it to be an agglomeration of towers no two of which are alike either in height shape or any other particular some are round some square some hexagonal some octagonal one ends in a pyramidal spire another in a cone and others in bulging domes of the most fantastic patterns twisted in spiral bands of yellow and green like an ancient muslim turban vertically ribbed with green and silver checkered with squares of blue and gold covered with knob scales like a pine cone or with overlapping leaves of crimson purple gold and green between the bases of these towers galleries are introduced which again differ in style and ornament as much as the towers themselves the interior walls are covered with a grotesque maze of painting consisting of flower-pots thistles roses vines birds beasts and scroll-work twined together in inextricable confusion as we often see in byzantine capitals and friezes the interior of the cathedral is no less curious than the outside every tower encloses a chapel so that twelve or fifteen saints here have their shrines under one roof yet enjoy the tapers the incense and the prayers of their worshippers in private no one interfering with the other the chapels owing to their narrow bases and great height resemble flues their sides are covered with sacred frescoes and all manner of ornamental painting on a golden ground and as you look up the diminishing shaft the colossal face of christ the virgin or the protecting saint stares down upon you from the hollow of the capping dome the central tower is one hundred and twenty feet high while the diameter of the chapel inside it cannot be more than thirty feet at the base i cannot better describe this singular structure than by calling it the apotheosis of chimneys let us now turn back a few steps and pass through the kremlin wall by the spasvarota or gate of the redeemer over the hollow arch hangs a picture of the saviour which looks with benignity upon the russians but breathes fire and thunder upon their foes the tartars so says tradition have been driven back again and again from this gate by miraculous resistance and though the french entered at last all their attempts to blow it up were in vain the other entrance the gate of st nicholas has also its picture but of lesser sanctity here the french succeeded in cracking the arch as far as the picture frame where the rent suddenly stopped no man dare pass through the gate of the redeemer without uncovering his head not even the emperor the common russians commence at twenty paces off and very few of them pass through the red square on their way to and from the moskva without turning towards the gate bowing and crossing themselves this is not the only shrine in moscow whose holiness irradiates a wide circle around it i have frequently seen men performing their devotions in the market-place or the middle of the street and by following the direction of their eyes have discovered at a considerable distance the object of reverence at last we tread the paved court of the kremlin before us rises the tower of ivan the lily whose massive sturdy walls seem to groan under their load of monster bells beyond it are the cathedral of st michael the church of the assumption and the ancient church of the czars all crowded with tiaras of gilded domes to the right rises another cluster of dark blue pear-shaped domes over the house of the holy synod while the new palace granovitaya palata with its heavy french front and wings above which the light aerial gallery golden railed burns like a fringe of fire fills up the background the tartar towers of the kremlin wall shoot up on our left from under the edge of the platform whereon we stand and away and beyond them glitters the southern part of the wonderful city a vast semicircle of red green and gold 
i know not when this picture is most beautiful when it blinds you in the glare of sunshine when the shadows of clouds soften its piercing colours and extinguish half its reflected fires when evening wraps it in a violet mist repainting it with sober tints or when it lies pale and grey yet sprinkled with points of silver light under the midnight moon at the foot of the tower stands on a granite pedestal the czar Kolokol, or emperor of bells whose renown is world-wide it was cast by order of the empress anne in seventeen thirty but was broken seven years afterward through the burning of the wooden tower in which it hung it is a little over twenty-one feet in height twenty-two feet in diameter at the bottom weighs one hundred and twenty tons and the estimated value of the gold silver and copper contained in it is one million five hundred thousand dollars in one of the lower stories of the tower hangs another bell cast more than a century before the czar kolokol and weighing sixty-four tons its iron tongue is swung from side to side by the united exertions of three men it is only rung thrice a year and when it speaks all other bells are silent to those who stand near the tower the vibration of the air is said to be like that which follows the simultaneous discharge of a hundred cannon in the other stories hang at least forty or fifty bells varying in weight from thirty-six tons to a thousand pounds some of them are one-third silver when they all sound at once as on easter morn the very tower must rock on its foundation in those parts of russia where the eastern church is predominant no other sect is allowed to possess bells in austria the same prohibition is extended to the protestant churches the sound of the bell is a part of the act of worship and therefore no heterodox tongue though of iron must be permitted to preach false doctrine to half the city the empress anne seems to have had a fondness for monster castings turning to the right into an adjoining courtyard we beheld a tremendous piece of artillery familiarly known as the pocket piece of this czarina the diameter of the bore is three feet but it is evident that the gun never could have been used it was no doubt made for show from the bronze of captured cannon in the same court are arranged the spoils of eighteen twelve consisting of nearly a thousand cannon french and german they are mostly small field pieces and hence make but little display in spite of their number the turkish and persian guns some of which are highly ornamented occupy the opposite side of the court and are much the finest of all the trophies here we will now enter the churches in the palace court they are but of modern dimensions and very plain outwardly except in their crowns of far shining golden domes undoubtedly they were once painted in the style of the cathedral of st basil but the rainbow frescoes are now covered with a uniform coat of whitewash one is therefore all the more dazzled by the pomp and glare of the interior the walls the five domes resting on four tall pillars at their intersections the pillars themselves everything but the floor is covered with a coating of flashing gold the iconostat or screen before the holy of holies is of gilded silver and rises to the roof the altars are of massive silver and the shrine pictures are set in a blaze of diamonds emeralds and rubies a multitude of saints are painted on the walls and seem to float in a golden sky and not saints alone but strange to say classic philosophers and historians thucydides and plutarch in company with saints anthony and jerome there are said to be twenty-three hundred figures in this church which is much more than the number of worshippers who can find place within it i have been there on sunday when it was thronged and really there was less diversity of visage costume and character among the pictures above than among the human beings below it was a wonderful crowd i could have picked out the representatives of fifty nations and the facial stamp of three centuries the singing was sublime the choir was unseen behind the silver screen and the sweetness and purity of the boy sopranos swelled and sank like a chorus of angels heard through the fitful gust of a storm devotional music nowhere received such glorious expression as in the russian churches the cathedral of the archangel michael but a few paces distant from that of the assumption resembles it in its internal structure 
it is more dimly lighted however the gold is not so glaring and in place of the army of saints there are large frescoes of heaven hell judgment etc on the floor arranged in rows are the sarcophagi of the early czars from ivan i to alexis father of peter the great they are covered with dusty mouldering palls of cloth or velvet each one inscribed with his name in the middle of the church in a splendid coffin is the body of a boy seven or eight years of age which is universally believed to be that of the young dmitri the last prince of the race of rurik who was put to death by boris gudinoff the lid of the coffin is open and on the inner side is a portrait of the boy in a frame of massive gold studded with jewels the body is wrapped in cloth of gold and a cushion covers the face the attendant priest was about to remove this cushion when our guide whispered to me you are expected to kiss the forehead and i turned away these relics are ranked among the holiest in moscow and are most devoutly worshipped although it is by no means certain that they belong to the true dmitri close at hand is the house of the holy synod and as we are accompanied by our obliging consul colonel claxton to whom all doors are open we are admitted into the sanctuary where are preserved the robes worn by russian patriarchs during the last six hundred years as well as the silver jars containing the sacred oil used for solemn sacraments throughout the whole empire the robes are of the heaviest silk and woven with gold and silver thread and so sewn with jewels that they would stand stiff upright with their own richness the patriarchs seem to have had an especial fondness for pearls of which in some instances the embroidered figures are entirely composed in strong contrast to these dazzling vestments are the coarse brown hat and mantle of the patriarch nikon the holy oil is preserved in thirty-three jars which as well as the larger vessels used in preparing it are of massive silver about two gallons a year are necessary to supply russia the council hall of the holy synod is in the same building it is evidently the ancient place of assembly a long low room with sacred frescoes on a golden ground and raised seats along the wall for the principal personages let us now turn from the sacred to the secular sites of the kremlin although some of the latter are not less sacred to russian eyes the palace doors open to the special permit presented by colonel claxton and we ascend the broad noble staircase the plain exterior of the building gives no hint of the splendors within i have seen all the palaces of europe with the exception of the escurial but i cannot recall one in which the highest possible magnificence is so subservient to good taste as here inlaid floors of such beautiful design and such precious wood that you tread upon them with regret capitals cornices and ceiling soffits of gold walls overlaid with fluted silk giant candelabra of silver and malachite and the soft gleam of many tinted marbles combine to make this a truly imperial residence the grand hall of st george all in white and gold is literally encrusted with ornamented carved work that of st alexander nevsky is sumptuous in blue and gold of st vladimir in crimson and gold while in that of st elizabeth the walls are not only overlaid with gold and the furniture of massive silver but in the centre of every door is a maltese cross formed of the largest diamonds the eye does not tire of this unwonted splendour nor does it seem difficult to dwell even in such dazzling halls in a lower story is the banqueting hall hung with crimson velvet studded with golden eagles here the emperor feasts with his nobles on the day of his coronation the only occasion on which it is used End of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain section fourteen of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone russia part three peter the great historical note under the house of romanov russia grew steadily in power and greatly extended her territory at the expense of poland and turkey in sixteen eighty nine peter the great 
one of the most remarkable rulers in history, came to the throne. His ambition was to raise Russia from her depths of ignorance and oriental conservatism to an equal position with the greatest powers of Europe. To do this, it was first of all necessary to find out how things were done in other countries, and to obtain first-hand knowledge. Peter, in 1697, appointed a council to administer the empire, and set out on a tour of Europe. He came back fired with enthusiasm for Western civilization, and proceeded to put his theories into practice. Nothing was too great for his attention, and nothing too small. He reorganized the army and church, reformed the calendar, built a new capital at St. Petersburg, encouraged commerce, instituted improved methods of education and taxation, besides promulgating a host of edicts regulating the most trivial matters of dress, manners, etc., in foreign affairs he was no less energetic the first need of russia was a seaport and soon after coming to the throne he wrested azov on the black sea from the turks most of all however he longed for a seaport on the baltic from which he was shut off by the territory of sweden in seventeen hundred he declared war against that country and after nine years of almost constant defeat at the hands of Charles the Twelfth, the Swedish king, had taught him and his soldiers the art of warfare, he lured that impetuous monarch into the depths of Russia, annihilated his army at Poltava, and gained his long-sought foothold on the Baltic. At the time of his death in 1724, Peter the Great had extended the Russian Empire from Finland to the Caspian Sea, and created a new power in European politics. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 15, A Morning with Peter the Great, Early in the 18th Century, by Dmitri Marichkowski. Peter had got up early. The very devils haven't had time to snore, grumbled the sleepy orderly who had to light the stoves. A gloomy November morning was looking in through the window. By the light of a tallow candle end, in a nightcap, dressing gown, and craftsman's leather apron, the Tsar was sitting at his lathe, turning a candelabrum of ivory for the church of St. Peter and St. Paul, in gratitude for the benefit he had derived from the martial water during his illness then he started carving out of birchwood a little bacchus with grapes for the lid of a goblet he worked with as much zeal as if his livelihood depended upon it at four thirty a m in came his private secretary makaroff the czar took his place at a walnut wood desk so high that the chin of a man of medium height was but level with it and began to dictate decrees to the different colleges or departments which were being established in russia on the advice of leibnitz following the example and precedent of other civilized empires as in a clock one wheel sets the other in motion said the philosopher to the czar so in the great administrative machine one college ought to work another and if everything is harmoniously organized in exact proportions then the hands of the state clock will invariably point to happy hours for your whole country peter loved mechanics and the thought of converting the government into a machine delighted him yet what seemed so simple in theory proved far otherwise in practice the russian people neither understood nor liked the idea of colleges and mockingly called them kaleki which means cripples 
the czar had invited learned foreigners versed in law they worked through the medium of interpreters this however did not answer young russian clerks were then dispatched to konensburg to learn the german language and thereby facilitate the working of the colleges and supervisors were sent with them to prevent them from idling but the supervisors idled with the supervised the czar published a decree all colleges are obliged to draw up regulations for their work on the swedish model if some of the points in the swedish regulation are inapplicable or are unsuited to the conditions of this empire the same should be altered at discretion but judgment was sadly lacking and the czar felt that the new institutions would prove as inefficient as the old ones it is all in vain he thought until the direct good the supreme patriotic interest of the empire is realized a thing that can't be expected for another hundred years at least the orderly announced a foreign office translator kozlovsky a young man came in haggard pale and consumptive looking peter rummaged among his papers and gave to him a manuscript corrected and marked with pencil notes on the margin it was a treatise on mechanics it is badly translated it must be done over again your majesty stuttered kozlovsky in fear and trembling the author himself has written the book in very involved language more mindful of the subtlety of his philosophical style than of the benefit people could derive from the book he is abbreviated and abstruse for my part with my dull brain i cannot possibly follow him the czar patiently instructed there is no need to translate literally but having ascertained the meaning clothe it in language which can best convey it employing only what is necessary for presenting the main ideas to try and retain the style is not necessary your matter should be useful and not written for effect without any superfluous words which only waste time and distract the reader's attention avoid the high-flown slavonic style and write the plain russian speech do not use high-sounding words but the language of the foreign office write as you speak simply do you understand me quite so your majesty answered the translator with the precision of a soldier yet he hung his head with as melancholy an air as if he remembered the fate of his predecessor boris wolkoff also a translator to the foreign office who in despair over a french book on gardening le jardin de cantigny and afraid of the czar's wrath opened his veins and perished well go god be with you put all your heart in the work and also tell avramoff that the type in the new books is fatter and not so clean as in the older ones the types of letters b and p must be altered they are too broad the binding also is defective especially as he binds the pages together too tightly the books won't close he should sew them at the hinges more loosely and give them more space at the back when kozlovsky left him peter remembered the dreams of leibniz about a general russian encyclopedia the quintessence of sciences such as was not yet in existence a petersburg academy the college of learned administrators with the czar at their head a future russia which having surpassed europe in knowledge would act as lighthouse of the world that bread will be long in baking thought peter with a bitter smile before we can begin to teach europe we must ourselves learn to speak russian write print bind and make paper he dictated an ukase in all towns and villages all bits of rags and linen should be carefully collected and sent to the chief office in petersburg where fourpence per pood footnote thirty six pounds in the footnote will be paid for them these rags were intended for the paper factories then followed the ukase about the melting of fat the right way of plaiting bast shoes and the dressing of hides for boot leather inasmuch as the hide commonly used for shoe leather is exceedingly unfit for wear being dressed with tar 
which does not prevent it from rotting nor from letting water in in damp weather it would be more expedient to dress the same with train oil he glanced at his slate which together with a piece of pencil hung at the head of his bed he used to note on it any thought which occurred to him during the night that night he had jotted down where should manure be deposited don't forget persia mats he made makaroff read out the ambassador volinsky's letter concerning persia the present monarch here is such a fool that it would be difficult to find his equal even among simple peasant folk much less among the crowned heads his power will not last long although our present war with the swedes may hinder us yet nevertheless seeing the feeble resources of this country as i do i deem it possible to annex a major part of persia simply with a small force there could not possibly be a more favourable time than the present in his answer to volinsky peter ordered him to send merchants down the river amudaria in order to discover a waterway to india and to draw a map describing it at the same time to prepare a letter to the grand mogul the dalai lama of tibet a road to india an alliance between europe and asia was an old dream of peter's some twenty years ago a russian church had been erected in peking in honour of saint sophia the wisdom of god le czar peut tenir la chaine à l'europe prophesied leibnitz the czar's conquests in persia will lay the foundation of an empire greater than that of the romans the foreign diplomats warned their sovereigns the czar like another alexander strives to conquer the world said the sultan peter reached down from a shelf and unfolded a map of the globe which he had once drawn himself while musing on russia's destiny with the words europe on the west asia towards the south and on the space between the headland to chukotsk and the neman and across from archangel down to astrakhan the word russia appeared in the same sized letters as europe and asia they are all mistaken in calling russia an empire it is half the world but the next moment with his usual pliable will-power he turned sharply from musings to business from the grandiose to the petty he began to dictate ukases as to a fit place for the deposit of manure on the substitution of hair sacks for sacks of matting in which to carry biscuits to the galleys and barrels or linen bags for grain and salt mats should on no account be used on the saving of lead bullets used at practice firing the preservation of forests the prohibition of hollowed-out trunks for coffins which were to be made of planks note well england to be written to for a model then he turned over the pages of his notebook to ascertain whether anything of importance had been forgotten the first page bore the inscription in gottes namen in the lord's name then followed various notes and memoranda sometimes two or three words indicated a long train of thought of a certain discovery which will help to find out various mysteries in nature clever experiments how to extinguish earth oil with vitriol how to boil hemp in saltpetre water by the secret of making german sausages draw up a concise catechism for the peasants and have it read in churches for their instruction exposed foundling infants are to be educated wailing to be organized the fall of the greek monarchy was caused by contempt of warfare order french gazettes to be sent engage foreign comedians at high pay russian proverbs a russian lexicon chemical secrets for testing ore if it be true that laws of nature are rational why then do animals devour one another and why do we cause them so much suffering present and past judgments against atheists compose a prayer for the soldiers great eternal holy god etc the journal of peter recalls the diary of leonardo da vinci at six in the morning he began to dress pulling on his stockings he noticed a hole he sat down got a needle and a ball of wool and began darning ruminating about a road to india in the footsteps of alexander of macedonia he darned his stockings then he had some anisette brandy with a cracknel lit his pipe went out of the palace and drove in a 
cabriolet with a lantern for it was yet dark to the admiralty the admiralty pinnacle glowed dimly through the fog reflecting the flames of fifteen dockyard furnaces out of the gloom there rose the black outline of a monstrous skeleton the hull of a new ship cables lay coiled like gigantic serpents pulleys squeaked hammers sounded iron rattled pitch was boiling in the red glare men flitted to and fro like shadows the dockyard resembled the forges of hell peter went hither thither inspecting everything he verified in the gun department the entry of the calibre of cast cannon-balls and shells which were piled in pyramids under shelter to prevent the rust eating them whether the flintlocks and barrels of the muskets had been filled with fat whether the ukase concerning cannon had been carried out it must be ascertained with the help of a mirror whether the inside of the barrel was quite smooth or whether the handles to the muzzle had formed flaws and bulgings should any such flaws have occurred their depth must be measured he could tell by the smell the different qualities of walrus fat tested by handling the weight of sailcloth and whether its lightness were due to the fine texture or to flimsiness he talked with the foreman as to equals the boards must be plain to fit tightly choose well-seasoned wood for should it be caulked before it is quite dry then it will not only shrink but also bulge out in the water and compress the caulk the oak should be young with a bluish and never a reddish hue made of such oak the vessel will be as hard as iron even a bullet could not pierce it farther than two inches in the hemp stores he took handfuls from the bales and holding the hemp between his knees carefully examined shook and tested it like an expert ship cables for mooring are of great consequence they ought to be made of the very best and strongest hemp when the cable is trustworthy the vessel is safe if faulty vessel and crew are doomed on all sides the czar was heard rating the agents and contractors i see that during my absence the work has gone sidelong like a crab at snail's speed i shall be obliged to bring you to order by demanding from you extra work and by a merciless infliction of corporal punishment just wait a bit i will give you a keepsake which you won't forget till next spring he cut short lengthy speeches one day when a distinguished foreigner elaborated some unessential detail he spat in his face reviled him obscenely and turned away to a clerk who cheated he remarked i will score on your back the figures you failed to put on paper to a petition for raising the stipend of the admiralty councillors he answered nonsense they are more anxious to fill their pockets than to render good service when he learned that several of the vessels belonging to the galley fleet had been supplied with rotten salt beef so that the soldiers during five weeks had to content themselves with stale smelts and water which caused a thousand men to fall ill and be unfit for work his anger passed on bounds he almost struck an old captain who had distinguished himself in the yacht engagement should you do such an idiotic thing again don't lament being dishonoured in your old age why should such important business a thousand times more valuable than your head be transacted with such carelessness probably you seldom read the military regulations the officers of the galleys in question will be hanged and you almost deserve as much for your gross neglect but he dropped his raised hand and mastered his wrath i should never have expected this from you he added in an undertone but such rebuke was in his tone that the guilty one would have preferred a blow now take care said peter that such cruelty shall not recur for in god's sight it is the greatest of sins i have recently heard that here in the petersburg dockyards last year the workingmen were utterly neglected especially the sick and that even dead bodies were allowed to remain lying about the streets which is revolting not only to christians but even to barbarians i cannot understand this lack of compassion they are not cattle but christian souls for which we shall have to answer before god end of section fifteen this recording is in the public domain section sixteen of russia austria-hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 16. How St. Petersburg was built. 1703. By John S. C. Abbott. The city of Petersburg was founded on the 22nd of May, 1703, on a desert and marshy spot of ground, in the 60th degree of latitude. The first building was a fort, which now stands in the center of the city. Though Peter was involved in all the hurry and confusion of war, he devoted himself with marvelous energy to the work of rearing an imperial city upon the bogs and swamps of the Neva. It required the merciless vigor of despotism to accomplish such an enterprise. Workmen were marched by thousands from Kazan, from Astrakhan, from the Ukraine, to assist in building the city. No difficulties, no obstacles were allowed to impede the work. The Tsar had a low hut, built of plank, just sufficient to shelter him from the weather, where he superintended the operations. This hut is still preserved as one of the curiosities of St. Petersburg. In less than a year, thirty thousand houses were reared, and these were all crowded by the many thousands Peter had ordered to the rising city from all parts of the empire. Death had made terrible ravages among them, but the remote provinces furnished an abundant supply to fill the places of the dead. Exposure, toil, and the insalubrity of the marshy ground consigned one hundred thousand to the grave during this first year. The morass had to be drained, and the ground raised by bringing earth from a distance. Wheelbarrows were not in use there, and the laborers conveyed the earth in baskets, bags, and even in the skirts of their clothes, scooping it up with their hands and with wooden paddles. The Tsar always manifested great respect for the outward observances of religion, and was constant in his attendance upon divine service. As we have mentioned, the first building the Tsar erected was a fort, the second was a church, the third a hotel. In the meantime, private individuals were busily employed by thousands in putting up shops and houses. The city of Amsterdam was essentially the model upon which St. Petersburg was built. The wharves, the canals, the bridges, and the rectangular streets lined with trees were arranged by architects brought from the Dutch metropolis. When Charles the Twelfth was informed of the rapid progress the Tsar was making in building a city on the banks of the Neva, he said, Let him amuse himself as he thinks fit in building his city. I shall soon find time to take it away from him, and to put his wooden houses in a blaze. Five months had not passed away from the commencement of operations upon these vast morasses at the mouth of the Neva, ere one day it was reported to the Tsar that a large ship under Dutch colors was in full sail entering the harbor. Peter was overjoyed at this realization of the dearest wish of his heart. With ardor he set off to meet the welcome stranger. He found that the ship had been sent by one of his old friends at Zandam. The cargo consisted of salt, wine, and provisions generally. The cargo was landed free from all duties, and was speedily sold to the great profit of the owners. To protect his capital, Peter immediately commenced his defenses at Kronstadt, about thirty miles down the bay. From that hour until this, Russia has been at work upon those fortifications. End of section 16. This recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 17. A Supposed Letter from an English Architect, 1715, by Maurice Baring. St. Petersburg, July, 1715. Although it is almost six weeks ago that I arrived at St. Petersburg, I have not until this moment had leisure to write you my impressions. 
And now, before I impart these to you, I must advert to a conversation which I had in Berlin with X, who, as you know, spent many years in Russia before the accession of the present Tsar, and who is an eminent Russian scholar. He assured me that in entering the Russian service at the present moment, I was doing a foolish and perilous thing. Russia, he said, was on the eve of a grave crisis which might very probably lead to the dismemberment of the nation. This was owing to the character of the present sovereign. The Tsar was inspired with inordinate ambition and blind obstinacy. He was, moreover, pursued by a demon of restlessness and a desire to change and reform everything that was old. This love of improvement was no doubt in itself a laudable ambition. Yet in view of the peculiar circumstances of the case, the ignorance of the great mass of Russians, the fundamental conservatism of the educated class, the deficiency and the inadequacy of all necessary material and instruments, the designs of the Tsar were akin to madness. He was attempting to make bricks without straw, and this could only have one result, the disruption of the Kingdom of Russia and the consequent rise of a large and powerful Poland. Poland would once again reduce Russia to servitude, and all civilized Europe would once more be revolted by the spectacle of civil and religious tyranny. Moreover, a powerful Poland was, as far as all European countries were concerned, far less to be desired than a powerful Russia. I will comment on these remarks in due time. At present, I must resume my narrative. On arriving at St. Petersburg, I went straight to the Summer Palace. I was told that the Tsar had gone to Kronstadt. He had left orders that I was to follow him thither as soon as I arrived, in a snow, footnote, a square-rigged vessel, end of footnote, which was waiting to convey the Dutch minister. It was a fine, sultry day when we started from St. Petersburg. I was much impressed by the sight of the city, which possesses already many thousands of houses and some fine churches and palaces. We started with a fair wind, but soon a storm arose, and our condition was the more perilous owing to the lack of experience of the captain and the mate. The Dutch minister was prostrated with seasickness, and upon his asking whether there was any chance of escape, and he seemed, such were his pains, to hope for a negative answer, the captain, who was facing the emergency by doing nothing at all, kept repeating in a soothing voice the word Nichevo, which means all is well. We shall arrive. All seemed to be very far from well. The mate, when consulted, folded his hands together and said Bogsniet, which means God knows. At last, after two days and three nights, which we spent without fire or provisions, we arrived at Kronstadt. We were forthwith bidden to the Tsar's pleasure house, Peterhof, on the coast of Ingria, whither a fair wind took us without further mishap. We were at once taken into the Tsar's presence. Anything less like the state and formal etiquette of Paris, Berlin, or Madrid, it would be difficult to imagine. To speak of the simplicity of the Tsar would be to understate my meaning. He seemed to be divested not only of the formality of sovereigns, but of the ordinary convention and reserve which unwittingly hang over every human being like a cloak. He greeted us as if he had known us all his life, and as if he were continuing a conversation but lately interrupted. His dress, which was dark, plain, and sober, his demeanor, his manner, were not only free from all trace of pomp, but would have struck one as simple and a common sailor and yet the overwhelming mastery and intelligence and power of the man were instantly apparent in the swiftness of his look and the stamp of his countenance. It was clear from the first moment that he was a man who went straight to the point, and had the knack of eliminating and casting aside the unessential and the superfluous with the quick decision with which a skillful gardener removes dead flowers from a tree with his garden knife. This was evident when speaking of the concern he had felt for us owing to the storm. The Dutch minister launched out into a diffuse narrative. The Tsar at once seized on the essential fact that the skipper was incapable and deftly changed the subject, keeping the garrulous minister charmed all the while. He welcomed me to Russia and said that he had been awaiting my arrival with impatience, as he had much work for me to do. But we will talk of that later, he said. At present, you must be hungry. We then followed him into another room where we were presented to the Tsarina. The Tsarina, who is of humble origin, has that peculiar grace, that intangible beauty and charm, which baffle verbal description and cause the painter to burn his canvas. She is the embodiment of spontaneous and untaught refinement, and her manner, like that art which consists in concealing all art, 
proceeds from the certain instinct which bids her make the right gestures and say the right word without either effort or forethought. We proceeded to dinner, which was served punctually at noon. The first course consisted of many cold meats, followed by a second hot course, and then by a third course of fruits. During dinner, we were all of us plied with toque wine. His Majesty himself partook of it freely, but forbore drinking too much. But we, by the end of the meal, could scarcely stand, and the Dutch minister was obliged, nevertheless, to empty a bowl holding a full quart of brandy which he received at the Tsarina's hand. The result was that he rolled under the table and was carried away by two men to a quiet place where he could sleep. The Tsar laughed and talked without ceasing, and asked many pertinent questions concerning England and Scotland, and was thoroughly posted in all the latest news. Talking of the Stuarts, he said they would never return, because apart from their talent for mismanagement, the English people did not feel strongly enough on the subject to make a rising in their favor however popular such a restoration would be if it could be effected by a deus ex machina. The Stuarts, he said, had always had the people on their side and the oligarchy behind them. He blamed the English people with regard to Ireland, saying the English had neither annihilated the Irish nor made them happy. He compared this to the action of the Poles in Russia in the past and pointed to the result. After dinner I retired to sleep, but at four o'clock we were awakened and brought back to the Tsar's presence. He gave each of us a hatchet and orders to follow him. He led us into a wood of young trees, where he marked a walk of a hundred yards to be cut to the seashore. He fell to work, and we, there were seven of us, followed. The Dutch minister found such a work in his half-dazed condition hard, and in three hours' time the path was cut. At supper, to which we were bidden, more toque was consumed, and the Tsar joked with the Dutch minister about the violent exercise he had caused him to take. We retired early but about eight the next morning I was bidden to court to partake of breakfast, which consisted, instead of coffee or tea, of large cups of brandy and pickled cucumbers. After dinner we were taken on board the Tsar's vessel. The Tsarina and her ladies sought the cabin, but the Tsar remained with us in the open air, laughing and joking. A strong wind was blowing, which in two hours became a gale, and the Tsar himself took the helm and showed the utmost skill in working a ship, as well as huge strength of body. After being tossed about for seven hours, we at last reached the port of Kronstadt, where the Tsar left us with the words, Good night, gentlemen. I fear I have carried the jest too far. The next day I returned to St. Petersburg and was lodged in the summer palace so as to be near the Tsar. The Tsar sent for me early in the morning and discoursed for two hours on various buildings he wished me to design. He went into every detail and soon showed me that he was as skilled an architect as he was a sailor. He also talked on various other subjects, including theology, mechanics, music, painting, the English Navy, and the German Army. England, he said, was his model as far as the Navy was concerned, Germany for the Army, and France for architecture. At the same time, he was not disposed slavishly to follow any particular models, and force on his people those details of any system which might not be in concord with the genius of the Russian character. It is undeniable that the Germans have far the best system of military discipline, he said, but it would be quite impossible to get Russian soldiers to act with the mathematical precision of the Prussians. I adopt the system as far as I can and adapt it to my material. That is why I get as many Scotch officers as I can and English architects, because it is difficult to make a Frenchman understand that Russia isn't France and that a Russian workman must work in his own way. I had not been in St. Petersburg long before I realized that X's forebodings are baseless. He is right in saying that the Tsar is ambitious. He is right in saying that he is actuated by restlessness, if by restlessness he means a ceaseless and indefatigable energy. He is right in saying that the Tsar's materials are bad and scanty, and that the Tsar thus had to make bricks without straw. He is right in saying that the Russians are fundamentally conservative and regard all reforms with distrust. But what he has not realized is this, that a man of genius can make bricks without straw. The Tsar has proved it. He has built St. Petersburg on a marsh. He has built a fleet and organized an army. He has made palaces, schools, academies, factories, and dockyards, and he has inspired others with his fever for work. Like all great workers, he never gives one an impression of hurry. He seems always to have leisure to see whom he wants, to have his say out, and to indulge in recreation when he feels so inclined. 
He rises every morning at four o'clock. From eleven to twelve he receives petitions from all ranks of his subjects, who have access to him during that hour. He dines at twelve o'clock. At one he sleeps for an hour. The afternoon and evening he spends in diversions, and at ten he goes to bed. He seems to delight in finding out a project which appears to be impossible, and in achieving it forthwith. No scheme is too large for him to devise, and no detail of it too small for him to attend to. He has the gift of discovering any useful scrap of knowledge either in men or books. At his balls and entertainments, which he now gives at the Summer Palace, or on extraordinary occasions at the Senate House, all degrees of persons are invited. Different tables are arranged in separate rooms for the clergy, the officers of the army, those of the navy, the merchants, the shipbuilders, the foreign skippers. After dinner, the czar goes from room to room and talks to everybody, especially the masters of foreign trading vessels. The Dutch and English skippers treat him with familiarity and call him by no other name than Skipper Peter, which delights him, and the whole time he marks down any points which interest him in a notebook. In conversing with these men, various in rank and condition, he never appears to be courting popularity, or to be ingeniously fencing with subjects of which he is ignorant. On the contrary, he makes it manifest that he is talking on a subject because it interests him, and because he is thoroughly acquainted with it. And any man who is an expert at any trade or profession cannot converse with him for a few moments without realizing that he knows what he is talking about, and that his knowledge is the result of practical experience. He has a hatred of baseless theory, a contempt for convention, and an insatiable passion for fact and reality. He has no respect for inherited rank or for the glory of lineage. Merit is to him the only rank. He will at a moment's notice, should he think it necessary, degrade a nobleman into a peasant or make a pastry cook into a minister. Indeed, he has done this in the case of Prince Menzikoff. It is useless to pretend that he is as popular with the Russian people as he is with foreigners. Many of the ignorant peasantry regard him as the Antichrist, and they worship his utterly worthless son, the Tsarevich, because they consider that he respects and embodies their ancient customs. In spite of this, there is no danger that what the Tsar has accomplished will be overturned in the immediate future. He has done something which cannot be undone, like putting salt into a pudding. Moreover, his genius and his versatility, his extraordinarily varied talents, are based on a soundness of judgment, a level-headedness and a sanity of instinct, which, while they lead him to do things which are seemingly impossible, justify him in that success is achieved and prevent him from undertaking what, owing either to the backwardness of the population or the temper of popular feeling, would in reality and of necessity end in failure. He knows exactly where to draw the line. In a speech he made to the Senate some time ago, he said that the ancient seat of all sciences was Greece, whence they were expelled and dispersed over Europe, and hindered from penetrating farther than into Poland. The transmigration of sciences was like the circulation of the blood, and he prognosticated that they would, some time or other, quit their abode in Western Europe and settle for some centuries in Russia, and afterwards perhaps return to their original home in Greece. In the meantime, he recommended to their practice the Latin saying, Ora et Libora, footnote, pray and work, end of footnote. Now what the Tsar has already achieved is that he has made such a circulation possible. He has broken down the barrier which was between Russia and Western Europe, and let into the great veins of his country a new drop of blood, which nothing can either expel or destroy. End of section 17. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 18 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey, read for LibriVox.org. Russia, Part 4, From Catherine the Great to the Invasion of Napoleon, Historical Note. The only son of Peter the Great had died in prison as the result of opposing his father's reforms, and for 37 years after Peter's death, the Russian crown was the football for contending factions. In 1762, Peter III was dethroned and murdered after a six-month reign, and his wife, the chief conspirator, ascended the throne as Catherine II, 
afterwards known as Catherine the Great. For thirty-four years, Russia was ruled by this remarkable woman, and prospered greatly. Literature and art, commerce and industry were encouraged, and the victories of her armies greatly extended the boundaries of the country. On the other hand, she was unscrupulous, revengeful, and bloodthirsty. It was during her reign, and owing in a large degree to her persistence, that Poland was first divided. In 1801, Catherine's son, Paul I, was assassinated, and Alexander I ascended the throne. He abolished punishment by torture, and sought in every way in his power to do what was for the good of his people. He was one of the chief figures in the era of Napoleon, and took a prominent part in the campaigns of 1805 and 1807 against the French. The defeat of the Russians at Friedland led to the famous meeting between Napoleon and Alexander on a raft in the Niemen River. The peace that was here concluded lasted until 1812, when Napoleon declared war and made his memorable expedition into the heart of Russia, reaching Moscow only to find it turned to ashes in his grasp. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 19. A Day with Catherine the Great, 1794, by Adrian Moisevich Grybovsky. The Empress's time and occupations were arranged in the following manner. She rose at seven, and was busy writing in her cabinet until nine. Her last work was on the Senate regulations. She once remarked in her conversation that she could not live a day without writing something. During that time, she drank one cup of coffee without cream. At nine o'clock she passed into the sleeping room, where almost in the entrance from the boudoir she seated herself in a chair near the wall. Before her stood a table that slanted towards her, and also to the opposite direction, where there also was a chair. She then generally wore a sleeping gown, or capote, of white gros de tours, and on her head a white crepe bonnet, which was poised a little towards the left. In spite of her sixty-five years, the empress's face was still fresh, her hands beautiful, her teeth were all well preserved, so that she spoke distinctly, without lisping, only a little masculinely. She read with eyeglasses and a magnifying glass. Having once been called in with my reports, I found her reading in this way. She smiled and said to me, You no doubt do not need this apparatus. How old are you? And when I said twenty-six, she added, But we have, in our long service to the empire, dulled our vision, and now we are of necessity compelled to use glasses. It appeared to me that we was used by her not as an expression of majesty, but in the ordinary sense. Upon another occasion, she handed me an autograph note, which contained some references for her Senate regulations for verification, and said, Laugh not at my Russian orthography. I will tell you why I have not succeeded in mastering it. When I came here, I applied myself diligently to the study of Russian. When my aunt, Elizabeth Petrovna, heard of this, she told my court mistress, that I ought not to be taught any more, that I was clever enough anyway. Thus, I could learn Russian only from books, without a teacher, and that is the cause of my insufficient knowledge of orthography. However, the Empress spoke quite correct Russian, and was fond of using simple native words, 
of which she knew a great number. I am very happy, she said to me, that you know the order of the chancery. You will be the first executor of my regulations before the Senate. But I caution you that the chancery of the Senate has overpowered the Senate, and that I wish to free it from the chancery. For any unjust decisions, my punishment for the Senate shall be, let them be ashamed. I remarked that not only the Senate, but also other bureaus that are guided by the general reglement, are hampered in the transaction of their business by great inconveniences and difficulties that demand correction. I should like very much to see those inconveniences and difficulties of which you speak to me in such strong terms. The general reglement is one of the best institutions of Peter the Great. Later on I presented to Her Highness my notes upon the general reglement which I read to her almost every afternoon of her residence in Tsarskoe Silo in 1796, and which were honored by her undivided August approval. These notes must be deposited with other affairs in the archives of the Foreign College. After occupying her seat, of which I spoke above, the Empress rang a bell, and the valet of the day, who constantly remained outside the door, entered and having received his order, called in the persons. At that time of the day, the chief master of police and the secretary of state waited daily in the boudoir. At eleven o'clock there arrived Count Bezborotko, for the other officers certain days in the week were set apart. For the witsa chancellor governor government procurator of the government of St. Petersburg, Saturday, for the procurator-general Monday and Thursday, Wednesday, for the superior procurator of the Synod and Master General of Requests. Thursday, for the Commander-in-Chief of St. Petersburg. But in important and urgent cases, all these officers could come any other time to report. The first one to be called in to the Empress was the Chief Master of Police, Brigadier Glazov. He made a verbal report on the safety of the capital and other occurrences, and presented a note, written at the office irregularly and badly on a sheet of paper, containing the names of arrivals and departures on the previous day of people of all conditions, who had taken the trouble to announce their names at the toll-house, for the sentinels stopped no one at the toll-house, nor inquired anything of them. In fact, there existed then no toll-gates, Anybody received a passport from the governor at any time he asked for it, and without any pay, and could leave the city whenever he wished. For this reason, the list of arrivals and departures never could be very long. After the chief master of police left, the secretaries of state, who had any business, had themselves announced by the valet, and were let in one by one. I was one of them. Upon entering the sleeping room, I observed the following ceremony. I made a low obeisance to the Empress, to which she responded with a nod of her head, and smilingly gave me her hand, which I took and kissed, and I felt the pressure of my own hand. Then she commanded me to take a seat. Having seated myself on the chair opposite, I placed my papers on the slanting table and began to read. I suppose the other reporting officers acted in the same way when they entered the room of the Empress, and that they met with the same reception. About eleven o'clock the other officers arrived with their reports, as mentioned above, and sometimes there came Field Marshal Count Suvoro Rumnikski, who then, after the conquest of Poland, resided at St. Petersburg. When he entered, he first prostrated himself three times before the image of the Holy Virgin of Kazan, which stood in the corner to the right of the door, and before which there burned an undying lamp. Then he turned to the Empress, prostrated himself once before her, though she tried to keep him from it, and taking him by the hand lifted him and said, Mercy, Alexander Vasilievich, are you not ashamed to act like that? But the hero worshipped her, and regarded it as his sacred duty, 
to express his devotion to her in that manner. The empress gave him her hand, which he kissed as a relic, and asked him to seat himself on the chair opposite her. Two minutes later she dismissed him. They used to tell that Count Besborotko and a few others prostrated themselves in the same way before her, but not before the Holy Virgin. At these audiences in the winter and Tauric palaces, the military officers wore uniforms, with their swords and shoes, but boots on holidays. Civil officers wore, during weekdays, simple French coats, but on holidays, gala dresses. But at Tsarskoe Silo, both the military and civilians wore dress coats on weekdays, and only on holidays the former put on uniforms, and the latter French coats with their swords. The empress was busy until noon, after which her old hairdresser, Kozlov, dressed her hair in her interior boudoir. She wore her hair low and very simple. It was done up in the old fashion, with small locks behind her ears. Then she went into the boudoir, where we all waited for her. Our society was then increased by four spinsters, who came to serve the empress at her toilet. One of them passed some ice to the empress, who rubbed her face with it, probably in order to show that she did not like any other washes. Another pinned a crepe ornament in her hair, and the two sisters Zverev handed her the pins. This toilet lasted not more than ten minutes, and during that time the empress conversed with some one of the persons present. Having bid the company good-bye, the empress returned with her maids into the sleeping room, where she dressed herself for dinner, with their aid, and with aid of Maria Savishna, while we all went home. On weekdays, the empress wore simple silk dresses, which were all made almost according to the same pattern, and which were known as Moldavian. The upper garment was usually of lilac or greyish color, and without her decorations. Her lower garment white. On holidays, she wore a brocade gown with three decorations, the crosses of St. Andrew, St. George, and St. Vladimir. And sometimes she put on all the sashes that belonged to these decorations, and a small crown. She wore not very high-heeled shoes. Her dinner was set for two o'clock. The ordinary dinner of the Empress did not last more than an hour. She was very abstemious in her food, she never breakfasted, and at dinner she tasted with moderation of not more than three or four courses. She drank only a glass of Rhine on Hungarian wine. She never ate supper. After dinner, all the guests immediately departed. The Empress was left alone. In summer she sometimes took a nap, but in winter never. She sometimes listened until the evening assembly to the foreign mail which arrived twice a week. Sometimes she read a book or made cameo imprints on paper. This she did during the reading of her mail by P.A. or Count Markov or Popov. But the latter was rarely invited to read, on account of his poor pronunciation of French, though he was nearly always present in the secretary's room. At six o'clock there assembled the aforementioned persons, and others of the Empress's acquaintance, whom she specially designated, in order to pass the evening hours. On Hermitage days, which were generally on Thursdays, there was a performance, to which many ladies and gentlemen were invited. After the performance, they all went home. On other days, the reception was in the Empress's apartments. She played rock-and-ball or whist, generally with P.A., E.B., Chertko, and Count Stroganov. There were also card tables for the other guests. At ten o'clock, the Empress retired to her inner apartments. At eleven, she was in bed, and in all the rooms reigned a deep silence. End of section 19Section 20 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The World's Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 20. Borodina, 1812. By Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. The Tsar Alexander was an exceedingly wise commander why should he fight a losing battle with napoleon when cold and hunger were the allies of russia so he reasoned and instead of risking the fate of his throne in one great engagement he slowly retreated occasionally making a show of battle and so tempting napoleon to follow on on into the very heart of an enemy's country and as the czar retreated he tore up roads burnt bridges and villages and cities, and removed every mouthful of food and fodder far beyond the reach of the invader. In spite of the advice of his marshals, Napoleon pushed on, sure of food and shelter within the walls of Moscow. The plans of the Tsar were well made. Cold and hunger would drive his enemies away, but at the expense of his capital he determined to make one grand effort to prevent the french from entering moscow at the little village of borodino he halted and there three hundred thousand men fought from early dawn until nightfall with fearful slaughter the russians were obliged to retire and napoleon pressed on pushkin was born in seventeen ninety nine and when he was only eighteen his work had already won him a place in russian literature he lived up to his early promise and became russia's greatest poet the editor all night beside our guns we lay nor tent nor fire was there our arms we wetted for the fray and prayed our whispered prayer the tempest raged till morning red i while a gun car propped my head spoke in my comrade's ear brother hearest thou how fierce and fast like freedom's war-song yon wild blast but wrapped in dreams of years long past my comrade did not hear the drums beat loud the mist cloud done gan eastward lighter grow and launched from unexpected gun came greeting from the foe then spake our chief before our line moscow's behind us children mine moscow we died a shield it was thus our brethren did the deed and one and all we vowed to bleed and well that promise did we heed on borodino's field i shudder at the thought ah me poltava rimnik there in hope of glory battled we but here in grim despair we closed our ranks without a sound guns thundered bullets whistled round i crossed myself when nigh my comrade fell all bleeding red i panted to avenge the dead and from my levelled gun the lead with deadly aim did fly march forward march no more i know of what befell that day six times we yielded to the foe six times the foe gave way and shadowy banners waved above and shadowy foes against us strove and fire through smoke did rain full on the guns the horsemen broke the wearied arm refused its stroke and rushing balls their fight did choke in hills of gory slain their dead and living mingled lay the cold night gathered round and all who yet survived the fray in deepest gloom were drowned the roaring cannon ceased to boom but guns that beat amid the gloom showed where the foe withdrew how welcome was the morning red now god be praised i only said for shivering on a couch of dead i lay the long night through 
there in death's sleep our bravest lay beneath the fatal shade how gallant and how staunch that day alas that could not aid but ever in the roll of fame above poltava's rimnik's name rings borodino's praise sooner the prophet's tongue shall lie sooner shall fade heaven's shining eye than from our northern memory shall time that field erase end of section twenty this recording is in the public domain Section 21 of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 6 Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 21 The Burning of Moscow. By Louis Adolf Thiers. On the morning of the 15th of September, Napoleon entered Moscow at the head of his invincible legions, but passed through a deserted city, and his soldiers were now for the first time on entering a capital, the sole witnesses of their own glory. Their feelings on the occasion were sad ones. As soon as Napoleon had reached the Kremlin, he hastened to ascend the lofty tower of the great Ivan, and to survey from its elevation the magnificent city he had conquered. The Moskva flowed at his feet, transversing the capital with numerous windings. Thousands of black-plumaged birds, crows and ravens, as numerous in those regions as are the pigeons in Venice around the palaces and churches, gave to the great city a singular aspect, which contrasted strongly with the splendor of its brilliant colors. A sullen silence, broken only by the tramp of the cavalry, had replaced that populous life which, during the very previous evening, had rendered the city one of the most animated in the world. The French army hoped to enjoy comfort in Moscow, to obtain, probably, peace by means of its possession, and at least good winter cantonments, in case the war should be prolonged. But on the afternoon they had entered, columns of flame arose from a vast building containing vast quantities of spirit and just as our soldiers had almost succeeded in mastering the fire in this spot, a violent conflagration suddenly burst forth in a collection of buildings called the Bazaar, situated to the northeast of the Kremlin, and containing the richest magazines, abounding in stores of the exquisite tissues of India and Persia, the rarities of Europe, colonial produce, and precious wines. The troops of the guard immediately hastened up and attempted to subdue the flames, but their energetic efforts were unfortunately unsuccessful, and the immense riches of the establishment fell a prey to the fire, with the exception of some portions which our men were able to snatch from the devouring element. This fresh accident was again attributed to natural causes, and considered as easily explicable in the tumult of an evacuation. During the night of the 15th of September, however, a sudden change came over the scene, for then, as though every species of misfortune were to fall at the same moment on the ancient Muscovite capital, the equinoctial gales suddenly arose with the extreme violence usual to the season, and in countries where widespread plains offer no resistance to the storm. This wind, blowing first from the east, carried the fire to the west, into the streets comprised between the Ewer and Smolensk routes, which were the most beautiful and the richest in all Moscow. Within some hours, the fire, spreading with fearful rapidity and throwing out long arrows of flame, spread to the other westward quarters, and soon rockets were observed in the air, and wretches were seized in the act of spreading the conflagration. Interrogated under threat of instant death, they revealed the frightful secret. The order given by Count Rostopchin for the burning of the city of Moscow, as though it had been a simple village on the Moscow route. This information filled the whole army with consternation. Napoleon ordered that military commissions should be formed in each quarter of the city for the purpose of judging, shooting, and hanging incendiaries taken in the act, and that all the available troops should be employed in extinguishing the flames. Immediate recourse was had to the pumps, but it was found they had been removed, and this latter circumstance would have proved, if indeed any doubt on the matter had remained, the terrible determination with which Moscow had been given to the flames. In the meantime, the wind, increasing in violence every moment, rendered the efforts of the whole army ineffectual, 
and suddenly changing with the abruptness due to equinoctial gales from the east to the northwest it carried the torrent of flame into quarters which the hands of the incendiaries had not yet been able to fire after having blown during some hours from the northwest the wind once more changed its direction and blew from the southwest as though it had a cruel pleasure in spreading ruin and death over the unhappy city or rather over our army by this change of the wind to the southwest the kremlin was placed in extreme peril more than four hundred ammunition wagons were in the court of the kremlin and the arsenal contained some four hundred thousand pounds of powder there was imminent danger therefore that napoleon with his guard and the palace of the czars might be blown up into the air the officers who surrounded him and the artillerymen who knew that his death would be their own thronged about him with entreaties that he would retire from so dangerous a position the peril was most threatening and even the old artillerymen of the guard although accustomed to such cannonades as that of borodino almost lost their sang-froid general larabossiere at length approached napoleon and with the authority he had by virtue of his age and his devotion entreated that the troops might be permitted to save themselves without having their embarrassment increased by the excitement caused by the presence of their emperor several officers moreover who had been sent into the adjacent quarters to make inquiries reported that it was scarcely possible to traverse the burning streets and that to depart immediately was the only means of escaping from being buried under the ruins of the doomed city napoleon therefore followed by some of his lieutenants descended from the kremlin to the quay of the moskva where he found his horses ready for him and had much difficulty in threading the streets which towards the northwest in which direction he proceeded were already in flames the terrified army set out from moscow the divisions of prince eugene and marshal ney fell back upon the zwanigarad and st petersburg roads those of marshal davoust fell back upon the smolensk route and with the exception of the guard which was left around the kremlin to dispute its possession with the flames our troops drew back in horror from before the fire which after flaming up to heaven darted back towards them as though it wished to devour them the few inhabitants who had remained in moscow and had hitherto lain concealed in their dwellings now fled carrying away such of their possessions as they valued most highly uttering lamentable cries of distress and in many cases falling victims to the brigands which rostopchin had let loose and who now exulted in the midst of the conflagration as the genius of evil in the midst of chaos as a final misfortune the wind changed on the following day from southwest to direct west and then the torrents of flame were carried towards the eastern quarters of the city the streets mesnitskaya and basimanaya and the summer palace as the conflagration reached its terrible height frightful crashes were heard every moment roofs crushing inwards and stately facades crumbling headlong into the streets as their supports became consumed in the flames the sky was scarcely visible through the thick cloud of smoke which overshadowed it and the sun was only apparent as a blood-red globe for three successive days the sixteenth seventeenth and the eighteenth of september this terrific scene continued and in unabated intensity at length after having devoured four-fifths of the city the fire ceased gradually quenched by the rain which as is usually the case succeeded the violence of the equinoctial gales as the flames subsided only the spectre as it were of what had once been a magnificent city was visible and indeed the kremlin and about a fifth part of the city were alone saved their preservation being chiefly due to the exertions of the imperial guard end of section twenty one recording by colleen mcmahon section twenty two of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 22. The Crossing of the Beresina River, 1812, by John S. C. Abbott. The river Beresina flows rapidly along its channel, a few miles beyond Borisov. The retreating Russians had destroyed the bridge. Upon the opposite bank of the river they had planted very formidable batteries. Napoleon remained two days at Borisov refreshing his troops. 
on the 25th, a variety of movements were made to deceive the enemy as to the point at which he intended to cross the river. In the meantime, with secrecy, arrangements were made for constructing a bridge where a dense forest would conceal their operations from view. The Russians, in vast numbers, occupied the adjacent heights. The French troops were secreted all day in the woods, ready to commence the construction of the bridge the moment night should come. Hardly had the winter's sun gone down behind the frozen hills ere they sprang to their work. No fire could be allowed. They worked through the long and dark night, many of them often up to their necks in water, and struggling against the immense masses of ice which were floated down by the stream. The tires of the wheels were wrenched off for cramp irons, and cottages were torn down for timber. Napoleon superintended the work in person, toiling with the rest. He uttered not a word which could indicate any want of confidence in this desperate adventure. He was surrounded by three armies, constituting a mass of 150,000 men. In this situation, says the Russian historian Butorlin, the most perilous in which he had ever found himself, the great captain was in no way inferior to himself. Without allowing himself to be dismayed by the imminence of his danger, he dared to measure it with the eyes of genius, and still found resources when a general less skillful and less determined would not even have suspected its possibility. The French generals deemed the passage of the river utterly impracticable. Rapp, Mortier, and Ney declared that if escape were now effected, they should forever after believe in the emperor's protecting star. Even Morat, constitutionally bold and reckless as he was, declared that it was time to relinquish all thoughts of rescuing any but the emperor, on whose faith the salvation of France depended. The soldiers in the ranks expressed similar fears and desires. Some Polish officers volunteered to extricate Napoleon by guiding him through obscure paths in the forest to the frontiers of Prussia. Poniatowski, who commanded the Polish division, offered to pledge his life for the success of the enterprise, but Napoleon promptly rejected the suggestion as implying a cowardly and dishonorable flight. He would not forsake the army in this hour of its greatest peril. Napoleon, says Sigur, at once rejected this project as infamous, as being a cowardly flight. He was indignant that anyone should dare to think for a moment that he would abandon his army so long as it was in danger. He was, however, not at all displeased with Marat, either because that prince, in making the proposition, had afforded him an opportunity of showing his firmness, or, what is more probable, because he saw in it nothing but a mark of devotion, and because in the eyes of a sovereign the first quality is attachment to his person. At last the day faintly dawned in the east. The Russian watchfires began to pale. Napoleon, by the movements of the preceding day, had effectually deceived his foes. The bewildered Russian admiral consequently commenced withdrawing his forces from Studzianka, just as Napoleon commenced concentrating his army there. The French generals, who were anxiously, with their glasses, peering through the dusk of the morning to the opposite heights, could hardly believe their eyes when they saw the Russians rapidly retreating. The Russians had received orders to hasten to a point some 18 miles down the river, where the admiral was convinced, by the false demonstrations of Napoleon, that the French intended to attempt the passage. Oudinot and Rapp hastened to the emperor with the joyful tidings. Napoleon exclaimed, Then I have outwitted the admiral. A squadron of horsemen swam on their skeleton steeds through the icy waves and took possession of the opposite bank. The bridge was soon finished and two light rafts were constructed. The passage of the troops was now urged with the utmost rapidity. In the course of a few hours, the engineers succeeded in constructing another bridge for the transportation of the baggage and the cannon. During the whole of that bleak winter's day and of the succeeding night, the French army, with its encumbering multitude of stragglers, were crowding across the narrow defiles. In the meantime, the Russians began to return. They planted their batteries upon the adjacent heights and swept the bridge with a storm of cannonballs. Early in the morning of the 27th, the foe had accumulated in such numbers as to be prepared to make a simultaneous attack upon the French on both sides of the river. Napoleon had crossed with the advanced guard. On attaining the right bank of the river, he exclaimed, My star still reigns. An awful conflict now ensued. The Russians were impelled by the confidence of success. The French were nerved by the energies of despair. In the midst of this demoniac scene of horror, mutilation, and blood, a fearful tempest arose, howling through the dark forests and sweeping with hurricane fury over the embattling hosts. 
one of the frail bridges broke beneath the weight of artillery baggage and troops with which it was burdened a vast and frenzied crowd were struggling at the heads of the bridges cannonballs ploughed through the living tortured mass they trampled upon each other multitudes were crowded into the stream and with shrieks which pierced through the thunders of the battle sank beneath the floating ice the genius of napoleon was never more conspicuous than on this occasion it is the testimony alike of friend and foe that no other man could have accomplished what he accomplished in the awful passage of the Beresina. Undismayed by the terrific scene and by the magnitude of his peril, he calmly studied all his chances, and with his feeble band completely thwarted and overthrew his multitudinous foes. It is difficult to ascertain the precise numbers in this engagement. According to Sigur, who is perhaps the best authority to whom we can refer, Napoleon had but 27,000 fighting men, and these were exhausted, half-famished, and miserably clothed and armed. There were also 40,000 stragglers and wounded embarrassing his movements and claiming his care. 60,000 Russians, well-fed and perfectly armed, surrounded him. General Wittgenstein, with 40,000 effective men, marched upon the portion of the army which had not yet crossed the stream. Marshal Victor, with but 6,000 men, baffled all his efforts, and for hours held this vast force at bay. Admiral Chichagov, with 20,000 men, attacked the columns which had crossed. Ney, with 8,000 troops, plunged into the dense mass of foes, drove them before him, and took 6,000 prisoners. Through all these awful hours the engineers worked in preserving and repairing the bridges, with coolness which no perils could disturb. The darkness of the night put no end to the conflict. The Russians trained their guns to bear upon the confused mass of men, horses, and wagons crowding and overwhelming the bridges. In the midst of all the horrors of the scene, a little boat, carrying a mother and her two children, was overturned by the floating ice. A soldier plunged from the bridge into the river, and by great exertions saved the youngest of the two children. The poor little thing, in tones of despair, kept crying for its mother. The tender-hearted soldier was heard endeavoring to soothe it, saying, Do not cry, I will not abandon you. You shall want for nothing. I will be your father. Women were in the midst of the stream, struggling against the floating ice, with their children in their arms, and when the mother was completely submerged in the cold flood, her stiffened arms were seen still holding her child above the waves. Across this bridge, the soldiers bore tenderly the orphan child which Marshal Ney had saved at Smolensk. Many persons were crushed and ground to pieces by the rush of heavy carriages. Bands of soldiers cleared their way across the bridge, through the encumbering crowd with their bayonets and their swords. The wounded and the dead were trampled miserably under their feet. Night came, cold, dark, and dreary, and did but increase these awful calamities. Everything was covered with snow. The black mass of men, horses, and carriages traversing this white surface enabled the Russian artillerymen from the heights which they occupied unerringly to direct their fire. The howling of the tempest, the gloom of midnight, the incessant flash and roar of artillery, the sweep of cannonballs through the dense mass, and the frightful explosion of shells, the whistling of bullets, the vociferations and shouts of the soldiers, the shrieks of the wounded and despairing, and the wild hurrahs of the Cossacks, presented one of the most appalling scenes which demoniac war has ever exhibited. The record alone one would think enough to appall the most selfish and merciless lover of military glory. At last, Victor, having protected the passage of all the regular troops, led his valiant corps across and set fire to the bridges. The number lost on this occasion has never been ascertained. When the ice melted in the spring, 12,000 dead bodies were dragged from the river. End of section 22. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Passage of the Beresina by J. H. von Papendrecht. Painting, page 130. The condition of Napoleon's army in the retreat from Moscow has been thus described by Heedley. The soldiers, exhausted and despairing, threw their muskets from them into the snowdrifts, and lay down by thousands to die. Cold, benumbed, and famine-struck, 
this ghost of an army struggled on through the deep snow with nothing but the tall pines swaying and roaring mournfully in the blast for landmarks to the glazing eye while an enraged and well-disciplined army was pressing in the rear clouds of ravens whose dusky forms glanced like spirits through the snow-filled air croaked over the fallen columns while troops of dogs that had followed the army from moscow fell on the prostrate forms before life was wholly extinct the storm howled by as the soldiers sunk at night in the snow to rest many to rise no more while the morning sun if it shone at all looked coldly and dimly down through the flying clouds of a northern sky there were long intervals when not a drum or trumpet note broke the muffled tread of the staggering legions such was the condition of the french army when it approached the banks of the beresina river at the end of november eighteen twelve the russians had destroyed the bridges and new ones had to be built the feeble lines began to cross many of them unarmed many sick or wounded then came a fierce bombardment by the russian artillery panic followed and it is estimated that more than ten thousand french were lost and about 15,000 taken prisoners. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by phone. Russia, Part 5. Poland, Historical Note. The history of Poland has never been a happy one. In the 13th century, the country had been so overpowered by the Mongols that it almost ceased to exist. Moreover, it was divided and subdivided into little independent states, and among these there were frequent disagreements which prevented anything like unity. In the early part of the 16th century, Poland, under the rule of Sigismund the Great, was at her best, and the kingdom stretched from the Baltic Sea to the Dniester River. Its western boundary was about ninety miles east of Berlin, and its eastern a hundred and fifty miles west of Moscow. Toward the end of this century the monarchy was made elective, and an exceedingly impractical constitution was formed. Wars with other nations, and struggles between the crown and the Polish nobles followed. Toward the end of the 17th century, a war with Turkey took place, and in spite of the valour of the brilliant leader Sobieski, Poland had to yield to humiliating terms of peace. In the 18th century, Russia began to interfere in Polish affairs. War soon came about. The result was the first partition, in 1772, by which Russia, Prussia, and Austria gained wide areas of land. Poland awoke to her danger, but even the victories of Kosciusko and his brave troops could not prevail against the power and the bribes of the Russians. In 1793, a second partition was made. Two years later, the unhappy country ceased to be a state, for at the third partition all that was left fell into the hands of Russia, Prussia, and Austria. Napoleon promised the restoration of the kingdom, but accomplished little. Out of the Duchy of Warsaw, which he founded, a new kingdom of Poland was created by the Congress of Vienna in 1815. This was under Russian rule, and struggles for freedom made up the history of the country until 1864, when it was subdued by the vastly superior power of Russia. Four years later, it ceased to have a separate existence and was incorporated with Russia. End of section 24. This recording is in the public domain. Section 25 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
the world story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section twenty five the surrender of kamenets footnote from pan michael copyright u s a eighteen ninety three by jeremiah curtin end of footnote sixteen seventy two by henrik sankovitz in sixteen seventy two a defensive war against the turks was going on the renowned general john sobieski won numerous brilliant victories but was forced to surrender the important town of kamenetz in podolia two years later sobieski was appointed king under the title of john the third the editor in the castle they expected some great effort on the part of the turks in fact about sunrise there was heard such a loud and mighty hammering along the left side of the castle as never before evidently the turks were hurrying with a new mine the largest of all strong detachments of troops were guarding that work from a distance swarms began to move in the trenches from the multitude of colored banners with which the field on the side of delujek had bloomed as with flowers it was known that the vizier was coming to direct the storm in person new cannon were brought to the entrenchments by janizaries countless throngs of whom covered the new castle taking refuge in its fosses and ruins so as to be in readiness for a hand-to-hand -hand struggle as has been said the castle was the first to begin the converse with cannon and so effectually that a momentary panic rose in the trenches but the bimbashes rallied the janizaries in the twinkle of an eye at the same time all the turkish cannon raised their voices bombs balls and grape-shot were flying at the heads of the besieged flew rubbish bricks plaster smoke was mingled with dust the heat of fire with the heat of the sun breath was failing in men's breasts sight left their eyes the roar of guns the bursting of bombs the biting of cannon-balls on the rocks the uproar of the turks the cries of the defenders formed one terrible concert which was accompanied by the echoes of the cliffs the castle was covered with missiles the town the gates all the bastions were covered but the castle defended itself with rage it answered thunders with thunders shook flashed smoked roared vomited fire death and destruction as if jove's anger had borne it away as if it had forgotten itself amid flames as if it wished to drown the turkish thunders and sink in the earth or else triumph in the castle amid flying balls fire dust and smoke the little knight rushed from cannon to cannon from one wall to another from corner to corner he was like a destroying flame he seemed to double and treble himself he was everywhere he encouraged he shouted when a gunner fell he took his place and rousing confidence in men ran again to some other spot his fire was communicated to the soldiers they believed that this was the last storm after which would come peace and glory faith in victory filled their breasts their hearts grew firm and resolute the madness of battle seized their minds shouts and challenges issued every moment from their throats such rage seized some that they went over the wall to close outside with the janizaries hand to hand the janizaries under cover of smoke went twice to the breach in dense masses and twice they fell back in disorder after they had covered the ground with their bodies about midday the volunteer and irregular janizaries were sent to aid them but the less trained crowds though pushed from behind with darts only howled with dreadful voices and did not wish to go against the castle there came a con came that did no good every moment threatened disorder bordering on panic at last the men were withdrawn and the guns alone worked unceasingly as before hurling thunder after thunder lightning after lightning whole hours were spent in this manner the sun had passed the zenith and rayless red and smoky as if veiled by haze looked at that struggle 
about three o'clock in the afternoon the roar of guns gained such force that in the castle the loudest words shouted in the ear were not audible the air in the castle became as hot as in a stove the water which they poured on the cannon turned into steam mixing with the smoke and hiding the light but the guns thundered on just after three o'clock the largest turkish culverines were broken some our fathers later the mortar standing near them burst struck by a long shot gunners perished like flies every moment it became more evident that that irrepressible castle was gaining in the struggle that it would roar down the turkish thunder and utter the last word of victory the turkish fire began to weaken gradually the end will come shouted volodyovsky with all his might in ketling's ear he wished his friend to hear those words amid the roar so i think answered ketling to last till to-morrow or longer perhaps longer victory is with us to-day and through us we must think of that new mine the turkish fire was weakening still more keep up the cannonade cried volodyovsky and he sprang among the gunners fire men cried he till the last turkish gun is silent to the glory of god and the most holy lady to the glory of the commonwealth the soldiers seeing that the storm was nearing its end gave forth a loud shout and with the greater enthusiasm fired at the turkish trenches we'll play an evening kind yet for you dog brothers cried many voices suddenly something wonderful took place all the turkish guns ceased at once as if some one had cut them off with a knife at the same time the musketry fire of the janizaries ceased in the new castle the old castle thundered for a time yet but at last the officers began to look at one another and inquire what is this what has happened ketling alarmed somewhat ceased firing also maybe there is a mine under us which will be exploded right away said one of the officers volodyovsky pierced the man with a threatening glance and said the mine is not ready and even if it were only the left side of the castle could be blown up by it and we will defend ourselves in the ruins while there is breath in our nostrils do you understand silence followed unbroken by a shot from the trenches or the town after thunders from which the walls and the earth had been quivering there was something solemn in that silence but something ominous also the eyes of each were intent on the trenches but through the clouds of smoke nothing was visible suddenly the measured blows of hammers were heard on the left side i told you that they are only making the mine said pan michael sergeant take twenty men and examine for me the new castle commanded he turning to lusnia lusnia obeyed quickly took twenty men and vanished in a moment beyond the breach silence followed again broken only by groans here and there or the gasp of the dying and the pounding of hammers they waited rather long at last the sergeant returned pan commandant he said there is not a living soul in the new castle volodyovsky looked with amazement at ketling have they raised the siege already or what nothing can be seen through the smoke but the smoke blown by the wind became thin and at last its veil was broken above the town at the same moment a voice shrill and terrible began to shout from the bastion over the gates are white flags we are surrendering hearing this the soldiers and officers turned toward the town terrible amazement was reflected on their faces the words died on the lips of all and through the strips of smoke they were gazing toward the town but in the town on the russian and polish gates white flags were really waving farther on they saw one on the bastion of batori the face of the little knight became as white as those flags waving in the wind ketling do you see whispered he turning to his friend ketling's face was pale also i see replied he and they looked into each other's eyes for some time uttering with them everything which two soldiers like them without fear or reproach had to say soldiers who never in life had broken their word and who had sworn before the altar to die rather than surrender the castle and now after such a defence after a struggle which recalled the days of zabaraj after a storm which had been repulsed and after a victory they were commanded to break their oath to surrender the castle and live as not long before hostile balls were flying over the castle so now hostile thoughts were flying in a throng through their heads and sorrow simply measureless pressed their hearts sorrow for two loved ones sorrow for life and happiness hence they looked at each other as if demented 
as if dead and at times they turned glances full of despair toward the town as if wishing to be sure that their eyes were not deceiving them to be sure that the last hour had struck at that time horses hoofs sounded from the direction of the town and after a time Horain, the attendant of the starosta rushed up to them an order to the commandant cried he reining in his horse volodyovsky took the order read it in silence and after a time amid silence as of the grave said to the officers gracious gentlemen commissioners have crossed the river in a boat and have gone to deluja to sign conditions after a time they will come here before evening we must withdraw the troops from the castle and raise a white flag without delay no one answered a word nothing was heard but quick breathing at last kvasibotsky said we must raise the white flag i will muster the men here and there the words of command were heard the soldiers began to take their places in ranks and shoulder arms the clatter of muskets and the measured tread roused echoes in the silent castle ketling pushed up to pan michael is it time inquired he wait for the commissioners let us hear the conditions besides i will go down myself no i will go i know the place is better i know the position of everything the commissioners are returning the commissioners are returning the three unhappy envoys appeared in the castle after a certain time they were grushetsky judge of podolia the chamberlain ravuski and pan mistyshevsky banneret to chernigov they came gloomily with drooping heads on their shoulders were gleaming caftans of gold brocade which they had received as gifts from the vizier volodyovsky was waiting for them resting against a gun turned toward delujek the gun was hot yet and steaming all three greeted him in silence what are the conditions asked he the town will not be plundered life and property are assured to the inhabitants whoever does not choose to remain has the right to withdraw and betake himself to whatever place may please him and kamenets the commissioners dropped their heads goes to the sultan for ever the commissioners took their way not toward the bridge for throngs of people had blocked the road but toward the southern gate at the side when they had descended they sat in the boat which was to go to the polish gate in the low place lying along the river between the cliffs the janizaries began to appear greater and greater streams of people flowed from the town and occupied the place opposite the old bridge many wished to run to the castle but the outgoing regiments restrained them at command of the little knight when volodyovsky had mustered the troops he called pan mashalsky and said to him old friend do me one more service go this moment to my wife and tell her from me here the voice stuck in the throat of the little knight for a while and say to her from me he halted again and then added quickly this life is nothing the bowman departed after him the troops went out gradually pan michael mounted his horse and watched over the march the castle was evacuated slowly because of the rubbish and fragments which blocked the way ketling approached the little knight i will go down said he setting his teeth go but delay till the troops have marched out go here they seized each other in an embrace which lasted some time the eyes of both were gleaming with an uncommon radiance ketling rushed away at last toward the vaults pan michael took the helmet from his head he looked a while yet on the ruin on that field of his glory on the rubbish the corpses the fragments of walls on the breastwork on the guns and raising his eyes he began to pray his last words were grant her o lord to endure this patiently give her peace ah ketling hastened not waiting even till the troops had marched out for at that moment the bastions quivered an awful roar rent the air bastions towers walls horses guns living men corpses masses of earth all torn upward with a flame and mixed pounded together as it were into one dreadful cartridge flew toward the sky thus died volodyovsky the hector of kamenets the first soldier of the commonwealth in the monastery of st stanislav stood a lofty catafalque in the centre of the church it was surrounded with gleaming tapers and on it lay pan volodyovsky in two coffins one of lead and one of wood the lids had been fastened and the funeral service was just ending it was the heartfelt wish of the widow that the body should rest in hereptyov but since all podolia was in the hands of the enemy it was decided to bury it temporarily in stanislav for to that place the exiles of kamenets had been sent under a turkish convoy and there delivered to the troops of the hetman all the bells in the monastery were ringing 
the church was filled with a throng of nobles and soldiers who wished to look for the last time at the coffin of the hector of kamenetz and the first cavalier of the commonwealth it was whispered that the hetman himself was to come to the funeral but as he had not appeared so far and as at any moment the tartars might come in a chambel it was determined not to defer the ceremony old soldiers friends or subordinates of the deceased stood in a circle around the catafalque among others were present pan michalski the bowman pan moda vidlo pan snitko pan hromyaka pan neyednashitnitz pan nevadesky and many others former officers of the stanitsa by a marvellous fortune no man was lacking of those who had sat on the evening benches around the hearth at hereptiaf all had brought their heads safely out of that war except the man who was their leader and model that good and just knight terrible to the enemy loving to his own that swordsman above swordsmen with the heart of a dove lay there high among the tapers and glory immeasurable but in the silence of death hearts hardened through war were crushed with sorrow at that sight yellow gleams from the tapers shone on the stern suffering faces of warriors and were reflected in glittering points in the tears dropping down from their eyelids within the circle of soldiers lay basia in the form of a cross on the floor and near her zagloba old broken decrepit and trembling she had followed on foot from kamenets the hearse bearing that most precious coffin and now the moment had come when it was necessary to give that coffin to the earth walking the whole way insensible as if not belonging to this world and now at the catafalque she repeated with unconscious lips this life is nothing she repeated it because that beloved one had commanded her for that was the last message which he had sent her but in that repetition and in those expressions were mere sounds without substance without truth without meaning and solace no this life is nothing meant merely regret darkness despair torpor merely misfortune incurable life beaten and broken an erroneous announcement that there was nothing above her neither mercy nor hope that there was merely a desert and it will be a desert which god alone can fill when he sends death they rang the bells at the great altar mass was at its end at last thundered the deep voice of the priest as if calling from the abyss requiescat in pace a feverish quiver shook bastia and in her unconscious head rose one thought alone now now they will take him from me but that was not yet the end of the ceremony the knights had prepared many speeches to be spoken at the lowering of the coffin meanwhile father kaminsky ascended the pulpit the same who had been in hereptia frequently and who in time of bastia's illness had prepared her for death people in the church began to spit and cough as is usual before preaching then they were quiet and all eyes were turned to the pulpit the rattling of a drum was heard on the pulpit the hearers were astonished father kaminsky beat the drum as if for alarm he stopped suddenly and a death-like silence followed then the drum was heard a second and a third time suddenly the priest threw the drumsticks to the floor of the church and called pan colonel volodyovsky a spasmodic scream from basia answered him it became simply terrible in the church pan zagloba rose and aided by mashalsky bore out the fainting woman meanwhile the priest continued in god's name pan volodyovsky they are beating the alarm there is war the enemy is in the land and do you not spring up seize your sabre mount your horse have you forgotten your former virtue do you leave us alone with sorrow with alarm the breasts of the knights rose and a universal weeping broke out in the church and broke out several times again when the priest lauded the virtue the love of country and the bravery of the dead man his own words carried the preacher away his face became pale his forehead was covered with sweat his voice trembled sorrow for the little knight carried him away sorrow for common yet sorrow for the commonwealth ruined by the hands of the followers of the crescent and finally he finished his eulogy with this prayer o lord they will turn churches into mosques and chant the koran in places where till this time the gospel has been chanted thou hast cast us down o lord thou hast turned thy face from us and given us into the power of the foul turk inscrutable are thy decrees but who o lord will resist the turk now what armies will war with him on the boundaries thou from whom nothing in the world is concealed thou knowest best that there is nothing superior to our cavalry what cavalry can move for thee o lord as ours can wilt thou set aside defenders behind whose shoulders all christendom might glorify thy name o kind father do not desert us show us thy mercy send us a defender send a crusher of the foul mohammedan 
let him come hither let him stand among us let him raise our fallen hearts send him o lord at that moment the people gave way at the door and into the church walked the hetman pan sobieski the eyes of all were turned to him a quiver shook the people and he went with clatter of spurs to catafalque lordly mighty with the face of a caesar an escort of iron cavalry followed him salvator cried the priest in prophetic ecstasy sobieski knelt at the catafalque and prayed for the soul of Volodyovsky. End of section twenty five this recording is in the public domain section twenty six of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america the world's story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section twenty six poland or russia seventeen ninety three by jane porter the little kingdom of poland was surrounded by three strong enemies russia prussia and austria all bent upon its overthrow and the absorption of its lands into their own territories this was finally accomplished in seventeen ninety one poland accepted a new constitution russia had agreed to uphold the former constitution and now invaded the country the leader of the opposition to russia was koskio a pole of noble birth when a young man he offered his services to the colonies in the american revolution and was made an aide de camp to washington the editor the little army of the palatine passed by the battlefield of kelm crossed the bug into the plains of volhynia and impatiently counted the leagues over those vast tracts until it reached the borders of kiovia when the column at the head of which thaddeus was stationed descended the heights of linini and the broad camp of his countrymen burst upon his sight his heart heaved with an emotion quite new to him he beheld with admiration the regular disposition of the entrenchments the long intersected tented streets and the warlike appearance of the soldiers whom he could descry even at that distance by the beams of a bright evening sun which shone upon their arms in half an hour his troops descended into the plain where meeting those of the palatine and general buzu the three columns again united and thaddeus joined his grandfather in the van my lord cried he as they met can i behold such a sight and despair of the freedom of poland Sobieski made no reply but giving him one of those expressive looks of approbation which immediately makes its way to the soul commanded the troops to advance with greater speed in a few minutes they reached the outworks of the camp and entered the lines the eager eyes of thaddeus wandered from object to object thrilling with that delight with which youth beholds wonders and anticipates more he stopped with the rest of the party before a tent which general buzu informed him belonged to the commander-in-chief they were met in the vestibule by a hussar officer of a most commanding appearance sobieski and he having accosted each other with mutual congratulations the palatine turned to thaddeus and presenting him to his friend said with a smile here my dear koskios this young man is my grandson he is called thaddeus sobieski and i trust that he will not disgrace either of our names koskioski embraced the young count and with a hearty pressure of his hand replied thaddeus if you resemble your grandfather you can never forget that the only king of poland who equaled our patriotic stanislaus was a sobieski and as he becomes his descendant you will not spare your best blood in the service of your country as kosciuszko finished speaking an aide-de-camp came forward to lead the party into the room of audience prince poniatowski welcomed the palatine and his suite with the most lively expressions of pleasure he gave thaddeus whose figure and manner instantly charmed him many flattering assurances of friendship and promised 
that he would appoint him to the first post of honor which should offer after detaining the palatine and his grandson half an hour his highness withdrew and they rejoined goskio who conducted them to the quarter where the masovian soldiers had already pitched their tents the officers who supped with sobieski left him at an early hour that he might retire to rest but thaddeus was neither able nor inclined to benefit by their consideration he lay down on his mattress shut his eyes and tried to sleep but the attempt was without success in vain he turned from side to side in vain he attempted to restrict his thoughts to one thing at once his imagination was so roused by anticipating the scenes in which he was to become an actor that he found it impossible even to lie still his spirits being quite awake he determined to rise and walk himself drowsy seeing his grandfather sound asleep he got up and dressed himself quietly then stealing gently from the marquis he gave the word in a low whisper to the guard at the door and proceeded down the lines the pitying moon seemed to stand in the heavens watching the awakening of those heroes who the next day might sleep to rise no more another time and in another mood such might have been his reflections but now he pursued his walk with different thoughts no meditations but those of pleasure possessed his breast he looked on the moon with transport he beheld the light of that beautiful planet trailing its long stream of glory across the entrenchments he perceived a solitary candle here and there glimmering through the curtained entrance of the tents and thought that their inmates were probably longing with the same anxiety as himself for the morning's dawn thaddeus walked slowly on sometimes pausing at the lonely footfall of the sentinel or answering with a start to the sudden challenge for the parole then lingering at the door of some of these canvassed dwellings he offered up a prayer for the brave inhabitant who like himself had quitted the endearments of home to expose his life on this spot a bulwark of liberty thaddeus knew not what it was to be a soldier by profession he had no idea of making war a trade by which a man may acquire subsistence and perhaps wealth he had but one motive for appearing in the field and one for leaving it to repel invasion and to establish peace the first energy of his mind was a desire to maintain the rights of his country it had been inculcated into him when an infant it had been the subject of his morning thoughts and nightly dreams it was now the passion which beat in every artery in his heart yet he knew no honour in slaughter his glory lay in defence and when that was accomplished his sword would return to its scabbard unstained by the blood of a vanquished or invaded people on these principles he was at this hour full of enthusiasm a glow of triumph flitted over his cheek for he had felt the indulgences of his mother's palace had left her maternal arms to take upon him the toils of war and risk an existence just blown into enjoyment a noble satisfaction rose in his mind and with all the animation which an inexperienced and raised fancy imparts to that age when boyhood breaks into man his soul grasped at every show of creation with the confidence of belief pressing the sabre which he held in his hand to his lips he half uttered never shall the sword leave my arm but at the command of mercy or when death deprives my nerves of their strength morning was tinging the hills which bound the eastern horizon of winnica before thaddeus found that his pelisse was wet with dew and that he ought to return to his tent hardly had he laid his head upon the pillow and lulled his senses into forgetfulness when he was disturbed by the drum beating to arms he opened his eyes and seeing the palatine out of bed he sprang from his own and eagerly inquired the cause of his alarm only follow me directly answered his grandfather and quitted the tent while thaddeus was putting on his clothes and buckling on his arms with a trembling eagerness which almost defeated his haste an aide-de-camp of the prince entered he brought information that an advanced guard of the russians had attacked a polish outpost under the command of colonel lonza and that his highness had ordered a detachment from the palatine's brigade to march to its relief before thaddeus could reply sobieski sent to apprise his grandson that the prince had appointed him to accompany the troops which were turning out to resist the enemy thaddeus heard this message with delight 
yet fearful in what manner the event might answer the expectations which this wished distinction declared he issued from his tent like a youthful mars or rather like the spartan isidus trembling at the dazzling effects of his temerity and hiding his valor and his blushes beneath the waving plumes of his helmet kosciusko who was to head the party observed this modesty with pleasure and shaking him warmly by the hand said go thaddeus take your station on the left flank i shall require your fresh spirits to lead the charge i intend to make and to ensure its success thaddeus bowed to these encouraging words and took his place according to order everything being ready the detachment quitted the camp and dashing through the dews of a sweet morning for it was yet may in a few hours arrived in view of the russian battalions lonza who from the only redoubt now in his possession caught a glimpse of this welcome reinforcement rallied his few remaining men and by the time that kosciusko came up contrived to join him in the van the fight recommenced thaddeus at the head of his hussars in full gallop bore down upon the enemy's right flank they received the charge with firmness but their young adversary perceiving that extraordinary means were necessary to make the desired effect calling on his men to follow him put spurs to his horse and rushed into the thickest of the battle his soldiers did not shrink they pressed on mowing down the foremost ranks while he by a lucky stroke of his sabre disabled the sword-arm of the russian standard-bearer and seized the colors his own troops seeing the standard in his hand with one accord in loud and repeated cries shouted victory part of the reserve of the enemy alarmed at this outcry gave ground and retreating with precipitation was soon followed by some of the rear ranks of the centre to which kosciusko had penetrated while its commander after a short but desperate resistance was slain the left flank next gave way and though holding a brave stand at intervals at length fairly turned about and fled across the country the conquerors elated with so sudden a success put their horses on full speed and without order or attention pursued the fugitives until they were lost amid the trees of a distant wood kosciusko called on his men to halt but he called in vain they continued their career animating each other and with redoubted shouts drowned the voice of thaddeus who was galloping forward repeating the command at the entrance of the wood they were stopped by a few russian stragglers who had formed themselves into a body these men withstood the first onset of the poles with considerable steadiness but after a short skirmish they fled or perhaps seemed to fly a second time and took refuge in the bushes where still regardless of orders their enemies followed kosciusko foreseeing the consequence of this rashness ordered thaddeus to dismount a part of his squadron and marched after these headstrong men into the forest he came up with them on the edge of a healthy tract of land just as they were closing in with a band of the enemy's arquebusiers who having kept up a quick running fire as they retreated had drawn their pursuers thus far into the thickets heedless of anything but giving their enemy a complete defeat the polanders went on never looking to the left nor to the right till at once they found themselves encompassed by two thousand muscovite horse several battalions of chasseurs and in front of fourteen pieces of cannon which this dreadful ambushcade opened upon them thaddeus threw himself into the midst of his countrymen and taking the place of their unfortunate conductor who had been killed in the first sweep of the artillery prepared the men for a desperate stand he gave his orders with intrepid coolness though under a shower of musketry and a cannonade which carried death in every round that they should draw off toward the flank of the battery he thought not of himself and in a few minutes the scattered soldiers were consolidated into a close body squared with pikemen who stood like a grove of pines in a day of tempest only moving their heads and arms many of the russian horse impaled themselves on the sides of this little phalanx which they vainly attempted to shake although the ordnance was rapidly weakening its strength file after file the men were swept down their bodies making a horrid rampart for their resolute brothers in arms who however rendered desperate at last threw away their most cumbrous accoutrements and crying to their leader freedom or death 
followed him sword in hand and bearing like a torrent upon the enemy's ranks cut their way through the forest the russians exasperated that their prey should not only escape but escape by such dauntless valor hung closely on their rear goading them with musketry while they like a wounded lion closely pressed by the hunter's retreats yet stands proudly at bay gradually retired toward the camp with a backward step their faces toward the foe meanwhile the palatines sobieski anxious for the fate of the day mounted the dyke and looked eagerly around for the arrival of some messenger from the little army as the wind blew strongly from the south a cloud of dust precluded his view but from the approach of firing and the clash of arms he was led to fear that his friends had been defeated and were retreating toward the camp he instantly quitted the lines to call out a reinforcement but before he could advance kosciuszko and his squadron on the full charge appeared in flank of the enemy who suddenly halted and wheeling round left the harassed polanders to enter the trenches unmolested End of section 26. This recording is in the public domain. Section 27 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The Division of Poland by Sir Edwin Arnold. The last seven lines of the poem refer to napoleon's wars and in particular to his campaign of the vistula against russia and prussia this ended in the terrible battle of friedland wherein his enemies lost twenty five thousand men the editor upon earth's lap there lay a pleasant land with mountain wood and river beautified and city dotted for the pleasant land the icy north and burning south did battle whose it should be and so it lay between them unclaimed unowned like the shining spoils under the cross lances of contending chiefs or like her april days whose morning sunshine and evening storm its never failing fields strong men and sturdy robed in vest of green and when the year was older took their payment in grain of gold its ever smiling homes true wives and comely daughters tenanted round the most holy altar of the hearth moving like holy ministers to them sorrow and pain envy and hate came never only the mild-eyed kind consoler death called them from happy life to happier where eyes are shining that can have no tears and brows are beaming that can never frown, and lips are breathing love that cannot lie. There went a whisper of their happiness over the blue pines of the eastern wood, up to the icy crags where Russia's eagle sat lean and famine withered. So he turned, with the hot hunger flashing in his eye, and listened, presently upon the rock he wet his beak and plumed his ragged feathers and rose with terrible and savage clang into the frightened air nor rose alone but at the sound the golden beak of prussia and the two-headed bird of austria came swooping up and o'er the happy land held bloody carnival for each one tore a bleeding fragment from his proper beak as of a kid caught straying and alone so there went up a cry from earth to heaven and pale-eyed nations asked is there a god but other blood than polish blood hath dyed green vistulato red and there hath come in these last days a dreader nemesis one who hath spoiled the spoiler and for blood asked blood for shattered throne hath shattered thrones so that the nations have forgot their fears and cry exulting Yea, there is a God. End of section 27. This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. 
read for LibriVox.org by phone. The Revolt in Warsaw, eighteen sixty one, by Joseph Nicholas Robert Fleury, French painter, seventeen ninety two to eighteen ninety. Painting, page one hundred and fifty eight. Many and fierce and fruitless have been the struggles of the Poles for liberty. The illustration represents a scene in Warsaw in the conflict of 1861. The central figures of the picture are those of two monks, the leaders of the people. They hold aloft a cross, the banner and the only weapon of the rebels. Behind them is a great crowd of folk of all ages and all ranks, some of the women with babies in their arms. At the extreme left stand the closely drawn lines of the Russian infantry. Their guns are levelled, and they are firing upon the defenceless, unresisting people. The smoke of their fire rises between them and the cross. Men lie dead upon the ground. One of the monks has been struck by a ball, and his hand is slipping from the staff. A little to the right of the centre, partly hidden by the smoke, stands the column of Sigismund the Great, former ruler of Poland. Behind it are the Cossacks, sitting on their horses, awaiting results. The Tsar had manifested some desire to make concessions to his Polish subjects, but it was now determined to take a course which should at a single blow reduce the revolutionists to helplessness. A conscription was suddenly attempted which should carry away from their land the younger men who were the moving spirits in the opposition to russia then the country indeed rose in defiance of even the russian power europe sympathized with the poles but the russians paid no attention to remonstrance and this rebellion like the preceding ones was soon crushed a terrible retribution of execution and exile to Siberia followed. Russian Poland was no longer allowed to have a separate government, but even to this day the Poles refuse to give up their nationality or their language. End of section 28. This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Russia, Part 6. Siberia. Historical Note. In the 16th century, a Russian family named Stroganov carried on a large trade in eastern Russia, and finally sent an expedition into Siberia. The leader was a daring outlaw called Yermak. This expedition was so successful that Yermak was pardoned. Russia had now, in 1582, a new empire of vast extent. Explorations continued, forts, trading posts, and villages were built, and Russian rule gradually extended to the Pacific. In 1858, by the Convention of Agun, the Amur was made the boundary between Siberia and China. For many years Siberia was used as a place of exile for Russian convicts, and it is estimated that 865,000 persons were transported to that country between 1801 and 1899. In 1900 it was decreed that henceforward Siberia should be used for political offenders only. The Trans-Siberian Railroad was begun in 1891 and completed in 1902, at a cost of $172,525,000. The main terminus of this railway is Vladivostok, which, since the loss of Port Arthur during the Russo-Japanese War, has been the chief Siberian port. The construction of the railway has had a marvelous effect upon the commercial development of the land. Business is rapidly increasing, and this vast territory, one and one-half times as large as the United States exclusive of Alaska, seems destined to be one of the greatest farming and mining countries of the 20th century. End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 30 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 30. The Conquest of Siberia, 1579-1584, through 1584, by Count Leo Tolstoy. At the time of the Tsar Ivan the Terrible, the Stroganovs were rich merchants and lived in Perm, on the river Kama. They had heard that on the river Kama, for a hundred and forty versts around, footnote, a verst is not quite two-thirds of a mile. End of footnote. There was rich land. The soil had not been ploughed for a century. The black forest for a century had not been felled. In the forest were many wild animals, and along the river were lakes full of fish, and no one lived in this land except wandering Tatars. So the Stroganovs wrote a letter to the Tsar. Grant us this land, and we ourselves will found cities, and we will gather men together and establish them, and we will not allow the Tatars to pass through it. The Tsar consented and granted them the land. The Stroganovs sent out agents to collect people, and there came to them many people who were out of work. The Stroganovs assigned lands and forest to all who came, gave cattle to each, and agreed not to tax them during their lives, and only required of them that if it were necessary they should go to fight the Tatars. Thus this land was settled with a Russian population. Twenty years passed, the Stroganov merchants grew richer and richer, and this territory of one hundred and forty versts became too small for them. They wanted still more land. Now there were lofty mountains a hundred versts distant, the Urals, and they heard that beyond these Urals was excellent land. The ruler of this land, which was boundless, was a petty Siberian prince named Kuchum. In former times Kuchum had given his allegiance to the Russian Tsar, but since then he had revolted, and he was threatening to destroy the Stroganov colonies. And again the Stroganovs wrote to the Tsar, You granted us land, and we have brought it under your sway. Now the thievish little Tsar Kuchum has revolted from you, and he wants to take this land away and destroy us. Bid us take the territory that lies beyond the Ural Mountains. We will conquer Kuchum and bring all his land under your sway. The Tsar consented and replied, if you have the power, get possession of Kuchum's land, but do not take many men away from Russia. As soon as the Stroganovs received this message from the Tsar, they sent their agents to collect still more people, and they gave them orders above all to get Cossacks from the Volga and the Don. Now at this time there were many Cossacks wandering along the Volga and the Don. They formed bands numbering two hundred, three hundred, or six hundred men, elected their atamans, or leaders, and sailed up and down in bateaux, seizing and plundering merchant boats, and wintering in a stronghold on the banks. The Stroganov's agent came to the Volga and began to make inquiries. Who are the most famous Cossacks here? And it was said in reply, there are many Cossacks, and they make life unendurable. There is Mishka, the Circassian, there is Serui Azman, but there is no one uglier than Yermak Timofeyitch, the Ataman. He has an army of a thousand men, and not only the people and the merchants fear him, but even the Tsar's army dares not engage with him. And the agents went to the Ataman Yermak, and tried to persuade him to take service with the Stroganovs. Yermak received the agents, 
listened to their words and agreed to come with his army about the time of the assumption at the time of the feast of the assumption six hundred cossacks with their ataman Yermak, the son of timofey came to the stroganovs at first stroganov sent them out against the neighboring tatars the cossacks defeated them then when there was nothing further to do the cossacks began to wander about and pillage stroganov summoned yermak and said i am not going to keep you any longer if you act so lawlessly and yermak replied i myself am sorry but it is not so easy to manage my men they are wild fellows give us something to do and stroganov said go beyond the urals and fight with kuchum and master his land even the tsar will reward you and he read to yermak the tsar's missive and yermak was delighted he called together his cossacks and said you scandalize me before the master here you are always up to some lawlessness and if you don't behave he will dismiss you and then where will you go on the volga the tsar has a great army they will take you prisoners and it will go hard with you on account of the deeds that you have done but if you find it dull here we must find some work for you to do and he showed them the tsar's missive permitting stroganov to conquer the land beyond the urals the cossacks talked it over and agreed to go yermak returned to stroganov and the two began to consult together how best to make the expedition they decided how many bateaux would be needed how much grain powder lead how many cattle firearms how many tatar prisoners for interpreters how many german gunsmiths stroganov said to himself though this is going to cost me dear still i must give him all he asks or otherwise they will settle down here and ruin me so stroganov agreed got everything together and fitted out yermak and his cossacks on the tenth of september yermak and his cossacks started to row up the river chusavaya in thirty-two bateaux each bateau carrying a score of men for four days they rowed upstream and entered the silver river this was as far as they could go by boat they made inquiries of the interpreters and learned that they would be obliged to go from that point over the mountains two hundred versts by land and then they would come to other rivers the cossacks disembarked here they built a city and unloaded all their belongings and they threw aside their bateau and constructed carts loaded them up and set out on their journey across the mountains the whole region was forest and no one lived there for ten days they went across the country and reached the Jarovnes river there again they halted and set to work to build bateau after they were built they started on their journey down the river they sailed down for five days and reached regions still more delightful fields forests lakes and there was abundance of fish and game and the game was not afraid of them they sailed down one day more and sailed into the tura river there on the tura river they began to fall in with inhabitants and saw tatar towns yermak sent some cossacks to investigate one town bidding them to find out what kind of a town it was and whether it had many defenders twenty men went on this expedition they threw all the tatars into a panic and captured the whole town and captured all their cattle some of the tatars they killed and some they took as prisoners yermak through an interpreter asked the tatars what people they were and under whose sway they lived the tatars replied that they belonged to the tsardom of siberia and their tsar was kuchum 
Yermak let the Tatars go, except three of the most intelligent, whom he retained to act as guides. They sailed farther. The farther they sailed, the bigger grew the river all the time, and the country grew bigger and better. And they kept encountering more and more people. But the inhabitants were not powerful, and the Cossacks captured all the towns along the river. In one town they made a great number of Tatar prisoners, and one person of authority, an old Tatar. They began to ask the Tatar who he was. And he said, I am Tauzik, and I am a servant of my Tsar Kuchum, and I am his head man in this city. Yermak proceeded to ask Tauzik about his Tsar. Was his city of Sibir far distant? Had Kuchum a large army? Had he great wealth? Tauzik told him all about it. Kuchum is the very first Tsar in all the world. His city of Sibir is the biggest city in the world. In this city, said he, there are as many men and cattle as there are stars in the sky. The Tsar Kuchum's army is beyond number. All the other Tsars banded together could not vanquish him. And Yermak said, We Russians have come here to vanquish your Tsar Kuchum and to take his city and to bring him under the sway of the Russian Tsar. And we have a great army. Those who have come with me are only the vanguard. But those who follow us in Bato are beyond number, and they all have guns, and our guns will shoot through a tree, and are not like your bows and arrows. Just look here! And Yermak shot at a tree and split it, and the Cossacks from all sides began to fire off their guns. Tauzik fell on his knees with fright, and Yermak said to him, now do you hasten to your Tsar Kuchum and tell him what you have seen. Let him submit to us. But if he does not submit, then we will bring him to destruction. And he let Tauzik go. The Cossacks sailed farther. They entered into the great river Tabol, and all the time they were drawing nearer and nearer to the city of Sibir. They came to the mouth of the little river Babasan, and, behold, on the bank stands a town, and around the town are many Tatars. An interpreter was sent to the Tatars to inquire who these men were. The interpreter came back with the answer, This army has been collected by Kuchum, and the general who commands the army is Kuchum's own son-in-law, Mametkul. He sent me and commanded me to say to you, Go back or else he will cut you in pieces. Yermak collected his Cossacks, went on shore and began to fire at the Tatars. As soon as the Tatars heard the noise of the firing, they fled. The Cossacks set out in pursuit of them and some they killed and some they captured. Mametkul himself barely escaped. The Cossacks sailed farther. They came out upon a broad, swift river, the Irtish. They sailed down this river a whole day, and they arrived at a handsome town, and there they stopped. The Cossacks marched against the town. As soon as they reached it, the Tatars began to shoot arrows at them, and they wounded three Cossacks. Yermak sent his interpreter to say to the Tatars, Give up your city, or else we will cut you in pieces. The interpreter returned, saying, Here lives Kuchum's servant, Atik Murza Kachara. He has a great army, and he declares that he will not surrender the town. Yermak gathered his Cossacks and said, Now, boys, if we do not take this town, the Tatars will hold us back and will not let us pass. And, therefore, the more speedily we inspire them with fear, the better it will be for us. All of you come on, fling yourselves on them all at once. And thus they did. There were many Tatars there, and brave fellows, 
As the Cossacks rushed forward, the Tatars began to shoot with their bows. They overwhelmed the Cossacks with their arrows. Some of them they killed and others they wounded. And the Cossacks were filled with fury and rushed against the Tatars, and all whom they fell upon they killed. In this town the Cossacks found many treasures, cattle, rugs, many furs, and much mead. After they had buried the dead and rested, they took their plunder and went on. They had not sailed very far when, behold, on the bank there stood something like a city, and there was an army that seemed to stretch as far as the eye could see, and the whole army was surrounded by a ditch, and the ditch was protected by a palisade. The Cossacks came to a pause. They began to feel dubious. Yermak called a council. Well, boys, what shall be done? The Cossacks were disheartened. Some said, We must sail by. Others said, We must go back. And they grew desperate and blamed Yermak, saying, Why did you bring us hither? Already they have killed so many of us and wounded still more, and here we shall all perish and they began to shed tears. And Yermak said to his sub-ataman Ivan Kaltso, Well, now, Vanya, what do you think about it? And Kaltso replied, What do I think about it? If we are not killed today, then we shall be tomorrow, and if not tomorrow, then we shall die ingloriously in our beds. My advice is leap on shore and make straight for the Tatars, and God will decide. And Yermak exclaimed, Hi, brave fellow Vanya, that is what we must do. Ech, you boys, you aren't Cossacks, but old women. Of course it was to catch sturgeon and to scare Tatar women, simply for that that I brought you hither. Don't you yourselves see? If we go back, we shall be killed. If we row by, we shall be killed. If we stay here, we shall be killed. Where, then, shall we betake ourselves? First labor, then rest. Boys, you are like a healthy mare that my father had. When she was going downhill, she would draw and on level ground she would draw, but when it came to going uphill, she would balk and back and try to find something easier. Then my father took a stake, beat her and beat her with the stake, and the mare jumped around and kicked and tipped over the cart. Then father took her out of the thills and put her through the mill. Now, if she had pulled, she would not have got the thrashing. So it is with you, boys. There is only one thing left for us, to go straight for the Tatars. The Cossacks laughed and said, It is plain that you are wiser than we are, Timofeitch. We fools have no right to give advice. Take us wherever you wish. We can't die twice, but we must die once. And Yermak said, Now listen, boys, this is the way that we must do it. They haven't yet seen the whole of us. We will divide ourselves into three bands. Those in the middle will march straight at them, and the other two divisions will make a flank movement to the right and left. Now, when the middle division begins to engage them, they will think that we are all there. They will come out. And then we will give it to them from the flanks. That's the way, boys. And if we beat these, there will be nothing left to fear. We shall be tsars ourselves. That was the way they did. As soon as the middle division went forward under Yermak, the Tatars began to yell and rushed out. Then the wings joined battle, the right under Ivan Kaltso, the left under the Ataman Meshiryak. 
The Tartars were panic-stricken and took to their heels. The Cossacks slaughtered them, and no one at all dared to oppose Yermak any longer. And thus they made their entrance into the very city of Sibir. And there Yermak took up his abode exactly as if he had been Tsar. The neighboring princes began to come to Yermak with salutations, and the Tatars came back and began to settle down in Sibir. Kuchum and his son-in-law, however, dared not make a direct attack on Yermak, but wandered round and round and laid their plans to capture him. In the spring, at the time of the freshets, some Tatars came to Yermak, saying, Mamet Kul is coming against you again, and he has collected a great army, and is now on the Vagaya river. Yermak hastened over rivers, swamps, streams, and forests, crept up with his Cossacks, fell on Mamet Kul, and killed many of the Tatars, and took Mamet Kul himself prisoner, and brought him back to Sibir. And now there remained few Tatars who were not subdued, and that summer Yermak marched against those that would not submit, and on the Irtish and on the Ob rivers Yermak brought so much land under subjection that you could not go around it in two months. After he had conquered all this land, he sent a messenger to the Stroganovs with a letter in which he said, I have taken Kuchum's city, and have Mamet Kul in captivity, and I have brought all the people round about under my sway. But it has cost me many Cossacks. Send us people, so that we may be more lively, and the wealth in this land is limitless in extent. And he sent also costly furs, fox skins, and martens, and sable. After this, two years passed. Yermak still held Sibir, but no reinforcements arrived from Russia, and Yermak's Russian forces were growing small. One time the Tatar Kachara sent a messenger to Yermak, saying, We have submitted to your sway, but the Nogai are harassing us. Let some of your braves come to our aid. We will conquer the Nogai together and we give you our oath that we will do no manner of harm to your braves. Yermak had faith in their oath, and he sent to them Ivan Kaltso with forty men. As soon as these forty men came to them, the Tatars fell on them and killed them, and this still further reduced the Cossacks. Another time some Bohara traders sent word to Yermak that they were on their way with merchandise which they wished to give him in his city of Sibir, but that Kuchum and his army were in their way and would not let them pass. Yermak took fifty men and went out to clear the road for the Bukharians. But when he reached the Irtesh river, he did not find any merchants, so they prepared to bivouac there. The night was dark and rainy. No sooner had the Cossacks lain down for the night than the Tatars rushed in from every side, threw themselves on the sleeping Cossacks, and began to hew them down. Yermak leaped up and began to fight. He was wounded in the arm by a knife. Then he ran to the river and threw himself into it, the Tatars after him. He was already in the water, but he was never seen again, and his body was never found, and no one knows how he died. End of section 30。section 31 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan states, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva Marge Tappan. Section 31. Yermak, 
a folk song. On the glorious steppes of Saratov, below the city of Saratov, and above the city of Kamishin, the Cossacks, the free people, assembled. They collected the brothers in a ring, the Cossacks of the Don, the Greben, and the Yake. Their hetman was Yermak, the son of Timofey. Their captain was Asbashka, the son of Laranti. They planned a little plan. The summer, the warm summer is going, and the cold winter approaches, my brothers. Where, brothers, shall we spend the winter? If we go to the Yake, it is a terrible passage. If we go to the Volga, we shall be considered robbers. If we go to the city of Kazan, there is the Tsar, the Tsar Ivan Vasilevich, the terrible. There he has great forces. There, Yermak, thou wilt be hanged, and we Cossacks shall be captured and shut up in strong prisons. Yermak, the son of Timofey, takes up his speech. Pay attention, brothers, pay attention, and listen to me, Yermak. Let us spend the winter in Astrakhan, and when the fair spring reveals herself, then, brothers, let us go on a foray. Let us earn our wine before the terrible Tsar. Ha, brothers, my brave hetmans, make for yourselves boats, make the rowlocks of fir, make the oars of pine. By the help of God we will go, brothers. Let us pass the steep mountains, let us reach the infidel kingdom, let us conquer the Siberian kingdom. That will please the Tsar, our master. I will myself go to the white Tsar. I shall put on a sable cloak. I shall make my submission to the white Tsar. Oh, thou art our hope, orthodox Tsar. Do not order me to be executed, but bid me say my say, since I am Yermak, the son of Timothy. I am the robber hetman of the dawn. Twas I went over the blue sea, over the blue sea, the Caspian, and it was I who destroyed the ships. And now, our hope, our orthodox Tsar, I bring you my traitor's head, and with it I bring the empire of Siberia. And the orthodox Tsar spoke. He spoke, the terrible Ivan Vasilevich. Ha! Thou art Yermak, the son of Timofey. Thou art the hetman of the warriors of the dawn. I pardon you and your band. I pardon you for your trusty service, and I give you the glorious gentle dawn as an inheritance. End of section 31 this recording is in the public domain. Section 32 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 32. How Pardon Was Won for an Exile, 1808. By Madame Sophie Ristot cotin In 1808, a young girl made a journey of 2,400 miles, alone and on foot, to beg the Tsar to pardon her father, who had been exiled to Siberia. With this for a foundation, Madame Cotin wrote her famous story of Elizabeth. The extract given pictures the heroine on her arrival at Moscow, which occurs just at the time of the coronation of the Tsar. Smolov is the son of the governor of Siberia, who has shown Elizabeth and her parents all the favor that he dared. Rossi is an innkeeper who has given her shelter. The Editor On the morrow, as soon as the thunder of the artillery, the beating of the drums, and the loud acclamations of the people announced the dawn of the joyful day. Elizabeth, habited in a dress lent to her by her kind hostess, and leaning upon the arm of Rossi, joined the crowd which followed the procession to the large church of the Assumption, where the coronation was to be performed. More than a thousand tapers illuminated the holy temple, which was decorated in all the splendor of eastern magnificence. Upon a dazzling throne, beneath a canopy of rich velvet, were seated the emperor and his youthful consort, habited in sumptuous dresses, which, displaying to advantage the beauty of their forms, 
gave to their appearance an air almost celestial. Kneeling before her august spouse, the empress received from his hand the imperial diadem, and encircled her brow with this pledge of their eternal union. Opposite to the royal pair, and in the sacred chair of truth, was the venerable Plato, the patriarch of Moscow, who, in a discourse at once pathetic and sublime, recalled to the youthful mind of Alexander the great duties annexed to royalty, and the awful responsibility imposed upon his elevated station, in return for the pomp that environed it, and the power with which it was invested. Amidst the assemblage of nations which thronged the cathedral, he pointed out to him the hunters of Kamchatka, bringing tribute of skins from the Aleutian Islands, which border on America. The merchants of Archangel, loaded with rich commodities which their vessels had brought from every quarter of the globe. The Samoyeds, a rude and unpolished people, who came from the mouth of the Yenisei, a country condemned to the rigors of an eternal winter, where the beauteous flower of the spring and the rich produce of harvest are alike unknown. And the natives of Astrakhan, whose fertile fields yield melons, figs, and grapes of exquisite flavor. He showed him, lastly, the inhabitants of the shores of the Black and Caspian Seas, and of the great Tartary, which, bounded by Persia, China, and the Empire of the Mughals, extending from the extremity of the Western Hemisphere to that of the East, occupies nearly half the globe. Sovereign of the most extensive empire of the earth, said he, you who are this day about to take the awful oath of presiding over the destinies of a state which includes a fifth part of the known world, bear it ever in remembrance that you have to answer at the tribunal of divine justice for the fate of millions of your fellow creatures, and that an injustice, through your neglect, done to the meanest among them, must be accounted for at the final day of retribution. At these words the heart of the young emperor appeared to be sensibly affected, but there was one among the auditors whose heart was not less affected than his, that of the supplicant who was come to solicit the remission of a father's sentence. At the moment when Alexander began to pronounce the solemn oath which was to bind him to devote his future life to the happiness of his people, the enraptured Elizabeth imagined she heard the voice of mercy requiring him to break the chains of every unfortunate being within his dominions. Unable any longer to command her feelings, and aided by a supernatural strength, she pierced the crowd, and forcing a passage through the lines of the soldiers, rushed towards the throne, exclaiming, Mercy! Mercy! The vehemence of her supplication interrupted the ceremony, and occasioned so much confusion that the guards advanced, and notwithstanding her entreaties and the efforts of Jacques, dragged her out of the church. The emperor, however, would not, on so glorious a day, be invocated in vain. He ordered one of the officers of his suite to inquire what it was that the petitioner wanted. The officer obeyed. He quitted the church in haste, and heard the imploring accent of the agonized supplicant, still endeavoring to prevail with the soldiers to allow her to return. He started, quickened his pace, saw who it was, recognized the daughter of the exile, and exclaimed, "'It is she! It is Elizabeth!' Elizabeth turned. She could hardly give credit to so much happiness." could scarcely believe that Smoloff was there to save her father. Yet it was his voice, his features. She could not be mistaken. Joy deprived her of utterance, and she stretched her arms towards him, as to a messenger sent from heaven to her relief. He rushed forward, seized her hand, and in his turn began to doubt the testimony of his senses. Elizabeth, he exclaimed, is it indeed you, or do I behold a vision from heaven? Speak, whence do you come? "'From Tobolsk. From Tobolsk. And have you travelled hither, alone and on foot?' "'Yes,' she exclaimed. "'I came to entreat pardon for my father, and they forced me from the presence of the Emperor.' "'I will reconduct you to his presence,' interrupted the transported Smoloff. "'I will present you to him. He will not resist your supplications. Your prayer will be granted.' Smoloff then dispersed the soldiers, and led Elizabeth back towards the church." The imperial procession was at that instant issuing from the great gate of the cathedral. As soon as the monarch appeared, Smoloth, holding Elizabeth by the hand, forced a passage through the guards, and threw himself with her at the emperor's feet. "'Sire,' he cried, "'vouchsafe to listen to the voice of suffering virtue. Behold the daughter of the unfortunate Stanislaus Potowski. She has come from the deserts of Ischim, where her parents have for twelve years languished in exile.' She has had no guide nor protector, 
has performed the journey on foot, begging her bread and braving scorn and misery, snow and tempests, every danger and every fatigue, to implore of your majesty forgiveness for her father. Elizabeth raised her clasped hands towards heaven, repeating the last words, Forgiveness for my father. A clamor of admiration arose from the crowd. The emperor himself joined in it, and deeply rooted as his prejudices had been against Stanislaus Potowski, in an instant they were totally effaced. He could not hesitate to believe that the father of a daughter so virtuous must be innocent of the crimes alleged against him. But had it been otherwise, Alexander would not have withheld forgiveness. The pardon is granted, said he. Your father is free. Elizabeth heard no more. At the word pardon, joy overpowered her, and she fell senseless into the arms of Smoloff. In this state she was carried through an immense crowd who opened a passage, shouting with joyful acclamations of approbation at the transcendent virtue of the heroine and the clemency of the monarch, and was conveyed back to the house of the benevolent Rossi. Several days elapsed before the deed of pardon could be drawn up and signed. Previously to its final accomplishment, it was requisite to inquire into the causes of Potowski's condemnation, and the investigation proved so favorable to the noble Polander that equity alone would have authorized the emperor to break the chains of the illustrious patriot. But he had listened to the dictates of clemency before he knew what those of justice required, an act of generosity which those whom he thus nobly pardoned never forgot. One morning, Smoloff called on Elizabeth at an earlier hour than he had before presumed to visit her, and presented to her a parchment with the imperial seal. Behold, said he, the mandate in which the emperor commands my father to restore liberty to yours. Elizabeth seized the parchment, and pressing it to her lips, bathed it with tears. This is not all, continued Smoloff. Our magnanimous sovereign performs a noble action in a manner worthy of himself. He restores to your father his dignities, his rank, his property, all those honors which elevate men in the estimation of his fellows, but which can never elevate Elizabeth. The courier who is to convey the order to Tobolsk departs tomorrow, and I have obtained permission to accompany him. And may not I also accompany him, eagerly interrupted Elizabeth. Unquestionably, resumed Smoloff, and from your lips only your father must learn that he is free. Presuming upon my knowledge of your sentiments, I told the emperor that it was your wish to be yourself the bearer of the joyful intelligence. He approved the design, and charged me with the commission of informing you that you have leave to depart tomorrow in one of his carriages, attended by two female domestics, and he has sent a purse of two thousand roubles to defray the expenses of your journey. End of section 32《Of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 33. On the March to Siberia, 19th Century. By Baroness M. de Pack. Number 316 was branded on my bundle. I no longer had a name, and my identity received even less consideration than it usually bestowed upon animals. For they are always designated by a name, never by a number. Our march to the mines was a continued succession of blows, curses, and hardships of every imaginable nature. Many of my fellow convicts succumbed to them, and fell by the way, being left there to die and be devoured by the wolves. A train of convicts on their way to the wilds of Siberia is a most distressing sight to witness. To describe it properly, one must write words of fire with a sword dipped in blood, pen and ink, and cold type seem too pale, too poor, too inadequate in every way to give a true account of that fearful journey. The convicts being weighed down by the heavy chain and ball can make little progress, and the march is slow and laborious, and every step of the way being marked by bloodshed and suffering. Four persons chained to each other walked abreast, the first and last in the row dragging, 
the heavy iron balls behind them. They are put on the prisoners to prevent their escape, it is said. Such an assertion is too absurd to be credited, however, for no one would be foolhardy enough to try to escape in that land of snow and desolation, where numbers prove the only safeguard against the ravenous wolves that infest the country. No, the ball and chain are merely accessories, which add a little more torture to the convict's lot. They are intended as punishment, a constant reminder of the weight of the master's heavy hand, a daily, hourly irritation of flesh and spirit. Soldiers walk beside the line of weary, footsore travelers, carrying the whip which for centuries has made Russia infamous. The knot, a long, heavy stick to which are fastened from five to twenty strips of rawhide, the end of each thong interwoven with iron or heavy wire. The soldiers use them on their helpless victims, just as in some countries farmers use fly whips to keep insects from annoying horses and oxen. With this difference, every blow from the knot raises great welts on the flesh and draws blood, and the blows are bestowed not for cause, but simply out of wanton cruelty and a fiendish delight in torturing. The weakest of the prisoners are generally placed in the first row. If they stumble and fall, those beside them are expected to aid and hold them up. If, after being thoroughly knotted and given a short rest, they are still unable to stagger along, they are put in the carts, which form part of the convoy, and carried on with the bundles and provisions. The carts are used more frequently for the fainting women than for the weary men. Women! Yes, many of them, often women of high rank and birth, aristocrats, from head to foot, accustomed to being shielded from every hardship, used to every luxury money could obtain, ignorant of every sphere of life, but that surrounded by wealth, love, and influence. While to any woman that march to Siberia is an awful thing, yet to the delicately bred the association with real criminals, the daily contact with the vile and degraded beings who deserve punishment for crimes and atrocities really committed are by far the greatest hardships of all. A study of the faces in a convict gang shows the gamut of human passion written in deep lines upon each countenance. One sees the sullen, degraded criminal, born and bred in depravity, and the haughty, educated, sensitive aristocrat, reared in luxury and affluence. Few seem to ask your compassion, although one cannot restrain one's heart from pitying all. Some rave and curse, but the knot is applied to women as well as to men and it soon hushes the openly rebellious into bearing the inevitable with the obstinate gloom and enforced submission. They quickly learn that the best policy is to be as submissive as possible. The more the poor unfortunates bend their backs, the less trouble they give to their keepers, officers, and underlings. The better they fare. These servants of the mighty Tsar are a lazy, overbearing, cruel lot of vagabonds who treat the outcast with the same scorn and severity they themselves receive from their superiors. It is their duty to bring so many heads alive to designated places and to account for the lost as being dead. Before leaving a poor wretch on the way, the officer in charge assures himself of the utter uselessness of attempting to take the worn-out prisoner farther. Only when absolutely beyond human aid is she or he left to the mercy of the fierce and hungry wolves. It is an impossibility for any one to escape from the line. It would be madness to make the attempt. In the breast of every convict lives the hope of escape. He imagines that if once away from his tormentors, some miracle would transport him to safety. His desire to evade the life before him makes him sometimes forget chain, hunger, the knot, and all his sufferings of mind and body but he never tries to get away. Knowing the futility of an attempt and the terrible punishment he would receive when caught and returned to the gang. My fellow prisoner was, as I have said, a great big burly creature, sullen and gloomy. We were allowed to talk in an undertone as long as it pleased our keepers to permit us this privilege, and it was he who gave me the sulky and most ungracious advice to keep still and make the best of a bad bargain. My thoughts were a chaos. All I knew was that my soul was filled with revengeful rage. The remembrance of my parents, my love, my home, 
brought pain and misery. Every sweet recollection vanished behind a blood-red cloud. As the days passed, my temper did not improve, and under the hardships we had to endure, I often wondered that I had not become insane. The roads were bad, the chains grew heavier, the food was not fit for a dog, and long marches in snow and ice ended only with the close of each day. At night we were huddled around a fire, rolled up in our blankets, left to our maddening self-reproaches and thoughts. When sleep spread its merciful wings over us, our chain-bruised bodies were too weary to let wakefulness remind us of our misery. But as time heals all wounds, so does surrounding suffering help us to forget ourselves. After a week I commenced to take an interest in my associates. We were about forty in number. The women would be driven out of the wagons and forced to walk for hours at a time every day. There were eight of them, all political felons. They had no balls to drag, but were chained to one another. The weakest were marched in front, but always a stronger chained with a weaker, for support, it was said. But really to lighten the keepers' task, it soon told upon the stronger one. Many kindnesses I have witnessed among those poor wretches. I have seen them pick up a half-fainting and bleeding form and carry it a long distance. I have seen them receive the blows from the horrible knot by putting their own bodies in the way to spare the weaker exile the stroke. I have seen them share their miserable meal, their scanty ration of water, with the more needy. I have myself received kindnesses, which solely enabled me to live, to carry out my revenge. And it was the little touches of human nature, at its best, that kept us from sinking to the level of our keepers. In being kind and considerate to each other, we kept alive the spark of good that had not quite been beaten and kicked out of us by our brutal guards. End of section 33. This recording is in the public domain. Section 34 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt. A Kyrgyz Warrior by Vasily Vasilievich Verashagin. Russia, 1842 to 1904. Painting page 186. The Kyrgyz are a nomadic tribe who made their abode between European Russia and Western China. Their houses are semicircular tents made by stretching red cloth or felt over a light wooden framework. So expert are they in the management of these that in half an hour they can pitch a tent, arrange their furnishings and be as much at home as if they had dwelt in the place for a year. The ground within the tent is usually covered with a felt carpet, and there is a wooden bedstead and the chest which holds the wardrobe of the family. There must be leather bottles for cumis, of course, with a tea service, and a few utensils for cooking. These are all that the Kyrgyz think necessary for comfort. These people are short and squat, with swarthy complexion and small black eyes. Their faces are broad and flat, but their hands and feet are small and well formed. Their clothing consists of flowing robes or chapons of velvet, silk, cotton or felt, the number varying according to the season. Over the chapon they wear pantaloons of generous size, made of either silk or wool. Their boots are of black or red leather, and their high pointed caps are of white felt. The Kyrgyz warrior fastens on his girdle of silk or leather, sticks into it his knife and tobacco pouch, and goes forth ready to meet the world. In order to get his material at first hand, Verashagin, painter of this picture, travelled extensively in the east, served with the Russian army in the Turkish campaign in 1877, saw the Chino-Japanese war, and was with the American army in the Philippines and the Russian troops in Manchuria. He was aboard the Russian battleship Petropavlovsk when she sank in the harbour of Port Arthur and went down with the vessel. End of section 34 this recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. 
The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 35, In a Tartar Tent, about 1909, by Lyndon Bates, Jr. A piercing wind, searching and paralyzing, meets the Tarantas beyond the crest at the southern border of the forest. It is Gobi's compliments to Baikal, the salute of the great desert to the great lake. The horses stumble through the drifted snow, scarcely able to walk. The driver, blinded, half-frozen, keeps to the general direction of the obliterated trail. Barely one verst an hour is made until, under the shelter of the bald white range of hills, the road reappears and the wind is warded off. A rolling plain between the heights is the next stretch of the way. The afternoon sun, dimly bright, creeps haloed through the lightly falling snow. Deep in the mist appears a dark, moving mass. It grows, focuses, and takes shape into a shaggy beast of burden, and camel after camel emerges from the haze, loaded with square bales of tea. Ask if there's shelter near, you shout to the muffled head of the interpreter. I will ask, he replies. Then to the caravan leader, say no, he cries in greeting. The foremost camel stares stonily as its Mongol driver twitches the piece of wood which pierces its upper lip, and the whole train stops. Giro humbene, ti ti or humbene, comes the answer. It is close at hand. Forward the caravan slowly paces, each camel turning his head to stare as he passes out into the mist again. One of them has left a fleck of blood in each print of his broad spongy foot, which the driver will cobble with leather at the next halt. Along their trail you drive southward. The mist is clearing as you rise, and the sun shines down on the snow which is crystallized in little shafts an inch high. These spear-shaped slivers have a brightness and a sheen of extraordinary brilliance, and like prisms show all the colors of the rainbow. They cast a gleam, as might a mirror, a hundred yards away. It is as if upon the great white mantle had been thrown a haphazard treasure in rubies and emeralds and diamonds and opals, myriad ever-growing rivals of Dresden regalias. The sun goes down with its necromancy. Beyond, the soft blanket enfolds the rolling hills. It drapes the rocks and weaves drooping festoons about the barren mountainsides. Mongol Yerda, calls Andre, turning to point out with his whip the low, dome-shaped hut, black against the darkening sky. On its unknown occupant, we are to billet ourselves, sheltered by the rule of nomad hospitality. As the Tarantas nears the wattled corral, the watchful ravens stir from their perches. The picketed camels turn out to stare. A gaunt black hound stalks out with mane erect and ominous growls. Nahoy, cries out Alexemovich to the inhabitants of the hut, then adds to you, very bad dogs. It is a Mongol proverb, if you are near a dog, you are near a bite. Beneath an osier-built lean-to, a woman is milking a sheep, with a lamb to encourage the flow. She calls a guttural order to the dog, which slinks back. Then she comes to the wattled fence, while the sheep, which had been getting milked, escapes to the far corner of the yard. The woman's head is curiously framed by a triangular red hat and silver hair plates, which hold out like wings her black tresses. The shoulders of her magenta dress are padded up into epaulets two inches high. She is girded with a sash. Say no, says Aleksimovich. Sain, she answers, and opens the gateway to the enclosure around the hut. Andre drives in among the sheep and cows, and you climb lumberingly down with cold stiffened limbs. Andre puts his whip upon the felt roof, for it is a deadly breach of etiquette to bring it into the house. You go in, said Aleksimovich. It is like entering a kennel, this struggle through the narrow aperture, muffled to the eyes in double furs and awkward felt boots. As you straighten up after the crawl through the entrance, a red glare from the fire just in front meets the gaze. Stinging smoke grips the throat. You choke in pain. It blinds the smarting eyes. You gasp and stagger. Then someone takes your hand and pulls you violently down on a low couch to the left, where in the course of time breath and sight return. There is no chimney, nor stack for the fire of the brazier, which stands in the center of the hut. One can see the open sky through the three-foot hole above. The smoke, finding its way toward this aperture, works along the sloping wooden poles which form the framework of the felt-covered tent, filling the whole upper section with its blinding fumes. To stand is to smother. Sitting, the head comes below the smoke line. 
With recovered vision, one can look around within the hut. The couch of refuge, raised some six inches above the floor, is the bed by night, the sitting place by day. Against the wall at the left hand, and directly opposite the door, is a box-like cupboard, along whose top are ranged pictures of grotesque Buddhist gods, before whom are little brass cups full of offerings, millet or oil, in which is standing a burning wick. Beside the door is a shelf loaded with fire-blackened pots and kettles. Branches of birch for fuel are thrown beneath. On the far side of the room, three black lambs, fenced off by a wicker barricade, are huddled together, quietly sleeping. Seated beside the fire, close by, is the girl of nineteen who has just saved you from asphyxiation. The long, fur-lined working dress, common to all ages and sexes of Mongols, is buttoned on her left side with bright brass buttons and is belted in with a sash. She has not the padded shoulder humps nor the spreading hair arrangement which gave to her mother who welcomed us so weird an appearance. Her complexion is swarthy like an Indian's, not the chalky Chinese yellow and she has red cheeks and full red lips. Her eyes are large and black. The rest of the party have stayed a moment outside to ask about hay and water. You have made this solitary and awkward entrance. The girl has no more notion than a bird who the strange man of another nation may be who has stumbled into her home. But it does not trouble her in the least. For a moment she looks you over calmly with a smile of amused curiosity, rolling and wringing with her fingers a lambskin which she is softening. Then, composedly, she bids you the Mongol welcome, say no, and holds out her hand. Her grip is as firm and frank as a Siberian's. Now Aleksimovich comes tumbling through the door, and next Andrei. Both are used to these huts, and artistically stoop below the smoke line. All our impedimenta, blankets, furs, pots, kettles, bread bag, rifles, are heaped in a mound within the space between the couch and the tethered lambs. The girl has not stirred from her work. They are friends of yours, then, Aleksimovich, you ask. No, no, I never saw them, he answers. Anyone may take shelter in any yurta in Mongolia. A small head suddenly makes its appearance from the pile of rugs on the sofa opposite on the woman's side of the tent. There emerges, naked save for a bronze square-holed Chinese cash fastened around her neck, a little slant-eyed three-year-old. The water in the small cups offered to the duck cheats has long been ice, and one has full need of one's inner fur coat and cap in the hut, where the entrance, opening with every visitor, sends a draft of air, 40 degrees below zero, through from the door to the open hole which serves as chimney. And still, this tot can step out naked and not even seem to feel it. The child's name, asks Aleksimovich. Torunga, replies the girl. And your own? Sibelina, she says, and smiles. Turunga carefully inspects you, and solemnly accepts a lump of sugar, which she knows what to do with, even if it is a rare luxury offered to gods. She sits down in an evidently accustomed spot on the warm felt before the brazier, to play with the scissor-like fire tongs, carefully putting back the red coals that have fallen out on the earthen platform. The Tarantas driver, having piled up your impedimenta, excavates from its midst the bag of rye bread which he sets to thaw. He gets next the little bag of palmenis, the meatballs covered with dough paste which you carry frozen hard. The mother comes in from under the yurta's flap, and placing a blackened basin over the brazier, puts into it a little water, and scours diligently with a bundle of birch twigs. She brushes out this water on the earthen floor near the entrance. This is the picketed lamb's especial territory, to which the felt rugs before the couches and the altar do not extend. A big bag of snow which she has brought from outside is opened, and the chunks are piled into the basin, where, while one watches, it melts down into water. Butzella, Butzella, she cries soon, holding a lighted sliver over the basin to see it by. It boils. Into the Mongol's pot go our palmenis, to brew for a few moments. An accidentally trenchant description of Siberian palmenis was given on the quaintly worded French bill of fare in the hotel at Irkutsk, meat hashed in bullets of dough. They come out, however, a combination of hot soup and dumplings, very welcome after the long, cold day's drive across the plains, the frozen marsh, and the rolling hills. The wooden Chinese bowls from the bazaar at Troitskosovsk are filled now with our hostess's big ladle, and the application of warmth inwardly gradually thaws the outlying regions of the body. But there is trouble in camp. Turunga is moved by the peculiar passions of her sex and her age, curiosity and hunger. 
It does not matter in the least that she has homemade palmenis every two or three days. She wants these particular meatballs. The little mouth begins to pucker and the eyes to screw up. No amount of knee riding by the mother takes the place of the palmenis. We fill a heaping ladle full and Andre furnishes his own bowl. The mother receives it, holding out both her hands cup fashion, as is the etiquette, and Turunga is satisfied. The mother looks kindly to the stranger and smiles at Andre, then throws more sticks of the precious firewood on the embers. Andre has caught, likewise, the not unadmiring glance of the young maid. The girl who waits in Troitskasovsk is not the only one who appreciates our six-foot Siberian hunter. The dog barks in the yard, but without the menace which hailed us, and the crunch of a horse's hoofs sounds on the frozen ground outside. The flap opens, with its rush of freezing air. Stooping, there enters a typical Mongolian, squat of figure, round of head, with broad, sun-browned face, and a short queue of black hair. He wears a funnel-shaped hat, magenta-colored, and is enveloped in a long shuba, with brass buttons down one side like a fencer's jacket. About his waist is a sash, with jingling knives and pouches. He is the head of the family, come in from herding his horses. He turns back the long, fur-lined cuffs which have protected his gloveless hands, and stretches out both his arms for you to place your hands over his. It is the man's ceremony of welcome. Then he produces a little porcelain snuff-bottle. This must be received in the palm of the right hand with a bow. It is to be utilized and passed back. If the herder is out of snuff, the bottle is offered just the same, and you must appreciatively pretend to take a pinch. Such is etiquette. The soup is gone now. The pot, cleaned out for the tea, is again on the boil and leaves are thrown in. Andre has borrowed a hatchet from his host and has chopped off a piece of milk, which goes in as well. It is in order to ask the new arrival, Subadar J, to pass his wooden cup for some of the beverage. He takes it, and the lump of sugar, without a word of thanks. The Mongol language has no expression to signify gratitude. Silence does not, however, mean that he does not appreciate. The dozen pieces of Mongol sandal sole bread, which he gives you later, are worth two bricks of tea in the open market. And this current medium of exchange, caravan-brought tea, is worth 60 kopecks the brick. No small gift to this bread to an interloping stranger who is brewing tea by his fire and camping unasked on his bed. A Tibet schooled lama knows the Buddhist maxim, only accomplish good deed, ask no reward, but the unlettered Mongol layman knows its practice. Little Turunga has played naked before the fire long enough now. She is caught up, her reluctant feet are put into the boots with pointed upturned toes, and her body into a miniature sheepskin daily such as her mother and father wear. The little girl is as smiling and shy and coquettish as any child of white skin and complex clothes. Would you sell Turunga for a brick of tea? No, no, says the mother, gathering the little one quickly up into her arms, while the rest of the family smiles at the offer and her solicitude. No, no, not even for ten bricks. Everybody laughs, Turunga with the rest, in a child's instinctive knowledge that she is the center of admiring attraction. Far more petting than the Russian babies get is lavished on the little Mongols. Perhaps the much smaller families, only two or three children to a hut, allow more attention per capita. The mother hands Turunga over to her father, unheard of in Siberia, and he plays with the child, giving her pieces of sheep's tail to eat from his mouth, answering her prattle or baby talk and endless questions. At night, about eight o'clock, the mother takes the child to the couch and they both go to sleep, Turunga cuddled warmly under her mother's shuba. Meanwhile, we men sit cross-legged by the fire and talk of many things, of the pasturage for the sheep, of the snow on the road, of the beauty of the housewife's silver head plates, of water and roads, of whether or not the Mongol dokchits on the altar are like the Gobi wolves that hate Chinese. It is interesting to note how some of the words used, few, however, have a familiar sound, although there is said to be no common ancestry with the Indo-Germanic tongues. Perhaps it is only the instinctive sound imitation which makes the Mongol baby cry mama to its mother, as does the child in Cheetah and in Chicago. Mine, for instance, is Mina. Thine is Tenei. A horse or mare is Mari. The word for it is, they are, is Bene a fairly respectable term of the word to be in Chaucer's English. The grammar is delightfully simple. In the vernacular, there is no bothering about singular or plural. One hut is Niger-gir, two huts, Hayur-gir. Milk is Sioux, 
and apparently the word for water was formed from it, usu. If one wants to know whether it is time to throw in the meatballs, he says, usu butzela, with a rising inflection, water boils, and the answer is butzela. The moon and a month are sara, and the years go in cycles of twelve. If one wants to compliment the host on the excellence of the sandal-shaped bread which he hands out, loaded with gray chalky cheese, hurut, one says bread good be, bobasen bene. This gives him great pleasure. Some of the written numbers are somewhat like ours. Two and three are nearly the same, but they have fallen forward on their faces. Six has an extra tail. When the teapot overturns, they say harlab to relieve their feelings. There is no word for so good, farewell, or much obliged. These are just squeezed into the heartiness of the final good, sane. So when one leaves, he holds out both arms, palms up, for the host to put his own upon, and says loudly, sane -o. A not unbarren amusement is to study out one's own derivation for some much-explained words. Tamerlane is often given as meaning the lame. Why does it not rather come from Temur, iron, and mean man of iron, as the ruler of the Kalka tribe was called Alten Khan, the golden king? The Amur River has Karamurin, black water, usually given as its derivative root. Why not the Mongol word Amur, which means simply quiet? In the hut tonight, while we are comparing mother tongues, the brazier fire has burned to red brands. The girl reaches into a basket beside the door for pieces of dried camel dung and puts them on that the embers may be fed and live through the night. These argols do not smoke. She may close the chimney hole with the flap of felt and the hut will be kept somewhat warm through the night. The Mongols prepare for sleep. They take off their boots and slip their arms from the sleeves of their fur shubas in which they roll themselves up as we in our blankets. But how hardened they are to the cold! A naked arm will project, and the robes become loose, but they do not wake. We keep on all our inner clothing, and roll ourselves about with skins until we are great cocoons. Andre gives a good night look to his horses, then he too lies down. With our heads beside the altar of the gods, we sleep in the Mongols' gear. End of section 35. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Colleen McMahon. Section 36 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey, read for LibriVox.org by phone. Russia, Part 7, A Coronation and Three Wars, Historical Note During the 19th century, Russia slowly but steadily increased her territory in Europe and in Asia. In 1853, Tsar Nicholas I made war upon the Turks. France, England, and Sardinia interfered, and a fierce struggle took place in the Crimea, marked by the fall of Sebastopol in 1855. Alexander II ascended the throne in the same year. His reign will be ever memorable for the emancipation of the 20 million Russian serfs. In 1877, the Turkish abuse of Christians and the Turkish atrocities in Bulgaria aroused the powers to demand a reform. This reform Alexander undertook to enforce, and in 1877 he declared war against Turkey. In this war, Russia was successful, but the fruits of her victories were greatly lessened by the other nations of Europe, who refused to allow the balance of power to be disturbed by so great gains to Russia. The reign of Alexander II was marked by a vast expansion of Russian territory in Asia. In spite of the reforms he inaugurated, discontent was rife, and in 1881 the Tsar fell a victim to a nihilist's bomb. Meanwhile, Russian expansion went forward. The Trans-Siberian Railway, begun in 1891 during the reign of Alexander III, was completed in the reign of his son, Nicholas II, the present Tsar. A naval base was established at Port Arthur, Manchuria was occupied by Russian troops, and Russia's dream of supremacy on the Pacific seemed in a fair way to be fulfilled. Japan saw with alarm her own visions of supremacy fading before Russian aggression, and prepared for war, 
which at length broke out in 1904. Russia had expected an easy victory, but the splendid organization of the Japanese army and navy, and the immense distance that separated Russia from the seat of warfare, were handicaps too great to be overcome, and Japan was steadily successful on both land and sea. By the Treaty of Peace negotiated at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and signed on September 5, 1905, largely as the result of the persistent efforts of the American president, Theodore Roosevelt, Russia ceded Port Arthur and adjacent territory to Japan, promised to evacuate Manchuria, and recognized the paramount influence of Japan in Korea. End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 37. The Coronation of Alexander II, 1855, by Count von Moltke. In 1855, Alexander II was crowned Emperor of Russia. Count von Moltke was one of the gentlemen chosen by the German Emperor to attend the German Crown Prince to Russia to witness the festivities. The Editor. The sky favored the celebration of the day by the finest weather. At seven in the morning, the city was already deserted for the crowd had flowed to the Kremlin, whose gates were still closed. They opened to us at eight o'clock. We found in their majesty's antechamber an army of gold-embroidered chamberlains, the high court functionaries with their eight-foot-long golden maces, and all the ladies in the national dress. The color of the manteau is different at different courts, scarlet with gold, silver, blue, amaranth, etc., so that even with the uniform cut there is an agreeable variety to the colors. The headdress is ornamented according to the wealth and taste of the individual, with gold, diamonds, stones, or pearls. The only chair was occupied in turn by several very old ladies, who had been standing since seven o'clock, and from their rich toilets may have been dressing since four. At nine o'clock the doors of the imperial rooms were opened, the flock of the chamberlains set itself in motion, the empress mother appeared, supported by her two youngest sons. She wore a close crown entirely of diamonds, an ermine mantle of gold material, the train of which was borne by six chamberlains and which was fastened by a magnificent diamond chain. The slight figure, the cameo profile, the majestic carriage of the illustrious woman, the joyful seriousness of her features called forth the unconscious admiration of everyone. On the previous evening she had assembled all her children and blessed them. She was followed by the hereditary Grand Duke, the Grand Dukes and Grand Duchesses, Prince Frederick William, Prince Frederick of the Netherlands, Alexander of Hesse, and the other royal princes, then their suites, and after us, the ladies. The procession passed through the halls of Alexander, Vladimir, and George, which together make a length of about 500 feet. On the left paraded the palace grenadiers, the chevalier guards, the cuirassiers with shining breastplates, deputations from the other cavalry and infantry regiments, all with standards and flags and bright arms. To the right were all the officers. Upon the Krasnoy Kritzau, the great outside steps, covered with scarlet cloth that leads from the old palace of the Tsars into the court of relics, a baldachin of gold brocade was awaiting the empress. It was supported by eight poles borne by chamberlains and adjutant generals. It was a beautiful sight in the sun. Behind the troops stood the bearded populace with heads uncovered, close together, but without crowding. The court is surrounded by three principal churches, the Ascension, Archangel, and Annunciation churches, then of Ivan Veliki and a high railing. The tribunes for the spectators rose nearly to the height of the building, where were seated ladies and gentlemen in their best clothes. All the innumerable bells of Moscow were ringing, but the roaring of the great Vechevoy, the giant bell of Novgorod, the clashing of the trumpets and the endless rejoicings of the multitude inside and outside of the court prevented us from hearing them. The noise of the cannons alone penetrated through the hubbub. 
When we reached the bottom of the stairs, I was enabled to turn and get a view of the beautiful procession of ladies descending. When we reached the Uspensky Sebor, we found the diplomatic corps assembled, and took our standing places on the tribune prepared for us, which rose upon three sides of the cathedral. The fourth side is occupied by the Iconostasi, behind which the altar is situated. Opposite to this was the throne on a carpeted platform, with two seats under magnificent baldachin. The empress mother took a seat especially arranged for her to the right of the throne. The princes stood up on the left. The church, as I have mentioned before, is small, only able to accommodate a limited number of spectators, and there was perfect order. The sun shone brightly through the windows and was reflected by the gilding that covered all the walls and pillars up to the dome. So it was bright, and I was near enough to see all the principal transactions. Then the regalia were brought in by the highest military and civil officials, the imperial banner with the double eagle of Byzantium, the great seal, a great steel plate without any other ornament, and the sword of the empire, the coronation robes of both their majesties, the imperial globe with a cross belt of great diamonds, Severin served it upon a drop door cushion the scepter with the well-known great Lazareff diamond, which stands second in size only to the koh -Nor, mountain of light, the prince regent, and perhaps one or two others, and finally the two crowns. The large one of the emperor is formed by a bow from front to back of diamonds and trimmed with a row of very great pearls. The bow has a cross in which is a ruby of inestimable value. This stone is an inch long, about half an inch wide and a quarter of an inch thick, but irregular and not cut. From the band around the head rise on either side two covers which fasten onto the bow so that one sees nothing of the velvet cap that is inside. The band and the sides are entirely of diamonds, of considerable size and the finest water. It glitters with every color in the sun. The empress's crown is similar but smaller, and it did not seem easy to keep it on the top of her head, where it was fastened with diamond hairpins. Now the cross was carried, from the church toward the approaching emperor, and the metropolite of Moscow sprinkled his path with holy water. Their majesties bowed three times toward the gate of the sanctuary, and then took their seats upon the throne. The high church dignitaries filled the space from the throne to the middle door of the Iconostasi, and the choir struck up the psalm Misericordium. I have already written you of the affecting beauty of the Russian church songs executed by male voices without instrumental accompaniment. They are very old and have been collected from the East and differ widely from the poor hymns of the Protestant and from the opera music of the Catholic Church. The singers are extraordinarily trained, and one hears almost incredible bass voices, which echo with imposing strength from the firm walls and domes of this limited space. Since Peter I incorporated the patriarchal power, the Metropolite is the highest priest of this great empire. At this time, the handsome but already decrepit old Philoretes, who crowned the Emperor Nicholas. It is of great importance for a high priest to have a strong bass voice. The voice of the old Metropolite could scarcely be heard when he requested the Emperor to say the creed. As soon as this was done, the Emperor was invested with the coronation mantle, consisting of the richest gold brocade lined with ermine. He bowed his head and remained in this position while the Metropolite laid his hands on his head and gave two long benedictions. Then the emperor called for the crown, placed it himself upon his head, took the scepter in his right hand, the imperial globe in his left, and seated himself upon the throne. Thereupon the empress stood before him and knelt down. The emperor takes the crown from his head and touches the empress with it, after which she is also invested with the mantle and crown, and seats herself on the throne to the left of her spouse. It was beautiful to see the intense interest with which the stately old empress mother followed all the ceremonies. Meanwhile, her youngest son was always at her side, supported her, wrapped the ermine about her that she might not take cold. The wife of a North American diplomat fainted near me. The Grand Duchess Helene fell into the Grand Duke's arms, but the old mother of the emperor remained steady. Then she arose and firmly ascended the steps of the throne, the glittering crown upon her head, and her gold brocaded mantle trailing behind her. Before all the world she embraced her firstborn son and blessed him. The emperor kissed her hands. Then followed the grand dukes and princes with low bows. The emperor embraced them. 
Meanwhile, the Domine Salvum Fac Imperatorum was sung, the church bells were ringing, and hundreds of cannon made the windows tremble. All present bowed low three times. Then the monarch divests himself of the imperial robes, descends from the throne, and kneels to pray. After he has risen, all present kneel or bow their heads to pray for the welfare of the new emperor. No mortal man has such power in his hands as the absolute monarch of the tenth part of all the inhabitants of the earth, whose scepter reaches over four quarters of the globe, and who rules over Christians and Jews, Muslims and pagans. Why should one not pray to God heartily to enlighten the man whose will is law to sixty millions of people, whose word commands from the Chinese wall to the Weichsel, from the Arctic Ocean to Mount Ararat, for whose call a half million soldiers wait, and who has just given peace to Europe? May he be successful in the innumerable conquests still to be made in the interior of this great empire, and may he always remain a strong supporter of lawful regulations. Now followed the Te Deum and a long mass after the Greek ritual. At the close of the mass, the emperor descends the steps of the throne without ornaments or arms and enters the sanctuary through the Tsar's gate, where he receives the communion exactly as the priests. The empress receives it afterward outside of the door. Then follows the anointment with oil on the forehead, eyelids, lips, ears, breast, and hands by the Metropolite of Moscow from a costly vessel. The bishops of Novgorod and Moscow wipe off the traces. Their majesties take their seat again on the throne and resume their crowns, robes, and the great diamond chain of the Alexander Nevsky order. From this moment they are the anointed of the Lord, and the ceremony is over. End of section 37. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 38 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan states, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Schmidt. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan states, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 38. The Emancipation of the Serfs. 1861 by Hezekiah Butterworth. Again, sweet bells of the Russias, your voice on the march air fling. Ring bells on the Volga and Drina, ring bells on the Caspian ring. O Tsar of the North, Alexander, thy justice to those that were least now girds thee with strength of the victor and makes thee the lord of the East. It was midnight on the Finland, and o'er the wastes of snow, from the crystal lamp of winter, the lamps of God hung low. A sea of ice was the Neva, in the white light of the stars, and it locked its arms in silence round the city of the Tsars. The palace was mantled in shadow, and dark in the starlit space, the monolith rose before it from its battle-trophied base, and the cross that crowned the column seemed reaching to the stars o'er the white street wrapped in silence round the palace of the Tsars. The chapel's mullioned windows are flushed with a sullen light. Who comes to the sacred altar in the silence of the night? What prince with the deep heart burden approaches the altar stair to take the wine and the wafer and bow for the help of prayer? Tis the Tsar, whose word in the morning shall make the Russias free, from the Neva to the Ural, from the steppe to the winter sea who speaks, and a thousand steeples ring freedom to every man, from the surf on the white Ladoga to the fisher of Astrakhan. O faith in eternal power, O faith in eternal love, O faith that looked up to heaven, the promise of ages to prove. The cross and the crown gleam above him, he raises his brow from prayer, the cross of humanity's martyr, or crown of the hero to wear. Slept the surf on the Neva and Volga, slept the fisher of Astrakhan, nor dreamed that the bells of the morning would ring in his rights as a man. He saw not night's crystal gates open to hosts singing carols on high. He knew not a Bethlehem glory would break with the morn in the sky. The morn set its jewels of rubies in the snow of the turret and spire, and shone the far sea of the Finland, a sea of glass mingled with fire. The old guard encircled the place with questioning look on each cheek, 
and waited the word that the UK's to the zone-girdled empire should speak. The voice of the Russias has spoken. Each serf in the Russias is free. Ring bells on the Neva and Volga, ring bells on the Caspian Sea. O Tsar of the North, Alexander, thy justice to those that were least shall gird thee with strength of the victor, shall make thee the lord of the East. Again, sweet bells of the Russias, your voice on the march air fling. Ring bells on the Volga and Duina, ring bells on the Caspian, ring. Thy triumphs of peace, Alexander, outshine all thy triumphs of war. And thou, at God's altar, wert grander than throned as the conquering Tsar. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The World's Story, Volume 6 Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 39 the taking of the village an incident of the war of 1877 with turkey by Vsevolod mikhailovich garshin wenzel is drawn as a stern disciplinarian so savage in his punishments as to be hated by his men the author hints that they have half planned to shoot him in the confusion of the battle the editor beyond the rising ground which we had to cross were the turks we reached the summit of the hill and a broad stretch of broken ground gradually sloping downwards spread out before us covered here with wheat and maize fields there with huge thickets of elms and medlar trees in two posts shone white minarets but the villages to which they belonged uh, were hidden behind green hillocks. It was the right-hand village that we were to seize. Beyond it, on the horizon, was a barely visible white band. It was the high road which our Cossacks had just returned from occupying. Soon the whole scene was hidden from our eyes, for we entered a dense thicket, broken here and there by little glades. I cannot distinctly remember the beginning of the battle. When we came out on to the open ground at the hilltop, where our companies emerging from the bushes and forming into a long chain were plainly visible to the Turks, we heard the sudden thunder of a cannon shot. They had rifled a grenade at us. Our men started, and all eyes turned to the already fading cloudlet of white smoke creeping down the hillside. At that moment the sharp whizzing sound of the approaching missile made every one shrink back. It seemed to fly right over our heads, then struck into the ground close beside the company which was marching behind us. I remember the hollow sound of the explosion and the piteous cry that followed. A fragment of the grenade had torn off the leg of a sergeant. This I heard afterwards, but at the time I could not understand the cry. My ear received the sound mechanically, and that was all. Everything was swallowed up in that vague feeling, which no words can express, that seizes upon a man the first time he goes under fire. It is said that every one is afraid in battle, that every truthful and modest man, if asked whether he is afraid, will answer yes. But this fear was not the physical terror which takes possession of a man when he meets a robber in a lonely lane by night. It was a full, distinct consciousness of the closeness, the inevitableness of death, and, strange as the words sound, this consciousness neither held our men back nor made them think of flight but led them on there was no awakening of bloodthirsty instincts no desire to press forwards in order to kill anyone 
but an irresistible desire to press forwards at any cost, and the thought in our minds of what we had to do was not, we must kill, but rather, we must die. We had to cross an open glade, and the Turks took the opportunity to fire several shots at us. Between us and them was now only one large thicket sloping gradually upwards to the village. We entered into the brushwood, and all grew still. It was difficult walking. The tall, often thorny bushes grew close together, and we had to get round them or force a passage through them. The company of riflemen which was in front of us had split up into a chain, and the men softly called to one another every now and then in order not to get separated. Our company, for the present, kept together. Deep silence reigned in the wood. Suddenly, the first rifle shot rang out, not very loud, like the sound of a woodcutter's axe. The Turks began to fire at random in our direction. The balls whistled high in the air in varying notes and flew noisily through the bushes, tearing off boughs as they passed, but touching no one. The sounds of the breaking boughs grew more and more frequent, till they blended in one continuous crash. We could no longer hear the whistling and hissing of individual balls. The whole air hissed and whistled. We pressed hastily forwards. All near me were unhurt, and I myself was unhurt. This surprised me greatly. The thicket broke off suddenly, and a deep ravine with a brook ran across the way. We stopped for a moment to rest and drink water. At this spot the companies were separated, in order that they might fall upon the Turkish forces from both flanks. Our company was left in the ravine as a reserve. The riflemen were to go straight on and, passing through the bushes, force their way into the village. The Turkish volleys were still crashing as frequently as before, but louder. Wenzel on reaching the top of the ravine on the opposite side drew up his forces into form he said something to the men which i did not catch we'll do our best answered the voices of the riflemen i looked up at him he was pale and i thought sad but fairly calm catching sight of ivan platonich and stebelov he waved his handkerchief to them and then turned his eyes to our company evidently looking for something i guessed that he wanted to take leave of me and stood up that he might see me he smiled nodded to me several times and commanded his company to form into a chain the men separated to right and left in groups of four drew out into a long chain and in one moment disappeared among the bushes all except one man who suddenly drew himself up violently flung up his hands and dropped heavily on the ground two of our men ran out to the ravine and brought in the body half an hour passed in weary suspense the battle grew hotter the sounds of the volleys became more and more frequent and then melted into one terrific roar the cannon began to thunder on the right flank. Blood-stained men, walking or crawling, came out of the bushes. At first there were only a few of them, but with every moment their number increased. Our men helped them down into the ravine, gave them water, and laid them down to wait till the ambulance people should come with litters. A rifleman with one hand torn into rags and a face livid with pain and loss of blood came without any help but groaning and rolling his eyes fearfully and sat down by the brook our men bound his arm up and laid him on a cloak the bleeding stopped he was shaking with fever his lips were quivering and he burst out sobbing convulsively with a nervous catching of the breath mates mates oh my lads many killed oh so many so many is the commander hurt not yet 
if it weren't for him they'd have driven us back ours will win they'll win with him said the wounded man faintly he led us up three times and they drove us back now he's charged again the fourth time they're in the bivouac their cartridges oh it's just raining bullets no he cried out with sudden fierceness half rising and gesticulating with his wounded hand you shan't get off so you shan't the man rolled his eyes frantically shrieked out a horrible brutal oath and fell back insensible lukin appeared at the top of the ravine ivan platonitch he shouted in a voice not like his own bring up your men smoke thundering crashes moans a frenzied hurrah the stench of blood and powder strange unknown white-faced people wrapped in smoke a horrible inhumane butchery god be thanked that such moments are remembered but dimly as through a mist when we came up wenzel was leading what remained of his company for a fifth charge against the turkish hail of bullets that time the riflemen succeeded in forcing their way into the village not many of the turks defending the spot had time to escape the second company of riflemen lost during two hours fighting fifty-two out of a little over a hundred our company which took only a small part in the action had few losses we did not remain in occupation of the position gained although the turks were completely routed when our general saw battalion after battalion with masses of cavalry and long trains of cannon come out upon the high road he was horror-stricken at their numbers evidently the turks had not known what forces we had as we were hidden by the bushes had they guessed that a mere fourteen battalions had driven them from the deep-cut roads gullies and high fences surrounding the village they would have come back and crushed us their numbers were three times greater than ours by evening we were back again at our old quarters ivan platonitch called me in to tea have you seen wenzel he asked not yet go into his tent and make him come here will you the man's breaking his heart fifty-two fifty-two that's all we can get out of him do go to him wenzel's tent was dimly lighted up by one scrap of candle he was crouching down in a corner with his head laid on an old box and sobbing bitterly End of section 39section 40 of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tavarish the world's story volume 6 russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section 40 the capture of a redoubt an incident of the war of 1877 with turkey by vasily vasilievich Vidishagin. the grivitsa redoubt was one of the fortifications of plevna at this place the russians were repulsed but later were successful the editor the two were exchanging remarks in regard to the intended action as they rode up the hill when suddenly there was a cry from behind make way make way the two officers had barely time to put spurs into their horses and spring aside into the bush when the tsar seated in a carriage drawn by four black horses dashed by at a rapid trot he returned their salute graciously and quickly disappeared along with his suite on the top of the hill there were preparations for divine service the altar had been erected in a large green tent 
and Vladimir gazed upon the scene with deep interest. The emperor and the commander-in-chief were saying their prayers at the entrance of this tent, standing out in relief against the somber background of Plevna and the other forts. Behind those, too, were the most distinguished persons of the army, with a great following of younger officers, and stretching farther still behind these, knelt the remainder absorbed in prayer. The voice of the priest was borne to his ears, mingled with the rattling of small arms and the thundering of the big guns. He besought the Almighty to send down victory. The heavens are of the same color as lead. The rain persists. Suddenly in the center of the line is heard a terrific noise of musketry which arrests the attention of everyone. How could this happen and why so soon? Everyone knew that according to the dispositions made, the battle was not to begin until three o'clock. Apparently there had been some misunderstanding. The commander-in-chief called an adjutant and ordered him to ride over and find out the reason for this untimely shooting. After the service there was a luncheon, at which the Tsar drank the health of his brave army, a toast which was greeted by all present with a loud shout of hurrah. The battlefield lay blanketed under a white mist, caused by the smoke from innumerable rifles and pieces of artillery. For a time also one could notice smaller bits of smoke from the distant Turkish batteries on the left wing, but soon these also disappeared and nothing was heard but shouts hurrah, hurrah, and Allah, Allah, sounds that were taken up by thousands upon thousands of voices, the signal that the butchery was going on. The commander-in-chief presented Vladimir to the Tsar in order that he might report upon what he had seen in his ride to the Danube. As he was retiring from the Tsar's presence with his hand to his cap, he was arrested by the cordial greeting. Why, my good fellow countrymen, how are you? And his hands were seized in the affectionate grasp of the dear old Prince Suvorov for the family of Vladimir were also landed proprietors in the district of Novgorod, where the prince was born. "'Bless me, what an age since we have been together!' The elder officer kissed the younger one repeatedly. He began to tell him about Verkhovtsev, whom he knew, "'A good sort! He is an excellent soldier and sets a good example everywhere!' But the fellow will not allow himself to get well. He has three wounds, but will not bandage them. The surgeon is wretched. He is an odd fish, but a thorough good fellow. And with it all, would you believe that he is nothing but a scribbler? Immediately afterwards, his patron, Count A., who had also been standing near, greeted Vladimir. Well, what news of your father? Vladimir gave him the affectionate greeting of his family and the latest news. Only recently I had news, but he scarcely mentioned you. However, reading between the lines, I see that he and your mother are much concerned about you. Vladimir blushed and smiled his acknowledgments. Prince Charles of Romania, who was also at headquarters, honored him with a few words, spoke about the regiments he had seen in the field and matters of cognate interest. Two other generals of great influence whom Vladimir had met at the house of Count A shook hands cordially with him and made a few jovial remarks. All eyes were therefore directed at Vladimir when he returned to his comrades after having been so conspicuously noticed by the principal people at headquarters. Goodwill and envy were blended in the emotions he inspired. Those who had already greeted him now hastened to give him still more cordial welcome. Those who had not seen him yesterday nearly smothered him with their affectionate embraces. The Tsar sat motionless upon his camp chair. Close to him and rather behind him 
sat on a similar chair the commander-in-chief. Behind these, in two rows, the senior officers of his suite, the generals Milutin, Count Alderberg, Prince Suvorov, and others. Here also was the Prince of Romania. Several of the suite seated themselves on the damp grass. All kept their glasses in constant use, and only rarely were remarks exchanged. The Grand Duke stood up to salute a portion of the army consisting of reserves. The soldiers answered cheerily, Long life to your Imperial Majesty! You look like good fighters, shouted His Majesty to them. We are happy to serve your Majesty! From the point occupied by the headquarters, it was not possible to see either the Romanians or the Russian regiments of the right wing. They were attacking the fortifications of Grivitsa. Prince Charles of Romania rode down with his officers to where he could see Grivitsa. Behind them strode the old Skobelev, with several officers, amongst whom was Vladimir. They scattered themselves in the bush, where off and on a shell exploded. They could observe distinctly the operations of the right wing, which was moving forward to the attack in a snaky line. At one time the line broke into pieces, at another it closed up once more. Sometimes the inequality of the country, combined with the artillery fire, made great gaps which closed up as the line proceeded. Shouts of hurrah arose, and one could readily feel that this great line had a heart, and that this heart was beating. But what has happened to the works of Grivitsa? They had remained silent so long during the bombardment of the previous day that many had been deceived on that account. Yesterday it was reported as quite certain that there was a complete want of ammunition and guns, and now suddenly the whole of that fortified place is belching forth shot and shell with deadly fury. Obviously they had determined not to waste their ammunition. Every moment showed a white puff of smoke there, followed by a bursting shell in the ranks of our regiments. A shell would fall, a little cloud of smoke would rise, all sprang to one side in frightened expectation that it would burst. A score of men were knocked over, some were merely stunned, and again ran forward to join the storming column. Of those who were wounded by the fragments, some were able to raise themselves and, by the aid of their rifles, drag themselves to the rear, where they found shelter. The other wounded had to wait until the ambulance men came with their stretchers. Vladimir could see distinctly how the Romanian regiments moved out into the open beyond the works. They advanced with loud cries. Some, with conspicuous bravery, sprang into the ditches and even attempted to climb up the parapet. But the great mass of them did not follow. They sought shelter in the ditch, shouted and screamed, but did not go forward. The slightest movement of the head or hand brought death or serious wound, for the bullets poured down like hail. And so that is the way fortresses are stormed, thought Vladimir to himself. He saw this sort of thing for the first time and felt a species of disillusion. Everything was so terribly simple and human, not at all as it had been described and as he had imagined it. And yet he could not help congratulating himself that he had not been forced to take part in the storming of the Grivitsa and to lead troops over this inhospitable ground which was furrowed by the furious cannonade. He sees a few human forms standing out like black specks against the sky as a background. They are leaping out of the ditch and moving backward, some slowly, others more quickly. Then followed a mass of humanity crawling out of the big ditch for all the world like a swarm of ants. They were scrabbling with their hands and their feet, 
and when barely erect, rushed away down the hill to where the danger was less. The enemy follow them with their rifle shots as rapidly as they can load. Vladimir could at first make nothing of all this. He understood it only when a loud voice near him shouted, We are beaten! Again he thought to himself, And so this is what is meant by being beaten. How very simple it all is, not at all according to current accounts. He turned instinctively to Prince Charles of Romania. His Highness was so excited that his legs trembled beneath him. My horse, my horse, I must ride over there immediately. Quick, bring me my horse, he commanded, jerking the words out rapidly. How very much excited your prince is, remarked one of our officers to the Romanian colonel after the prince had gone. He knows that a retreat will be a bad thing for him answered the colonel without removing the field glass from his eye. They would drive him out of Romania. Our regiments were literally buried under the weight of shells and also were forced to retire without having carried the breastworks of the fortification. The heights on this side were very slippery and our soldiers were completely exposed to the Turks. Shoot as you please! The columns moved evidently more slowly. The ranks were broken by the fire of the enemy, and, what was of more importance still, they could not quickly enough form again. The shouts of hurrah weakened. They became intermittent. In fact, they soon ceased to encourage. They acted rather as a warning. Some retired, but the greater mass stood undecided and kept on shouting. Shells fell in the midst of them and exploded with frightful effect, knocked down many soldiers and finally sapped away their courage. All now beat a retreat. The cool heads more slowly, the frightened ones ran with all their might. The Tsar soon made his appearance with his suite. The Turks, however, noticed the group immediately and shot twice with such precision that the commander-in-chief begged his majesty not to expose his life any further, but to retire. About five o'clock Vladimir noticed below him on the left a horseman wearing a hat with a tremendous brim. When the smoke cleared away for a moment, he was seen to dismount and come nearer. He proved to be Lieutenant Green, the military attaché of the United States. He had just come from the battlefield and reported that in that portion of the army everything had been defeated, the soldiers had retreated, worn out bodily and morally, and there was no hope to be held out that they could again be led against the enemy with success. The forces at disposal were completely inadequate for the taking of the works, which were tremendously fortified, to say nothing of the slopes being smooth and very slippery. He was begged to ride on and report what he had seen to his majesty. It was now getting dark, the rattling of the small arms diminished, and the artillery also slackened. The Tsar left the field with his suite, the commander-in-chief decided to spend the night here in order to be near the battlefield. The firing from Grivitsa, by the way, lasted longer than that at other points. Night came on. The fine, persistent rain fell. Fires were lighted at only a few points. There was very little talk, still less laughing or joking. From the commander-in-chief down, all did their best to pass the night as well as they could. They made use of wagons and carts of every description, some even having to sleep underneath them. Vladimir entered the wagon of Colonel Asenkan and considered himself very lucky in the prospect of keeping warm and having a night's rest. But the gallant colonel, who up to this moment had held his peace, now commenced in a thin piping tone to render airs from Traviata and Trovatore. 
it was not the impulse of the nightingale which made the colonel tuneful at this hour it was rather a desire to dissipate the impression of their sad situation vladimir however much as he tried could not get to sleep finally when his host had composed himself he slipped unobserved out of the wagon and joined some officers and cossacks at a neighboring campfire for he was convinced that for that night at least he could enjoy no sleep he gazed at the group lighted up by the campfire and thought unconsciously what a group for a painter seats were improvised from all sorts of things here a saddle there a cloak there a bunch of wood destined for the fire most of them however lay on the grass those who were not reclining stood up with their faces or their backs to the fire their legs stretched apart there was some subdued laughing and chaffing but pains were taken not to awaken the commander-in-chief who lay asleep in his wagon not far off suddenly a voice fell upon the ears of vladimir a sharp and loud one he recognized that of general timur your highness what do you wish the grivets a redoubt is taken end of section forty section forty one of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by tavarish the world's story volume six russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan section forty one Coaling at Sea, 1905, by Commander Vladimir Semenov of the Imperial Russian Navy. Commander Semenov was on the Suvorov, a vessel of the Russian fleet that rounded the Cape of Good Hope in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. The Editor on november twelfth at eight p m we arrived at dakar colliers were awaiting us here still we were not able to commence coaling at once although we were in the territory of our good allies no sooner had we anchored than the captain of the port came off to see the admiral but not alas to welcome us and to offer us his assistance but to propose that we should leave again at once he informed us that japan had protested against belligerent warships on their way to the seat of war being permitted to call in neutral ports that england had energetically supported this protest and that the french government had apparently not decided to reject this new principle in international law at least he had orders to find some way out of this difficulty to select and indicate to us some spot for coaling outside territorial waters but in any case not to permit this operation to be commenced without having previously arrived at an understanding with paris personally he placed himself entirely at our disposal and in this he was evidently quite sincere this was very much like the reception accorded to the diana at saigon the warmest welcome on the part of the local authorities and cold reserve on the part of the home government the governor promised assistance of all kinds offered to send us not only fresh provisions but if necessary workmen only we were to go where to to the cape verde islands for instance there the depth of water made it possible to anchor outside territorial waters that is beyond three miles from the coast we who had just come in from sea knew very well what a swell we should find there under these conditions coaling was not to be thought of the admiral stated categorically that since coaling in the open sea was impossible and sailing without coaling was equally impossible 
the prohibition to coal in dakar roads was equivalent to a demand for the disarming of any of the vessels belonging to one of the belligerents which might enter a neutral port that this however was contrary to all declarations of neutrality this brought things to a head telegrams flew to st petersburg and to paris in the afternoon it was announced that the negotiations were taking a favorable turn for us we therefore took advantage of the great distance between our anchorage and the french settlement on shore from where one could not see clearly what was going on in the squadron hold the colliers alongside and started coaling the reception we met with at vigo and again here in the port of an allied power forced us to consider very seriously what should be done as regarded the voyage of the squadron round the cape of good hope our next stop was to be at libreville a french colony forty miles north of the equator situated at the mouth of the gabon river in which water was plentiful if we entered it we were as snug as in any secure port but unfortunately the french local authorities had definite orders according to information received thence not to allow us to enter the river at all at the same time it was pointed out that the depth of water at a distance of over three miles from the shore that is outside territorial waters was generally from ten to twelve fathoms and that if we were to anchor there that is in the open sea we should not only not be prevented from coaling but would receive every possible assistance that was truly french and amiable at the same time it did not commit them to anything it was just as if one said to a hungry man sitting under an apple tree i have no right to pick even one apple for you but if one should drop off eat it by all means i would even peel it for you it must however be pointed out that november is the month of the most variable weather in libreville calms predominate but from time to time there are violent storms with lightning and thunder tornadoes which in strength are hardly inferior to the west indian hurricanes and which though they do not last so long as these are more frequent apart from the danger of the tornado itself a heavy swell continues for a long time afterwards in short coaling at sea near the gabon would in no way be looked upon as a certainty the next stop one thousand and odd miles south of gabon was to be in great fish bay a very large bay which offers perfect protection against the prevailing winds and the swell neither on the shores of the bay nor for hundreds of miles around is there a tree or a bush or a single freshwater spring nothing but sand without doubt one could not imagine a better place for our squadron hunted out of every port but in our days no no man's land can be found anywhere on the globe and this desert belongs officially to the portuguese if an english squadron were to appear in the bay bringing a portuguese official from the neighboring town of benguela and he were to request us to leave then in case we declined the english were undoubtedly entitled to place their forces at his disposal for action against us and we should be transgressing the neutrality rules which had recently been formulated how would this end it does not pay to foretell the future come what may this place also could hardly be thought of for coaling purposes on the entire west coast of africa there was only one spot on which we counted with certainty angra pequeña seven hundred and odd miles south of great fish bay the only harbor of the german colony on that coast 
when it is considered that our coal was delivered to us by the steamers of the hamburg america line we were surely entitled to count upon not meeting with any obstacles there and in this we were not deceived after that madagascar ni plus ni moins as all other anchorages which were suitable for our purposes belonged to the english whilst delagoa bay which had been thought of when the route was being planned belonged to portugal which came to the same thing the possibility of coaling at sea in the regions of the southwest trades southeast trades and the westerly gales was of course out of the question the point to be decided therefore was should we turn back or continue with the prospects of having to fill up the new battleships with say twenty four hundred tons of coal each as against the normal stowage of eleven hundred now the technical committee had found that these ships which already drew two and one half feet more than was intended gave cause for anxiety when their bunkers were filled up to extreme stowage and had informed the admiral accordingly in consequence of this communication the admiral had issued on october fourteenth a general memorandum in which it was laid down that to ensure a safe metacentric height the following was to be observed by the ships concerned one to avoid stowing liquids in the free spaces in such a manner that these would be able to move when the ship rolled thus for instance boiler water should be used up in rotation that is no water was to be taken out of one compartment until the preceding one was empty two all objects of any considerable weight were to be securely lashed three coal was to be used in such a manner that as it was taken out of the lower bunkers a like amount was to be moved down from the upper to the lower bunkers four in heavy weather all ports and other openings in the ship's side were to be closed i beg pardon of my shore-going readers for citing this order which can hardly be either interesting or even intelligible to them but which speaks volumes for those familiar with the sea thus the question to be decided put bluntly was either turn back for there is nothing to be had here or risk capsizing turn back easier said than done how was such a thing conceivable since the whole of russia was looking upon us with confidence and in firm hope here the enormous difference which exists between a general commanding an army and an admiral commanding a fleet showed itself clearly in the case of the former there cannot under any circumstances be any question of his personal bravery if he were to declare that he did not consider himself justified in sending the troops confided to his care to certain destruction one could accuse him of anything one pleased but never of personal cowardice with the admiral it is just the opposite he is on board his flagship on which the adversary concentrates his fire in the very centre of the danger he is the first to risk his skin if he were to say that he did not want to lead his squadron to certain destruction it would always be possible whether rightly or wrongly is another question to hurl at his head the terrible words you are afraid now judge for yourselves when russia was in this mood when it looked with confidence and in firm hope on the second squadron would it have been possible for the officer commanding this squadron to have spoken of turning back and so he decided to go ahead and disregarding the warning of the technical committee to fill up the ships with coal as it was expressed in the mess not only up to the neck but over the ears at dakar the battleships of the borodino type 
were ordered to take on board 2,200 tons of coal, which meant that not only the belt deck or flats, but the main deck as well had to be used as stowage places. The admiral signed and issued a general memorandum drafted by the constructor of the staff in which the manner of carrying out this unusual operation was laid down very precisely and all precautionary measures which were considered necessary both in taking on board and in using up this deck cargo were prescribed. The constructor on the staff, P, an excellent messmate who enjoyed universal sympathy, was extremely busy, went from ship to ship, and finally assembled the other constructors for a consultation on board the Suvorov. Well, and what do you think of it? If there is no help for it, then we must manage it somehow, he said. Shall we capsize? No, at least probably not, if the main deck ports keep out the water. Let us hope we shan't get a strong headwind, for then things will be very bad for us. When the main deck ports no longer hold and the water pours in, then goodbye. During the night of November 12th, 13th, the governor received instructions from Paris to permit us to call, but only on condition that the operation was to be completed in 24 hours. As a matter of course, this period commenced with the moment of receiving this decision. That was 4 a.m. November 13th was the first day of our coal troubles. We afterwards went through many such days, but this first one was especially heavy. In Dakar, as in the tropics generally, all signs of life cease between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. The government offices are closed, the shops do not sell anything, the troops do not leave their barracks, the European workmen interrupt their work, everyone not only seeks protection in the shade against the sun's scorching rays, but endeavors to move as little as possible in the shade, as every movement produces profuse perspiration. These rules were observed by people who, to a certain degree at least, had become acclimatized and accustomed to this life, but for us there were none of these conveniences. For us, rapid coaling was one of the first conditions of life. Everyone took part in this, beginning with the captain. The ship's company worked in two watches, night and day. In a flat calm, and with the thermometer never under 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the Suvorov was completely smothered in a cloud of coal dust for 29 hours on end. The sun's rays by day, those of the electric light by night, could hardly penetrate this black fog. From the bottom of the collier's holds, the sun had the appearance of a blood-red spot. Blacker than niggers, streaming with perspiration, lumps of cotton waste between their teeth. It was necessary to breathe through the cotton waste to avoid getting the coal dust into the lungs. Officers and men were at work in this hell. And nowhere could one hear the slightest grumbling not even a hint that, after all, there was some limit to human endurance. Extraordinary-looking creatures, black and streaming with moisture, ran up to the bridge every now and then, only for a minute for a breath of fresh air, quickly asked the signalman, How are we getting on? How much was it for the last hour? Are we ahead of the others? And disappeared again below at once. And what went on in the closed-in coal bunkers, where the coal had to be stowed, as it shot down from above? Where the temperature was 115 degrees Fahrenheit? Where the strongest and the healthiest could not stand it for more than 15 or 20 minutes? No one inquired. It was necessary. There was no help for it. The work was kept at boiling point. It happened every now and then that one of the workers could no longer keep on his legs. He was then quickly carried out, the fire hose turned on him, 
and when he had recovered his breath, he returned to complete his task. End of section 41、section、42、of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Russia, Part Eight, Life in Modern Russia, Historical Note: One sixth of the land surface of the world, a territory nearly three times as large as the United States, exclusive of Alaska, is ruled over by the Tsar of Russia. This territory contains a population of about one hundred and fifty million. During recent years, Russia has been greatly disturbed within her own boundaries. The Russian persecutions of the Jews and the numerous massacres of these people have aroused the wrath and indignation of the world. The government's determination to repress the ever-growing desire of the people for political freedom has led to the imprisonment, exile, and execution of thousands of men and women, many of them young students. The most rigorous attempts at repression have only served to increase the discontent. The agitators, deprived of the right of speech, have fallen back on assassination, and many high officials have fallen victims to the terrorists. Strikes have prevailed, and when on Red Sunday in 1905 the strikers attempted to march to the Winter Palace and submit their grievances to the Tsar himself, they were fired upon by the imperial troops. All Russia seized with discontent, and the Tsar and his advisers, thoroughly alarmed, conceded the right of the people to have some voice in their own government by the creation of a Duma or Parliament. When brought to the test of use, the rights granted by the government were found to be hedged about with so many restrictions as to render them of little value. Nevertheless, some degree of freedom has been obtained. End of section forty-two. This recording is in the public domain. Section forty three of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel. The World Story, Volume Six Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tavan, Section Forty Three, The Races on the Neva River, eighteen seventy, by Theophile Gautier. We came down upon the ice by a broad wooden slope between the bronze lions of the quay, whose pedestals, when the river is open, mark the landing place. On the day which I am describing. The sky had not that keen, intense color which it assumes when the cold reaches zero. An immense canopy of cloud of a very soft and fine pearl gray, holding snow suspended, hung over the city Saint Petersburg, and seemed to rest upon the towers and spires as upon pillars of gold. This quiet and neutral tint set off to unusual advantage the buildings with their delicate coloring relieved by fillets of silvery snow. In front, we saw across the river, looking like a valley half filled by avalanches, the columns of red granite ornamented with prows of ships which stand near the classic exchange. At the point of the island which divides the Neva into two streams, the needle of the fortress raised its aspiring golden point. Rendered yet more vivid by the gray tint of the sky, the course, with its board stands and its track marked out by ropes attached to stakes set in the ice and by artificial hedges of fir branches, stretched diagonally across the river. The crowd of people and carriages is immense. Privileged persons occupied the stands, if it be a privilege to remain stationary in the cold in an open gallery. Around the track are crowded two or three deep sledges, troikas, open carriages, and even simple telegas and other vehicles more or less primitive. For no restriction seems to hamper this public amusement. The river is free to all. Men and women, in order to have a better view, turn out their coachmen and stand upon the seats and the boxes. Nearer the barriers are the mujiks in their sheepskin tulips and felt boots. 
soldiers in gray capotes, and other persons who have not been able to secure a better place. All this crowd, astir like a mighty anthill on the icy floor of the Nava, was a scene not to be witnessed without anxiety, by me at least, for I could not forget that a deep river, as large at least as the Thames at London Bridge, flowed beneath this frozen crust, two or three feet deep at most, upon which was the weight of thousands of people closely crowded together, and a great number of horses, not to mention equipages of every description. But the Russian winter is to be depended on. It never plays the trick of opening trap doors under the crowd and swallowing them up. Outside the course, jockeys were exercising the horses who had not yet been on the track, or leading about to cool them gradually under their Persian rugs the noble animals who had furnished their share of the day's amusement. The track is a kind of lengthened ellipse. The sledges do not start abreast, but are stationed at equal intervals, these intervals diminishing or increasing according to the speed of the horses. Two sledges take their position in front of the stands, and two others at the extremities of the ellipse, awaiting the signal of departure. Sometimes a man on horseback gallops at the side of the horse to stimulate him through rivalry to the utmost exertion. The horse in the sledge only trots, but his pace is sometimes so rapid that the other can hardly keep up with him, and once under good headway abandons him to his own impulse. Many drivers, sure of their animals, scorn to employ this resource and make the race alone. Any horse who breaks into a gallop loses his chance if he makes more than six bounds before being brought back to the prescribed gate. It is marvelous to see these splendid creatures, for whom wild prices are often paid, spin along over the level ice, which, swept clear of snow, is like a belt of dull-colored glass. The vapor comes from their scarlet nostrils in long jets. Their flanks are bathed in a kind of mist, and their tails seem powdered with diamond dust. The nails in their shoes bite into the level and slippery surface, and they devour the distance with the same proud security with which they would tread the best-kept roads of a park. The drivers, leaning backward, grasp the reins with their utmost strength, for horses so powerful as these, having only a light weight behind them and not allowed to break into a gallop, require to be restrained rather than urged. And they find, too, in this tension a point of support which allows them to abandon themselves to their headlong pace. What prodigious steps these creatures take, looking as if they would bite their knees! I could not discover that any special conditions regarding age or weight were imposed upon the contestants, only an amount of speed in a fixed time, measured by a chronometer, or at least so it appeared to me. Occasionally, troikas enter the lists against sledges having one or two horses, each man selects the vehicle and number of horses which seem best to suit him. Sometimes, even a spectator, who has been sitting in his sledge and looking on, will take a fancy to try his luck, and forthwith he enters the lists. At the race which I am describing, a very picturesque incident occurred. A mujik, from Vladimir, it was said, who had come into the city ringing wood or frozen provisions, stood looking on from the height of his rustic troika. He was clad in the usual greasy taloup with an old matted fur cap and felt boots white with hard service, a beard unkempt and lusterless bristled upon his chin. He had a team of three little horses, disheveled, wild-looking, shaggy as bears, frightfully filthy, with icicles hanging down underneath them, carrying their heads low and biting at the snow heaped up in masses on the river. A duga, like a gothic window, painted with glaring colors and stripes and zigzags, was the part of the equipage on which most care had been bestowed, doubtless was the work of the mujik's own hatchet. This wild and primitive equipage offered the strangest possible contrast to the luxurious sledges, the triumphant troikas, and all the other elegant vehicles which stood drawn up along the edges of the track. More than one laughing glance ridiculed the humble troika, and to tell the truth, in this brilliant scene, it had much the same effect as a spot of wheel grease on an ermine mantle. But the little horses, whose hair was all matted with frozen sweat, looked out scornfully through their stiffened, shaggy forelocks at the high-bred animals that seemed to shrink away from contact with them, 
for animals, like the rest of us, feel a contempt for poverty. A gleam of fire shone in their somber eyes, and they struck the ice with the small shoes attached to their slender, sinewy legs, bearded like an eagle's quills. The mujik, standing upon the seat, contemplated the course without appearing in the least surprised by the prowess of the horses. Now and then even a faint smile gleamed below the frozen crystals of his mustache. His gray eyes sparkled mischievously, and he seemed to say, we too could do as much. Taking a sudden resolve, he entered the lists to try his luck. The three little unlicked bears shook their heads proudly, as if they understood that they were to maintain the honor of the poor horses of the steppes, and, without being urged, they went off at such a pace that everybody else on the track began to take the alarm. They went like the wind with their little slender limbs, and they carried off the victory from all the others, thoroughbreds of English race, barbs, and orlop horses, by a minute and some seconds. The mujik had not presumed too much upon his rustic steeds. The prize was adjudged to him, a magnificent piece of chased silver by Vaillon, the most fashionable goldsmith in St. Petersburg. This triumph excited a noisy enthusiasm among the crowd, usually so silent and so calm. As the conqueror came off, he was surrounded by amateurs proposing to buy his three horses. They went so far as to offer him three thousand roubles apiece, an enormous sum for beasts and man both. To his credit, be it said, the mujik persistently refused. He wrapped his piece of silver in a fragment of old cloth, climbed upon his troika, and went back as he came not willing at any price to part from the good little creatures who had made him for the moment the Lion of St. Petersburg. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain. Section 44 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 44. A Little Jewish Girl in Russia by Mary Anton. The Pale is a strip of land stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea, running chiefly through the Polish provinces. Save by special privilege, no Jew is allowed to make his home elsewhere than within this Pale, the editor. The Gentiles used to wonder at us, because we cared so much about religious things, about food and Sabbath and teaching the children Hebrew. They were angry with us for our obstinacy, as they called it, and mocked us and ridiculed the most sacred things. There were wise Gentiles who understood. These were educated people, like Fedora Pavlovna, who made friends with their Jewish neighbors. They were always respectful and openly admired some of our ways. But most of the Gentiles were ignorant. There was one thing, however, the Gentiles always understood, and that was money. They would take any kind of bribe at any time. They expected it. Peace cost so much a year, in Polotsk, if you did not keep on good terms with your Gentile neighbors, they had a hundred ways of molesting you. If you chased their pigs when they came rooting up your garden, or objected to their children maltreating your children, they might complain against you to the police, stuffing their case with false accusations and false witnesses. If you had not made friends with the police, the case might go to court and there you lost before the trial was called, unless the judge had reason to befriend you. The cheapest way to live in Polotsk was to pay as you went along. Even a little girl understood that. In your father's parlor hung a large colored portrait of Alexander the Third. The Tsar was a cruel tyrant. Oh, it was whispered when doors were locked and shutters tightly barred at night. He was a Titus, a Hammond, a sworn foe of all Jews and yet his portrait was seen in a place of honor in your father's house. You knew why. It looked well when police or government officers came on business. 
the czar was always sending us commands you shall not do this and you shall not do that till there was very little left that we might do except pay tribute and die one positive command he gave us you shall love and honor your emperor in every congregation a prayer must be said for the czar's health or the chief of police would close the synagogue on a royal birthday every house must fly a flag or the owner would be dragged to a police station and be fined twenty-five roubles start a footnote a rouble is worth fifty-one and one-half cents End of footnote. a decrepit old woman who lived all alone in a tumble-down shanty supported by the charity of the neighborhood crossed her paralyzed hands one day when flags were ordered up and waited for her doom because she had no flag the vigilant policeman kicked the door open with his great boot took the last pillow from the bed sold it and hoisted a flag above the rotten roof the czar always got his dues no matter if it ruined a family there was a poor locksmith who owed the czar three hundred roubles because his brother had escaped from russia before serving his time in the army there was no such fine for gentiles only for jews and the whole family was liable now the locksmith never could have so much money and he had no valuables to pawn the police came and attached his household goods everything he had including his bride's trousseau and the sale of the goods brought thirty-five roubles after a year's time the police came again looking for the balance of the czar's dues they put their seal on everything they found many bitter sayings came to your ears if you were a little girl in polotsk it is a false world you heard and you knew it was so looking at the czar's portrait and at the flags never tell a police officer the truth was another saying and you knew it was good advice that fine of three hundred roubles was a sentence of lifelong slavery for the poor locksmith unless he could free himself by some trick as fast as he could collect a few rags and sticks the police would be after them business really did not pay when the price of goods was so swollen by taxes that the people could not buy the only way to make business pay was to cheat cheat the government on part of the duties playing tricks on the czar was dangerous with so many spies watching his interests people who sold cigarettes without the government seal got more gray hairs than banknotes out of their business the constant risk the worry the dread of a police raid in the night and the ruinous fines in case of detection left very little margin of profit or comfort to the dealer in contraband goods but what can one do the people said with that shrug of the shoulders that expresses the helplessness of the pale what can one do one must live it was not so easy to live with such bitter competition as the congestion of population made inevitable there were ten times as many stores as there should have been ten times as many tailors cobblers barbers tinsmiths a gentile if he failed in polotsk go elsewhere where there was less competition a jew could make the circle of the pale only to find the same conditions as at home outside the pale he could only go to certain designated localities on payment of prohibitive fees which were augmented by a constant stream of bribes and even then he lived at the mercy of the local chief of police artisans had the right to reside outside the pale on fulfillment of certain conditions which gave no real security merchants could buy the right of residence outside the pale permanent or temporary on conditions which might at any time be changed i used to picture an uncle of mine on his russian travels hurrying hurrying to finish his business in the limited time while the policemen marched behind him ticking off the days and counting up the hours that was a foolish fancy but some of the things that were done in russia really were very funny perhaps i should not have had so many foolish fancies if i had not been so idle if they had let me go to school but of course they didn't there was one public school for boys and one for girls but jewish children were admitted in limited numbers only ten to a hundred and even the lucky ones had their troubles first you had to have a tutor at home who prepared you and talked all the time about the examination you would have to pass till you were scared you heard on all sides that the brightest jewish children were turned down if the examining officers did not like the turn of their noses 
you went up to be examined with the other jewish children your heart heavy about that matter of your nose there was a special examination for the jewish candidates of course a nine-year-old jewish child had to answer questions that a thirteen-year-old gentile was hardly expected to answer but that did not matter so much you had been prepared for the thirteenth-year-old test you found the questions quite easy you wrote your answers triumphantly and you received a low rating and there was no appeal i used to stand in the doorway of my father's store munching an apple that did not taste good any more and watch the pupils going home from school in twos and threes the girls in neat brown dresses and black aprons and little stiff hats the boys in trim uniforms with many buttons they had ever so many books in the satchels on their backs they would take them out at home and read and write and learn all sorts of interesting things they looked to me like beings from another world than mine but those whom i envied had their troubles as i often heard their school life was one struggle against injustice from instructors spiteful treatment from fellow students and insults from everybody they were rejected at the universities where they were admitted in the ratio of three jews to a hundred gentiles under the same debarring entrance conditions as at the high school especially rigorous examinations dishonest marking or arbitrary rulings without disguise no the czar did not want us in the schools End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain.